And LT, 1, Prologue and GT, the trigger was a mobile game. I don't remember the exact genre, but I think it was introduced as an idle game. The game itself was nothing special. There were tiny figures of people walking around, and all I did was watch their movements. They had finally crafted AI, or so it seemed, as each character moved diligently and did their own tasks. Sometimes they would do something unusual, breaking the rules. It felt like raising ants in a transparent gel. I also remembered the tiny sea monkeys I used to keep in an aquarium. Sometimes I would touch the people with my finger, and their health would decrease while a one appeared above their heads. If I tapped them more than a dozen times, the character would disappear, but my finger would hurt so I stopped. The magic resource at the bottom of the screen kept decreasing, so I couldn't endlessly tap the passing people. Besides, it was healing to just watch the characters do their thing. I spent about two or three hours a day watching the characters like that. Until I came home drunk after a frustrating day. Why do they treat me like that? One day, I came home intoxicated by alcohol because of human relationship problems. I turned on the mobile game as usual, without any thought. At first, I just wanted to look at the screen mindlessly. But then, I got annoyed and looked for a target to vent my anger in the game. What I found was a village in a secluded place. I ignored the pain in my finger and tapped the screen until all the villagers disappeared. I kept moving my finger busily until all my magic was consumed. When I had recovered and spent all my magic again, I had completely annihilated one village and found a message on my smartphone screen. Your karma has increased by 10. You have reached level 2. It was the moment when I learned about a new feature of the game that I didn't know. And LT, 2, Karma System, 1, and GT, the next day. When I woke up from the alcohol, what I faced was the game screen that had reached level 2. My level had increased by 1. It would have been nothing if it was a normal game. Going from level 1 to level 2 was something that happened in the beginner stage. But in this game, level had a different meaning. There was no experience point to begin with, and level was meaningless in this game. It was surprising that there was a hidden way to level up in this game that didn't even have a proper tutorial or guide. It was natural that I was interested in the result of leveling up. And LT, Observers I, LV, 1, and GT, grows. And LT, Observers I, LV, 2, and GT, has been achieved. You can observe the continent with a clearer vision than before. The first thing that changed was the skill called NLT, Observer's Eye and GT. It wasn't a skill that I could use at will. It was a passive skill that applied automatically. And after learning this skill, the graphics of the game that I saw changed. It wasn't a drastic difference, but the shape of the characters that I saw changed. Before NLT, Observer's Eye and GT, evolved, I could only recognize their human shape. But after this skill evolved, more details appeared on the character's appearance. At least I could tell their gender and hair color. And this is, dialogue. Another change that came with the graphics change. It was that I could understand the dialogue between characters. Speech bubbles appeared above their heads, and the dialogue content was displayed as icons. Of course, it was barely enough to understand their interaction purpose, not a real dialogue. But it was amazing enough to create AI that acted like humans, let alone more details. I decided to compromise with what I saw. Anyway. It's free, what more can I ask for? After answering myself, I checked out other skills that had appeared on my account. There were several more skills besides NLT, Observer's I and GT, on my account that had leveled up. You have acquired NLT, Karma's Judgment, LV, Max, and GT. All actions that affect life and death will generate karma. Karma that is excessively biased in one direction has a high possibility of triggering NLT, causality adjustment and GT. It meant that the actions I took that affected the game characters would come back to me as experience points. It seemed that killing characters like yesterday would increase my level. There was also a warning about NLT, causality adjustment and GT, below, but it didn't explain what it was in detail. Of course, if I attacked the characters recklessly like yesterday, my finger would only hurt. It would be better to find an efficient way to hunt quickly if possible. What is this next skill? What is this? I scrolled down and checked the skill that was next to NLT, Karma's Judgment and GT. And I saw something unbelievable. 
there was something clearly strange among the list of skills. It was not a skill name that belonged to the skill window. You have acquired an LT, paid currency shop, LV, Max, and GT. You can now use paid currency to purchase items from the shop. The skill name, and LT, paid currency shop and GT. It was a skill that allowed me to use the cash shop. No, it was too embarrassing to call it a skill. After all, paid currency is something that you buy with real money. But you have to learn a skill to buy it. It was an absurd skill. Why did they put this in the skill? I grabbed the back of my neck as soon as I saw NLT, paid currency shop and GT. I had heard a lot of stories about how games nowadays were crazy about scams, but this was crossing the line too much. You can spend money when you level up. Who wouldn't think that's ridiculous? I take back what I said about the developer being amazing for making this a free game. This developer was a writer who was crazy about money. And a person who was crazy in an innovative way. I stared intently at the shop button in one corner of the screen. Hmm. I don't feel like spending money on this game. I already had a big expense from drinking too much yesterday because of the third round of promotions. And they want me to spend money on this trash game. I can't do that sober. Well, anyway. Shall I just take a look at the contents? That's what I thought for a moment. My eyes didn't leave the shop button. No matter what, I was curious about what they were selling in and LT, paid currency shop and GT. It was a game that could be played without spending money. Then what kind of things did this shoddy game sell for money? I stretched out my hand hesitantly and clicked the shop button quietly. Click. The shop page opened in front of me with a familiar touch sensation. Welcome to NLT, Paid Currency Shop and GT. NLT, Paid Currency Shop and GT, sells various items that can help you play the game smoothly. It said various items, but there was only one thing for sale. The revenue structure was the famous 10 pull gotcha. They didn't even give a free pull for the first time. The shop page didn't even tell me what kind of items were in the gotcha. Only a black cow customer would buy it without knowing anything. And the price was 49, 901 for 10 pulls. It was a fairly vicious price for a non-mainstream mobile game gotcha. 50, 0001 for 10 pulls. Who would pull that? With that money, I could do at least 10 pulls in a major mobile game, or even dozens of pulls in a user-friendly game. It was an amount that normal people wouldn't press the pull button. Really? I was normal and I didn't even dare to try it. Only someone who had too much money would try it. As if it read my mind, the game showed me a new guide message on the screen. You can get various items that can help you play the game by using 10 pulls. Are you crazy? Why would I pull that? I wasn't a black cow who spent money on this kind of game, even though I wasn't stingy with mobile games either. I'd rather spend 100, 000 one more on another game than this one. With that thought, I tried to close the shop window when I felt something wrong with my finger that was operating the screen, oh, I pressed it wrong. Instead of going out, I accidentally pressed the 10 pull button of course, it wouldn't have been a big deal if it was a normal game there would be a payment confirmation window in the middle, and I could cancel it there and it wouldn't be charged. But this game wasn't a normal game. As soon as I pressed the button, it went straight to the 10 pull screen. Hey, why don't you ask me if I want to pay? Even if it was a shoddy game, it would at least confirm the payment. But this game ignored even that minimum rule and showed me the 10 pull screen. SHH, 10 items appeared in front of me in sequence. There was no effect to indicate the grade. Either they were all trash items, or there was no grade distinction for items in the first place. My eyes quickly scanned the list of items that appeared. You have acquired, Rusty Iron Sword. You have acquired, Rusty Iron Sword. You have acquired, Crude Dagger. You have acquired, Hard Black Bread. You have acquired, Magic Book, Lightning. You have acquired, Hard Black Bread. You have acquired, Hard Black Bread. You have acquired, Hard Black Bread. You have acquired, Torn Cloak. You have acquired, Rusty Iron Sword. They all looked like garbage just by reading them. Most of them were duplicates. I realized as soon as I saw the items that they were things that should never be bought. No, I already knew that to some extent, but I felt it painfully with my own body. 
I denied the reality as soon as I saw the item list. I didn't choose a payment method, so it didn't go through, right? Ding. A message arrived as soon as I finished speaking. It was a message from the card company informing me of a payment of 49901 And it wasn't even a credit payment, but a cash payment that came out. I thought that since it was a shoddy game, the payment wouldn't work properly, but this part was sharp and came out quickly. It was a game that blatantly screwed over the user. No, what is this? Why did it really go out? The more I played, the more I fell into a maze. I had no choice but to cross my arms and think about the money that had already gone out of my card. Should I delete the game and get a refund? Or should I keep playing the game with the thought that I was bitten by a dog? I made up my mind after thinking about it. Hmm. Okay. I had fun playing it until now. I decided to think of the 50,001 as the purchase cost for the game. There should be consumers like me who can make more diverse games. Of course, I should stop this kind of payment model, though. I quickly finished my decision and closed the shop and returned to the main screen. And I looked at the items I got from the 10 pulls. Rusty Iron Sword. This was garbage. There was no interaction other than throwing it on the ground. It seemed that only the characters could move in the first place. I checked the next item. Hard black bread, crude dagger, torn cloak, these were also the same as, rusty iron sword. There was no choice but to throw them away. In other words, it was just sprinkling them on the characters. I paid 50, 0001 for these things. It was something that I couldn't help but be disappointed. Magic book, lightning, only this last remaining item, magic book, lightning, was different from the others. It was the only one that had a direct interaction button with me. When I pressed, magic book, lightning, in my inventory, a selection window popped up above the inventory screen. The new message that appeared was about learning magic. Do you want to learn NLT, lightning and GT, skill? The magic book will disappear when you learn it. Yes slash no there was only one choice, of course. I pressed, yes, without any hesitation. Ding. With a pleasant notification sound, the magic book disappeared from my inventory. You have learned an LT, Lightning, LV, Max, and GT. You can now use Lightning Magic by consuming magic power. At the same time, Lightning Magic appeared in the skill window. The Lightning Magic button was different from other skills in that I could press it. I immediately pressed the lightning magic button. Then, with a small target mark and my magic power decreasing by almost 10%, a bolt of lightning fell from the sky as soon as I touched a point on the screen. A high-level magic that shoots lightning, lightning. It was the moment when I learned an active skill for the first time in this game. And LT, 3, Karma System, 2, and GT, after getting the skill, what I had to do was obvious. I immediately looked for a target that I could attack nearby. Despite the fact that there were some characters around, when I looked again, they were nowhere to be seen. Maybe it was because of the rugged terrain of the mountain range, but it was not easy to find the characters in the tiles of similar colors. The only thing I found was a rabbit that was grazing on the grass. Unlike humans, its small graphic was standing still in its place. It was the first time I tried to attack something that was not a character. Maybe. I can attack that too. I prepared the lightning magic when I found the rabbit. Press. I activated the target by pressing the button, and then placed the target on top of the rabbit. Then I cast the magic by touching the target again. Crack. A short lightning struck above the rabbit's head. You used an LT, lightning and GT. With the message that I used magic, a number 15 popped up above the rabbit's head. The rabbit that was attacked fell down with a skull in its speech bubble. The tiles around where the lightning fell were also charred black. The rabbit that fell down did not get up again. I knocked down the rabbit with one shot of and LT, lightning and GT, magic. The damage is 15. The damage I inflicted on the rabbit with one lightning magic was 15. Considering that I had to touch it once with my finger to inflict one damage, it was 15 times stronger than the basic attack. Of course, I couldn't spam it indefinitely because of the high magic consumption. But it seemed certain that my fingers would hurt less. I tried out the lightning magic and felt sorry for myself, so I looked around. 
I confirmed that and LT, Lightning and GT, Magic could knock down a rabbit in one shot. But I didn't think I could send a character away in one shot either. I felt like trying it on a character as a target once. I started looking for a suitable target by moving the screen. The mountain beyond the mountain. The small stream beyond that. And then the dense forest that appeared again behind it. I couldn't see any characters even after looking for a long time. It seemed like the characters I found earlier were the last ones. I kept flipping through the screen and looked for traces of characters carefully. Then I felt something suddenly and put down my smartphone. My stomach hurts. I should eat ramen while doing this. A sudden stomachache while playing the game. It was the alcohol I drank yesterday that showed its presence. Feeling a heavy sensation from my stomach, I decided to sober up with ramen reluctantly. I left my smartphone alone and moved to boil ramen. I came back to my smartphone after bringing a pot of boiling ramen. How can there be no one until I finish a bowl of ramen? I muttered to myself as I looked at the empty pot. It was natural, because I still couldn't find any traces of people. Not even animals, let alone people's traces. Maybe it was because and LT, I of observation and GT, was still low level, I thought. If this was going to happen, maybe it would have been better to leave some characters alive instead of wiping out the village. At least the location of the village would be fixed, right? With regret, I kept flipping through the screen and then saw the end of the long mountain range slowly coming into view. As if trying to reflect the real mountain range, this mountain range was unnecessarily long and wide. Swipe. Swipe. As I moved my finger busily to flip through the screen, I finally found what I wanted. At the end of the mountain range where I arrived after a long time flipping through screens. I saw a group of characters moving around there. One woman. And five men. What I saw at the end of the mountain range were six characters moving busily. One woman running ahead of them all, and five men following her closely behind them. The men who were chasing after her had bloodstained knives in their hands. It looked like a result of an interaction between characters. A crying face speech bubble popped up above the woman's head who was moving ahead. Is she being chased? They didn't look like they were traveling together no matter how you looked at them. It seemed like she was being chased by bandits or thieves who were nearby. They were faithful to their roles as AIs, even doing robbery faithfully. I watched their movements with an interested face. The woman who was leading them ran while crying, and soon found a dead end and sat down. Even after sitting down, the speech bubble above her head did not disappear. When the woman who was running ahead stopped, the thieves who were chasing her also stopped nearby and started to surround her. Skull, the figure who looked like the leader of the thieves raised a skull speech bubble above his head. It was the same emoticon that was output when the rabbit died. But the thief who raised the speech bubble didn't look like he was dead. It looked like they were having a conversation with each other. And judging by the situation, the meaning of the conversation seemed to be that they would kill the other person. Wow, they even threatened each other. They were AIs, but they even threatened each other. The more I looked at it, the more I thought it was a game that well represented human nature. It might be a bit disappointing in terms of graphics or payment structure, but AI was one thing that I didn't regret praising. The thief who was threatening the woman in front of him soon raised his bloodstained knife and walked forward. The bush tile on the ground split as the distance between the two narrowed. When the distance between them narrowed to leave only one tile left. I placed the target of the magic I had prepared on top of the thief. You used an LT, lightning and GT. Crash. The lightning struck and the thief who was moving stopped. 15 damage. The same amount of damage as when I attacked the rabbit was output. A spinning star-shaped speech bubble appeared above the thief's head. A stationary character. And the content of the speech bubble. No matter how you looked at it, it looked like he was stunned. It seemed that and LT, lightning and GT, magic could interfere with his actions to some extent, even if it couldn't kill him in one shot. I clicked the button again and used magic. You used an LT, lightning and GT. You used an LT, lightning and GT. Crack. Crash. I attacked the thief who was standing still with two more lightning strikes. 15 damage. And then 15 damage again. 
the thief who was hit by two more shocks fell down with a skull in his speech bubble. The shock that knocked down the rabbit in one shot. No matter how tough he was, he couldn't withstand being hit by lightning three times. Your karma increased by one. The new message was about the increase of karma. It was the same format as when I wiped out the village. I knocked down the thief and gained experience. I didn't get any karma when I knocked down the rabbit, but I got karma when I knocked down the thief. This fact meant something simple. I could only get karma by knocking down characters. The screen in front of me where the characters were gathered was nothing but a hunting ground full of experience. You're all dead. I snapped my fingers and looked at the screen. It was time for hunting. With her ash-gray hair fluttering in the wind, the girl ran away as fast as she could. Behind her, there were muscular men with weapons chasing after her. The weapons they were holding were stained with blood. It was blood that they had spilled by cutting down the villagers who had blocked their way to protect her. She felt the presence of the thieves behind her and bit her lip. How did this happen? Eutania was a daughter of a baron who lived on the outskirts of the empire. Her family was not a great one to boast about to others, even though they were nobles. Her house was not wealthy, but the fact that they had a happy family was something to be proud of to others. The village where Eutania lived was also a peaceful and quiet place. A vast wheat field stretching out in one corner of the village. And the fragrant grass scent that tickled the noses of the villagers. Everyone was living a relaxed life in the village that Eutania loved. Until the knights from Cloud, who came down with orders from the system came to visit. Baron High lost. You are arrested for treason against the royal family. Her father was taken away by the knights who came from the system. Baron High lost was arrested for political reasons. Eutania kept insisting on her father's innocence, but no one listened to her story. There were not many people who would listen to a young lady who ruled a rural village in the countryside. Rather, only rude marriage proposals from nobles who preyed on her alone came in. As more letters with unpleasant contents piled up, Eutania's heart was filled with distrust and hatred for humans. I can't ruin the village that my father loved. Still, she took over her father's empty seat and worked hard for the village. Eutania had been following Baron Hylost since she was young and peeked at his work over his shoulder. She knew better than anyone else about the village's affairs. The villagers also trusted and followed Eutania, who had been a sincere lady for a long time. Maybe someday another knight would be assigned to this small village, but she thought she had to protect the place where her father would return while she was there. At least until this morning, she had that thought. Until the thieves who came to the village slaughtered the villagers and chased after her. Ha, ha. Eutania's breath became rough as she ran towards the front. She saw tears in her eyes as she crossed over the mountain. It hurts. And it's painful. It was a day when she missed her father who was locked up somewhere. Still, she couldn't stop her footsteps because she remembered the faces of those who sacrificed themselves for her. But no matter how many sacrifices she carried, it was impossible to run away forever. What faced Eutania who ran ahead and looked ahead was a cliff that stretched out as if it had been cut off. She couldn't run away any further on this road. She saw a cliff in front of her and sat down on the ground. Ah, ah. Tears flowed from Eutania's eyes as she sat down. She failed. She failed to save her father, to protect the place where her father would return. And in the end, she even failed to escape from the enemy of the village. She hated herself for not being able to do anything right. Now she had no more strength to move. She missed her father. She also missed the villagers who had become cold corpses and could no longer see. Dad. Mrs. Aina. Now she was alone. She hated people. She even hated someone coming near her. But there was no end to those who chased after Eutania, thud. Thud. She felt someone approaching from behind as she sat down and cried. Is this the end of your escape? What a waste, poor noble lady. Eutania looked at the man in front of her with tearful eyes. The face of a man with a knife mark on his face came into her sight. The leader of the bandits who had mercilessly killed the villagers. That was who the man was. And LT, 4, Karma System, 3, and GT, looks like you have nowhere to run, huh? Uh. Eutania bit her lip and looked up at the man in front of her. She had no one to support her, 
and no one to protect. This world was strangely unfair. Her father had sacrificed his life for the weak, but he was imprisoned. But the thief in front of her killed people mercilessly, and he was still roaming around freely. So, do you want to die here, or be sold as a slave? Don't you think it's better to live as a slave, even if you suffer a bit? He he he. The thief let out a disgusting laugh. She didn't want to hear his unpleasant voice anymore. Instead of her father's gentle voice, she had to listen to that arrogant voice. She couldn't help but think that the world was an unfair place. And the moment she realized that fact, Eutania wished for something in her heart. She wished that this world would just perish. If you can't decide, I'll decide for you. The thief finished his words and approached Eutania. Thud, thud. The sound of footsteps breaking through the bushes reached Eutania's ears. There was no place to escape anymore. She had no choice but to accept her fate at this moment. Eutania gave up everything and closed her eyes tightly. As the thief got closer to her and reached out his hand towards her, crash. A thunderous sound echoed as lightning struck down. Aark. Ah. Eutania lifted her head and checked the scene in front of her with a deafening thunderclap. There was an astonishing sight in front of her eyes, who had been denying reality until then. The thief who was hit by the sharp lightning was rolling on the ground. The damage from the lightning was so severe that the thief was foaming at the mouth with his eyes rolled back. Eutania was startled by the sudden lightning strike, but it was only for a moment. Soon, two more lightning bolts fell down. Ugh. Crash. Crackle. The world flashed in an instant. The thief who was hit by the lightning fell to the ground and didn't move anymore. The lightning had cut off his breath. Eutania saw that and looked up at the sky with horror. The sky where the thunder sounded had no trace of a dark cloud. The lightning she saw was not ordinary lightning. Boss? Did he really die? There's no cloud in the sky. How did this happen? The thieves around him also showed signs of trembling with fear at the sight of their dead leader. The lightning that fell from the clear sky had killed their boss. They had never seen such a phenomenon before, even though they had been robbing for years. One of them seemed to have figured out the situation quickly, pointing at the corpse of their boss that was turning into ashes and shouted. Magic. It must be magic. Magic, magic. Then is that girl a mage? The thieves' eyes all turned to Eutania. Mage. They were objects of fear and awe for those who didn't know magic. Everyone knew the old story of how a village disappeared by an evil witch. The thieves' eyes were filled with fear as they looked at Eutania. But this was also unknown to Eutania, who received their fearful glances. Someone must have used magic. Then, who used magic? Eutania turned her head and looked around slowly. A cliff cut off sharply. A dense forest. She couldn't see any human figures on either side. There was no one near her who could be suspected of being a mage. Of course, while she was doing that, the fear in the thieves' hearts grew bigger and bigger, and soon some people started running away with their weapons clanging. It's a mage. Run. Why is there a mage in this backwater place? The thieves turned their backs on Eutania and ran towards the bottom of the mountain, screaming. But the lightning that struck from the sky was not satisfied with one sacrifice. Crash. Crackle. Lightning struck again and swallowed up the fleeing thieves. With a loud noise, the lightning mercilessly judged the scared thieves. Cough. Ah. Please spare me. Every time the sky flashed, new screams came out of the thieves' mouths. The thieves died one by one from the continuous lightning strikes. Some of them were lucky enough to avoid the lightning, but it was futile in front of the lightning that fell one after another. All of the thieves met their end by the lightning, except for two exceptions. And the last remaining thieves died painfully on the ground with bruises all over their bodies. They died more brutally than the previous thieves. Eutania got up from her seat with a blank expression as she saw the thieves being cleaned up in an instant. What is this? The enemy was a skilled thief. They had been robbing for a long time, and they easily slaughtered the villagers. But even those thieves couldn't resist the lightning that struck one after another and fell down. Eutania's eyes looked at the ashes of the thieves that scattered. 
the unknown magic had taken away even the remains of the enemies. It was as if all life had been taken to where it should have been. She could only think of one kind of being that could do such a thing. The omnipotent being who watched over her from the distant sky. In other words, the ones called gods. I was, not alone. Thud. As she looked up at the sky, Eutania felt a sting on her head. It was a similar feeling to when her father had given her a honeycomb when she was young. It hurt where she was hit. Tears trickled from her eyes. But Eutania smiled faintly at the corners of her mouth. She realized that she was not alone now. Thank you. Eutania folded her hands and bowed to the sky in gratitude. The sky was clear and bright without a single cloud. There was no second honeycomb coming to Eutania from there. Ah, there's only one left. I suppressed the yawn that was about to come out of my mouth in the morning and looked at the screen of my smartphone. There were various messages popping up at the bottom of the screen where I had turned on the game. They were new messages that came up as I attacked the gathered thieves. Of course, most of them were messages about using magic and gaining karma by knocking down characters. You used an LT, Lightning and GT. You used an LT, Lightning and GT. Your karma increased by 1. You used an LT, Lightning and GT. Your karma increased by 1. Your karma increased by 1. I used the NLT, Lightning and GT, magic to knock down the thief characters who were clustered together. And LT, Lightning and GT, was a powerful skill that inflicted 15 damage with just one use. It didn't take long to take down the thieves who were not many in number. However, even a powerful skill had its drawback of consuming mana. At the end, I ran out of mana and had to move my fingers quickly to knock down the thief. My fingers hurt from moving them almost a hundred times. But I gained five karma, so it wasn't a completely useless thing. Well, it's over once I get rid of this one. I moved my eyes to the last remaining character. A female character with ash-colored hair was standing up and looking around in the middle of the screen. She was the character who was sitting on the ground and showing a crying emoticon until a moment ago. Maybe. It was because I had killed all the thieves who were near her. She was now standing up and crying. I didn't know what had happened between her and the thieves. But I had led the thieves who were chasing her to hell, so she could now face her end peacefully. Go with them. As I touched the head of the remaining character. The speech bubble above her head changed. I looked closely at the speech bubble that was blinking above her head. Various emoticons were displayed alternately there. Sadness, joy, gratitude, sadness, joy, she cried and smiled, thanked and cried again. I was puzzled by the emoticon pattern that I had never seen before. The pattern that the characters who had been clicked by me showed was usually constant. They either showed a question mark above their head suddenly. Or they just showed a crying emoticon right away. But this character was showing a strange behavior of crying and smiling. Is there a problem with the AI intelligence? My finger that was about to click on her hesitated for some reason. A character who expressed gratitude after being attacked. She was the most peculiar one among the characters I had encountered so far. It would be nice to kill her and get karma, but I didn't know when I would meet such a character again. It wouldn't be bad to play while watching this character for a while. If I changed my mind later, I could just use an LT, Lightning and GT. As I put my finger away and watched the screen, the character who had been showing speech bubbles started to move. And at the same time, a new message popped up at the bottom of the screen. Eutania High Lost, Acquired and LT, Fanatic and GT, Trait. Your karma increased by one. I looked at the screen with a curious face at the new message that popped up. Even though I didn't kill the character, my karma increased by one. There was also a message saying that she acquired and LT, Fanatic and GT, Trait. Eutania High Lost. I didn't know whose name it was exactly. But there was one character that I could guess. Eutania High Lost. Is that her name? The only character left on the screen came into my sight. A female character with ash-colored hair who started to climb up the mountain slowly. She must have been Eutania. She acquired an LT, Fanatic and GT, trait and gave me extra karma. I could get karma without killing characters. It was information that I learned for the first time through Eutania. But hunting is still faster. 
Of course, it was only one karma after all. I didn't know which character would get an ulti, fanatic and GT, trait, so I couldn't keep doing this. It was still more efficient to hunt characters. So I moved the screen right away to find the next prey. And LT, 5, awe and fear, 1, and GT, what do people need to live? If I asked this question to anyone, most of them would give me similar answers. They would say that people need the basics to live. Food. Clothing. And a safe place to stay. There are many things that are necessary to guarantee a minimum level of life. And that seemed to be no exception for the character that was reflected in front of my eyes. The first character who awakened the Andelti, fanatic and GT, trait, Eutenia Hyrosti. She had been constantly displaying a food emoticon above her head since a while ago. They said it was an idle game, but now it's like they left the feeding to me. The catchphrase that I saw when I first encountered this game was that it was an idle game that anyone could play. Idle game. It meant that most things could be done without much effort. But looking at the character in front of me, leaving her alone didn't seem like the best option. It had been three days in game time. Eutenia had been stuck in the cave without eating anything and starving. The physics of this game were not much different from reality. If she didn't eat for a long time, she would surely die. In that sense, leaving her alone seemed like a bad idea. I can't just leave her to starve to death. It's not like I don't care about her. She was just one character. What difference would it make if one character disappeared? But still, I felt a bit reluctant to let her go. She was the first and ulti, fanatic and GT, character I got. It wouldn't be too bad to take care of one character and raise her well. I moved my finger and pressed the inventory button on the corner of the screen. Ding! A light notification sound and the items registered in the inventory appeared in my sight. Rusty Iron Sword, X3, Hard Black Bread, X4, Torn Cloak, X1, Crude Dagger, X1 The items in the inventory were all obtained through the 10 consecutive draws. It was impossible to obtain items other than through the draws in the store. That's why the contents of the inventory were not much different from a few days ago. I dragged one of the, Hard Black Bread. As I clicked and moved the graphic that looked like bread, the bread followed my finger out of the inventory. Thud. The bread that came out of the inventory fell right in front of Eutenia. As soon as I put down the, hard black bread, Eutenia's eyes went straight to it. Question, the first reaction that Eutenia showed when she faced the bread was a question mark above her head. From her perspective, it was sudden that bread appeared. It was natural for an AI to have doubts if it was normal. But soon she seemed to have made a judgment about the situation, and she picked up the bread on the floor. Eutenia's speech bubble changed quickly as she lifted up the bread. Thankful, moved, thankful, moved, the graphic of the bread was barely distinguishable from the character as she lifted it up. Eutenia started to eat the bread slowly, expressing her gratitude. Eutenia's graphic was small, and the bread's graphic was even smaller. It was hard to feel more than just understanding that she was eating from looking at the screen. But as I saw the bread disappearing little by little, it was clear that Eutenia was eating it. Is this how it feels to feed a pet? I felt a warm feeling as I watched Eutenia eat. I remembered when I fed my fish when I was young. When I put in food, the fish would swarm around and nibble at it with their mouths open and closed. Maybe because of the poor graphics, I couldn't feel more emotion than that. I rested my chin on my hand and kept watching Eutenia eat. About twenty minutes after I put down the bread. Eutenia finished eating all of it and got up from her seat. Satiated, moved, thankful, after finishing her meal, Eutenia thanked me again with a prayer gesture. I thought she was a bit crazy AI, but she seemed to be very good at expressing gratitude. Maybe I could show her some more mercy if she reacted like this. I opened my inventory and took out some other items. Crude dagger. Torn cloak. They were both items that were useful for living in the cave. As I dropped the dagger and cloak on the floor, Eutenia blinked her eyes and watched them. Take these as gifts from me, who generously gave you the results of the ten consecutive draws. They were useless items for me. I couldn't use any of them except for the magic book. But for Eutenia in front of me, they were valuable items. As I gave Eutenia the items, she showed another intense reaction and prayed again. Moved, thankful, moved, thankful, 
even if I lent money to someone in need, I wouldn't see such a reaction. I was satisfied with Eutenia's reaction and closed my inventory. I didn't think she would stay here forever. But they were useful items for living in the mountains. If I wanted to see a different reaction later, I would have to kick her out of the mountain by touching her or something. Anyway, it was fun to see Eutenia's reaction to the items I got from the draw. Except for the fact that they came out of the draw. Evil bastards. This is how you plan to take my money. I recalled the items I got from the last draw. Bread that I could feed to the character. A weapon that I could give to the character. And magic that I could use myself. Except for the unreasonable price and probability, it was a tempting composition that made me want to press it more often. I realized this temptation after I got used to the game a bit. I resisted the urge to press the draw button right away with my twitching finger. It was all for their own wallets. Eutania High lost. The Ashared girl looked up at the sky with dry lips. She had been holed up in the mountain for three days now, feeling empty about the ruined village and hateful towards the world. A nameless god had saved her from the brink of death, but that didn't mean that Eutania's life had a happy ending. Family. Clan. Relationships. Everything that supported her had already collapsed. Now, the only things left were the god who watched over her, and Eutenia herself, who had become a lonely outcast. And even that was only prolonging her life thanks to the nameless god who saved her. If it weren't for the nameless god who struck lightning at the last moment, she would have taken her own life long ago. Sigh. Eutenia let out a sigh as she looked at the cave shrouded in darkness. The cave was damp and dark, with no one else in it. Gurgle. Her stomach screamed after not eating anything for three days. She was cold. And hungry. She had never experienced such hunger for so long. At least, not as far as she could remember. She was used to facing a plentiful table every day, so this experience was unfamiliar to her. But she couldn't hope for a lavish table all of a sudden either, so all Eutenia could do was to space out to forget her hunger. Eutenia's eyes scanned the empty cave. Moss. Damp floor. Humid air. There was nothing else but Eutenia. Her eyes moved again. Moss. And damp floor. Thud. Moss. Floor. Hard black bread. Life returned to Eutenia's eyes, which had been moving listlessly. Bread fell down. What fell on the floor was unmistakably bread. It looked hard as if it had been there for a long time but it was still edible bread. Eutenia picked up the bread that had fallen on the floor and looked up at the ceiling. It was impossible for bread to sprout on moss in the middle of a cave. It wasn't that she missed it rolling on the floor either, so it must have fallen from the sky, Eutenia thought. But all she could see from the ceiling were rough stones. It must have been sent by you. A smile bloomed on Eutenia's lips as she lifted up the bread. It wasn't the last time that he sent lightning down. The nameless god had been caring for Eutenia's affairs all along. He even prepared bread for her to eat, knowing that she was hungry. Eutenia brought the bread to her mouth and bit it slightly. Crunch. Crunch. Her teeth bounced off the bread without penetrating it easily. The old bread was harder than she thought. Do I have to lick it slowly? She had no choice but to soak the bread enough to bite it off. Lick. Eutenia's tongue brushed over the surface of the bread. It was hard bread that she wouldn't have bothered to look at normally. But in this hungry situation, it was a delicious feeling just to touch it with her tongue slightly. Eutenia slowly melted the hard bread and put it in her mouth. She wasn't in a situation where she could swallow it quickly, so there was no risk of choking or vomiting. It would have been nice if I had some milk. She felt a bit regretful that she didn't have any milk to soak the hard bread in. But there was nothing better than eating bread in this hungry situation. Besides, the bread she had now was a gift of mercy from heaven. She thought it would be a sin to complain more than this. Mm -hmm. hmm. It had been quite some time since Eutenia started eating bread. The large piece of black bread had mostly disappeared into Eutenia's stomach. Now, all that remained in her hand was one last piece of bread. Eutenia put the last piece of bread in her mouth and looked at the sky with satisfaction. She felt good after filling her stomach for the first time in a while. She clasped her hands and thanked the sky briefly. Thank you for the meal. 
I appreciate it. She didn't know which god was watching over her, but he had helped her several times already. Eutenia was ready to serve and follow him no matter what god he was. He was the last milestone left in Eutenia's life. It would be foolish not to follow the only path left for her. Even if he was a god full of sinister rumors. As Eutenia prayed to the sky with excitement, she heard something falling from above. Ha! Huh. Thud! Thump! In front of Eutenia, a shabby cloak and a crudely made dagger fell down. A light dagger that anyone could use. And a warm cloak that could cover her body. Her god was not only concerned about her meal, but also her life in the mountain. Eutenia picked up the dagger with tears in her eyes. What words should I use to thank you? Really, it's a hard thing to do. They say that after hardship comes sweet reward. She thought that all the trials she had gone through were for this moment. Devotion to a nameless god. That was the path that the Ashered girl chose for herself. And LT, 6, Awe and Fear, 2, and GT, the Executor, Cloud. Under the Great Empire's Emperor, the investigators of Cloud had jurisdiction over the entire empire, and they all boasted of their outstanding military prowess. In the deep darkness of the empire, there were all kinds of vicious criminals lurking. The investigators of Cloud who had to face them had to have a high level of military prowess. It was no exception for Rick Swale, a third-class investigator of Cloud who was patrolling a small village on the outskirts of the empire. Rick Swale. The sharpied investigator scanned the empty village. A fireplace that still had warmth. Food scraps rolling on the floor. A wet cloth hanging on the window. The whole village showed signs of life. It meant that people had been living there until recently. However, contrary to the appearance of the village, there was not a single person in sight. Rick looked at the guide who had brought him to the village and asked. So this happened overnight? Yes, sir. The entire village disappeared in one day. Is there any possibility that they moved somewhere as a group? No way. My friend Jack is, he has a bad leg. The guide who accompanied Rick was someone who had a friend in this village. He had a friend who had difficulty moving because of his bad leg. If he said so, it was unlikely that they had moved somewhere. Rick walked towards the village and said. I can feel the signs of life, but I don't see anyone. Rick felt uneasy as he walked around the village and opened each door one by one. Creek. The old wooden doors made of wood opened easily without any resistance. But he couldn't find any people in any of the buildings he entered. There were traces of people, but the actual subjects were nowhere to be found. If the villagers hadn't moved as a group, it meant that the entire population had evaporated in one day. Any guesses? Uh, I heard rumors that there were bandits around here. Maybe they did it. Bandits. Rick scanned the village again. If there was a fight, there would have been traces of it. But he couldn't find any bloodstains or anything like that in the village. The only strange thing was that there were black scorch marks all over the village. It was a peculiar mark that didn't seem to be caused by fire. If there were bandits, there would have been signs of resistance. Then. It looks like there's a mage nearby. The ability to erase a whole village without leaving any traces. And the black scorch marks that appeared all over the village. Combining all these things, Rick Swale could only come to one conclusion. There was a mage nearby. And not just any mage, but a powerful one who could leave no traces behind. A mage. The guide looked horrified when he heard Rick's words. The existence of mages was not uncommon in the Empire. There were also mages among the investigators of Cloud who used magic. But people had long been afraid of evil mages. There were also those who abused magic on the wanted list of Cloud, so it was understandable that the guide was scared. Don't make too much noise. He might still be hiding nearby. Okay. By the way, you said there were bandits around here. I don't know much about it, but I heard rumors that sometimes gangs of thieves roam around. Rick frowned as he heard about the bandits. Isn't it too dangerous for you to go alone? There's a shortcut I know around here. If I go through there, I won't run into any thieves. I see. Then you should go back now. I'll investigate by myself from now on. Rick dismissed the guide with his words. An unknown mage and a gang of bandits. 
he didn't know which one was more dangerous. And the guide who had brought Rick to the village weighed more on the former. He bowed his head and left after a brief farewell to Rick. Rick looked up at the sky blankly in the desolate village where he was left alone. I got myself into a tricky situation this time. Your karma increased by one point. Your karma increased by one point. You reached level three. Two more days passed since I gave Eutania a dagger and a cloak as gifts. During that time, I found five more villages and destroyed three of them. One of them was filled with bandits who were chasing Eutania. Of course, they met their end by my and LT, lightning and GT, magic just like the previous bandits I encountered. I gained nearly 30 karma points by destroying three villages. Karma 30. It was enough to level up again. Naturally, I reached level 3 with the karma I gained this time. Level 3, my magic power increased a lot. The biggest change that happened when I reached level 3 was the increase in magic power. My magic power increased by twice as much as before when I leveled up. If I could use and LT, lightning and GT, 10 times with my previous magic power, now I could use it 20 times in a row. It was definitely a drastic increase in ability. If I assumed that my magic power increased by twice every time I leveled up, then by the time I reached level 10, I would be able to use it more than 1000 times in a row. And LT, Eye of the Observer, LV, 2, and GT, has grown. And LT, Eye of the Observer, LV, 3, and GT, has been achieved. You can observe the continent with a clearer vision than before. The next change was in and LT, Eye of the Observer and GT. The level of and LT, Eye of the Observer and GT, skill increased, and I was able to face a sharper graphic than before. If the character I saw before was a dot graphic, now it was a cute 3D graphic level. It was a game that evolved its graphics as the level increased. No matter how I thought about it, it was a strange structure. And the appearance of Eutenia, who I faced with the new graphics, was more adorable than I expected. It feels like I'm really raising a character like this. The ashared tiny character was nibbling on the black bread in her hand. She looked like a squirrel eating an acorn. She was still eating while showing various speech bubbles above her head. Judging by the fact that the content did not change, the third level and LT, Eye of the Observer and GT, did not affect the speech bubbles. I watched Eutenia for a while and then turned my eyes to see the next change. Warning, karma that is excessively biased in one direction has a high possibility of causing and LT, causality adjustment and GT. The next message was a warning sent by the and LT, karma's judgment and GT, skill. It said that if karma was biased in one direction, and LT, causality adjustment and GT, could occur. But I didn't know what to do to make karma balanced. And I couldn't just stop leveling up in a game that I paid 50, 0, 0, 0, 1, 4. I decided to ignore the message. I don't know what this is, so pass. And next is, this is here again. I scrolled down and looked at the message with a bitter smile. The next skill that evolved had a very familiar name. It was because it was a skill from the store that occupied the spot. And LT, paid currency store, LV, max, and GT, skill has been expanded. You have acquired and LT, paid currency store, LV, max plus one, and GT. You can now use paid currency to purchase items from the store. The and LT, paid currency store and GT, skill had evolved. And what was more peculiar was that the level notation of the and LT, paid currency store and GT, skill was strange. Skill level max plus one. If the level is max, then it should end there. How can there be a level max plus one? Anyway, it was absurd that the store evolved as the level increased. It was a game that became more and more ridiculous as I saw it. And I was a user who played that game. I marveled at myself who enjoyed such a game, and moved my finger to the back button. Who would buy this? I'll never buy it. I would never come back to this store again. That's what I thought as I pressed the back button. At that moment, I felt something strange and looked at my finger. My finger that was heading towards the back button moved in a weird direction. What, what is this? Wait, why is this happening? There was a strong force somewhere on the screen that pulled my finger in. My finger moved without my will. I tried to shake off the force on my finger, but the unknown force was stronger than I thought. 
In an instant, my finger moved to the 10 times draw button. Click. That's how my finger pressed the 10 times draw button. Sigh. The screen flashed and the draw page started to appear. I looked at the items that came out one by one with a blank face. Ding dong. The text message from the card company that popped up at the top of the screen was extra. And LT, 7, awe and fear, 3, and GT, payment amount, 69, 901. It was a level that could be burdensome to use as a dining cost if the first digit exceeded 5, but I ended up spending 70, 0001 on one draw. It would be a lie if my blood pressure didn't rise. I looked at the draw screen with a blank expression. Did I really press this with my finger? My finger suddenly ran to the draw button. Even though I had such a memory, it was not easy to believe the surreal memory. Maybe I pressed it and was mistaken. I wondered for a moment if I wanted to draw ten times so badly that I distorted my memory. I weighed the reliability between reality and memory, and quickly compromised with reality. Ah, uh, I don't know. I guess I wanted to draw that much. Compared to the games that cost a lot of money, I hadn't spent that much yet. It's not like I skipped meals because of the draw. It feels like I'm reminded of the old days. Now it's nothing but a romance of my past childhood. I finished my quick regret and turned my eyes to the draw screen to check the contents. Items of various colors were displayed on the screen. You have acquired, baguette. You have acquired, iron sword. You have acquired, stylish tunic. You have acquired, baguette. You have acquired, baguette. You have acquired, steel shield. You have acquired, sponge cake. You have acquired, magic book, barrier. You have acquired, torn tunic. You have acquired, iron sword. The guide that said, better draw seemed to be true, as the items that came out of the draw were mostly different from before. The biggest difference was that there were no broken items unlike before. I started to look at the items that came out of the draw one by one. The first thing to look at was food. Baguette. And, sponge cake. Neither of them were items that I could use. Eutenia would like them if I gave them to her. Come to think of it, she's eating more expensive than me. If you divide the 10 times draw cost of 69, 901 by 10, it would be about 7, 0, 0, 0, 1 each. I took out the, sponge cake, from my inventory and handed it to Eutenia. Maybe it was because a different food popped out instead of the, hard black bread, she had been eating for days. Eutenia, who was curious, took a piece of the, sponge cake and put it in her mouth. She showed a more intense reaction than before after eating the cake. Thankful, tears, moved, thankful, 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 it was a 7, 0, 0, 0, 1 worth of food. If she didn't show such a reaction, I would have been disappointed. I also threw the, stylish tunic, that was in my inventory on the floor while I was at it. It seemed better than what she was wearing now. She would look neater than now with a, torn cloak, wrapped around her if she changed her clothes. Eutenia picked up the, stylish tunic, and thanked me again and accepted the gift. I watched Eutenia for a while as she ate the cake and was moved, then moved my eyes back to the inventory to check the next item. It's not rusty this time. Iron sword, and, steel shield. They were quite different from the, rusty iron sword, that came out before. They could be used if given to a suitable character. But it was awkward to give them to Eutenia right now. She didn't seem like someone who could wield a sword anyway. If I ever raise a character that needs them, I'll give them these items then. And lastly, today's only harvest. The only magic book that came out of the ten times draw. I looked closely at the magic book I got new. Magic book, barrier. Barrier was a magic that was used to protect people. It didn't seem like a good magic to acquire karma. I would have learned it in an instant if it was an attack magic, but it was hard to learn because it had a different purpose. What should I do with this? I thought of one question as I looked at the magic book. Can't the character learn this and use magic? If I acquire a magic book, the magic book disappears from my inventory. But it's different if I give it to Eutenia. As long as she doesn't eat the magic book, the magic book won't disappear. I don't know if I can get the magic book back, but it's worth a try. I dragged the magic book I was holding in front of Eutenia. 
Thud. As the magic book suddenly fell in front of her, Eutenia, who was eating the cake, looked up at the sky. Question, thankful, that's how I dumped all the products of the ten times draw to Eutenia. It was an act of giving to her who had the andlt, fanatic and gt, trait, thinking that she was on my side. Some kind of result will come out soon. I don't know if the result is good or bad. I wanted to see Eutenia's appearance who learned magic if possible. It would be fun if she learned magic. Magic books are also items that can be given to characters. I didn't think it was possible without any reason. The game's interaction itself was more elaborate than I thought. There must be some preparation for magic as well. At least I believe that. Thud. I turned off the screen of my smartphone by pressing the button, after giving Eutenia the magic book. I did everything I could. Now it was time to wait until my mana came back up. Ah. My 70, 0001. Sigh. I looked at my wallet that was rolling on the bed with a dry mouth. My empty wallet looked pitiful today. I guess I'll have to settle for ramen for dinner tonight. Damn developers. I cursed at someone who might be somewhere, and threw myself on the soft bed. Eutenia had been living in the cave for quite a long time. It was an escape from the world that she no longer wanted to face. She thought it would be better to avoid meeting people from the outside world, even if it meant starving and freezing in the wilderness. But she never had to starve in the cave. It was all thanks to the grace of a nameless god who was watching over her. The nameless god visited her regularly and gave her gifts. A dagger and a cloak. And even some edible black bread. They were things that she needed to survive in the mountains. If she wanted to eat meat, she could hunt rabbits with the dagger. If she felt cold, she could wrap herself with the old cloak. The items were somewhat crude or worn out, but they were good enough for using in the cave. Thanks to them, Eutenia's cave life was quite comfortable. Thank you for taking care of me every day. So Eutenia prayed as usual today. She had never seen his face, but she was sure of his existence. She hoped that someday, when she became a better believer, he would let her hear his voice. As Eutenia was praying with her hands clasped, she heard something falling from the sky. Thud. The sound echoed in the cave and Eutenia looked ahead. There was a small wooden plate with a soft sponge cake on it. What is this? She said as she brought the cake closer to her. Eutenia was a noble lady of a baron's family, but she was only a poor noble from a rural village. Even for her, the sponge cake in front of her was not an easy food to get. There was also a wooden fork next to the sponge cake. She took out the dagger from her pocket and cut the cake neatly. She took a piece of it. I should eat it gratefully since he gave it to me. She exclaimed as she saw the fork digging into the cake softly. It was much softer than the black bread that she ate every day. She swallowed her saliva as she saw the piece of cake on the fork. She took a bite of it. Mm -mm. The cake melted softly in her mouth. She tasted the sweetness of sugar from the cake. It was a sweetness that she could never feel from the hard black bread. No, she didn't have many chances to eat such food in her whole life. She let out an exclamation with a bright face as she chewed on the cake. It's sweet. It's so good. The cake that she put in her mouth disappeared in an instant. She finished eating all the cake that came into her mouth and looked at the cake again. Maybe he gave her a special meal today. It was a different food from the usual black bread. Thud. Another thing fell in front of her as she tried to eat the cake again with a wave of emotion. This time, it was not food but clothes. This is, clothes. Eutenia picked up the clothes that fell in front of her. It was a refined tunic at first glance. It looked like something that she could wear outside without any problem. It was different from the old and dirty items that she had received so far. It didn't seem like something that she could use in the mountains. Ah. As soon as she saw the clothes that fell in front of her, Eutenia realized what the god who watched over her wanted. He gave her clean clothes unlike before. Eutenia thought there was only one meaning to it. He wanted her to go outside wearing this. He meant that her escape in this dark cave was coming to an end soon. He wants me to go out. She had decided to live for him since he saved her life from the bandits. She couldn't stay in this cave forever either. She had something to do. And that must be his will. 
If that's what you want. As if to support Yutinia's determination, one last gift fell from the sky. Thud. A thick magic book rolled on the floor. And LT. 8, Awe and Fear, 4, and GT, I'm starting to understand it now. At the entrance of an empty cave. There, Eutenia was reading a magic book by herself, murmuring softly. She was wearing a neat tunic that she had received from the great person she served. It had been a week since she had received the book as a gift from him. Eutenia had been busy trying to understand the magic book during that time. And now, she had achieved some results. What I learned from my father was quite helpful. Eutenia's slender finger turned the page of the thick magic book. Magic was not an easy subject that anyone could understand. If Eutenia had not learned the minimum education as a noble, she would have needed more time to understand the magic book. Fortunately, Eutenia had a natural talent for handling magic. It meant that she understood the basics of magic in just a week. Then, she try it out now. Thud. She closed the magic book that was open and got up from her seat. She held the magic book in her arms and walked slowly toward the outside of the cave. Russell. Russell. Eutenia's light footsteps brushed past the bushes. She came out of the bushes and looked for a large stone on the ground. A rough-looking stone was one. And next to it was a flat-shaped stone. Eutenia looked at the stones around her and picked up one that had a suitable weight. Is this weight okay? A heavy sensation came from her palm that held the stone. Thump. Thump. She tossed and caught the stone lightly and adjusted her posture. Right after that, she threw the stone vertically high and reached out her hand toward the sky. A blue haze bloomed from her palm and began to wrap around Eutenia's body. The magic that wrapped around Eutenia began to spread around her. At that moment, Eutenia condensed her magic and used it. Barrier. Boom. The stone that was falling above Eutenia's head bounced off a translucent barrier. A hemispherical shield that spread around her protected her from the stone. It was a low-level defensive magic, barrier. She looked at the shield that protected her with sparkling eyes. The barrier of blue color prevented anything from approaching her. She poked the barrier around her with her hand, but the condensed magic blocked even Eutenia. It's amazing. This must be magic. Swoosh. Eutenia, who had been admiring the barrier for a while, waved her hand and scattered the gathered magic. The solid cohesion of magic was loosened, and the barrier around her disappeared without a trace. It was a supernatural miracle that she created in thin air with just her gesture. It was the moment when Eutenia became interested in magic. If I keep learning these magics, I'm sure it will help his wish. Magic is a study that reproduces things and phenomena. It reproduces phenomena by studying the flow, and imitates things by observing their essence. That's why extreme magic can create miracles that defy nature. And Eutenia was a human who was born with talent for learning such magic. A genius does not need much time to realize their potential. Eutenia was no exception. She recalled the contents of the magic book and reached out her hand toward the empty front. Shield. A translucent blue barrier appeared in the air where Eutenia's hand touched. The shield magic was not in the magic book that Eutenia received. It was something that she implemented herself by understanding the characteristics of barrier magic. She created a shield in midair and tapped it lightly with her hand. Boom! Ripples occurred where Eutenia's hand touched. It still needs some improvement. Maybe I need more magic. Eutenia, who had been touching the shield several times, moved her hand like before and scattered it. She tried each magic once and wanted to modify and use it again. She became interested in learning new magics for the first time. After that, Eutenia continued to use barrier and shield magics and observed their changes for a long time. Eutenia's magic experiment lasted until sunset. The execution agency of the Empire, Cloud Centurio's branch office. There, Rick Swale, a third-class investigator, looked at his superior. Rick's expression was more serious than ever. He usually had a smile on his face and joked with his superior. But Rick was not in a situation where he could even pretend to laugh with his superior. The reason was the case he was reporting. Rick. How big is the damage of this case? The squint-eyed investigator who was sitting in front of Rick asked him. 
second class investigator, Hus Alamir. He was showing his displeasure without hiding it after hearing Rick's report. Four villages disappeared. Rick reported to his superior in front of him with a stifling feeling. It was a case where four villages had vanished altogether. The villages were not destroyed or looted by bandits. All the objects and facilities were left as they were, but only the people were all missing. It was not a case that could be explained in normal terms. Rick's words made Hus scratch his throat and ask the next question. What's the possibility that they were attacked by bandits? Everything that could be worth money in the village was left as it was. There was nothing missing. Yes. There was no sign of tampering. If bandits had moved, there should not have been anything worth money left in the village. But there was no trace of looting, let alone any proper bloodstains, in the village. That was why Rick was sure that it was not the work of bandits. Bandits could not create such a scene. At least, it was not an act motivated by money. Huss listened to Rick's story and asked another question. What's the possibility that they moved somewhere as a group? There was no one left. Among the vanished villages, there was one with a person who had a disability, but even they disappeared without a trace. Rick, who had a hunch, searched for signs of people around the village. A large-scale movement would inevitably leave some clues. But he could not find any evidence that the villagers had moved in groups near the village. The second possibility that Hus thought of was also meaningless. As one possibility after another was denied, Hus glared at the wooden board he was holding with a click of his tongue. So you're saying that only the people disappeared without any trace? Yes. At least that's what I confirmed. Rick said that was the reason he came to see Hus today. No matter how much he searched the village, he could not find any proper clues. It was a case where only the villagers disappeared as a whole, leaving everything else as it was. In Rick's shallow opinion, the only thing he could guess was the work of a magician. That's why he came to see Hus, a high-level combat magician, to report and ask for his opinion. But Hus showed a gloomy reaction even after hearing Rick's words. Even Hus, who was a magician himself, did not seem to have any idea. People just vanished. If it were me, I would rather focus on the fact that you couldn't find any traces. Mr. Hus. Is there any possibility that it was the work of a magician? The work of a magician? I mean, the possibility that they used magic to erase the village. Rick laid out his reasoning to Hus, who was pondering. But Hus shook his head as soon as he heard that story. He looked at Rick with incredulous eyes instead. Nonsense. If they used magic, there would be no reason for the objects around them to be intact. Couldn't they have used magic only on people? Rick Swale. Do you move while distinguishing between your enemies and allies? If there was such a great magic, there would be no misfortune of dying by friendly fire on the battlefield. Rick became speechless at Hussa's words. He thought that if it was magic, something similar would be possible. But according to Hus, who was a combat magician, even magic was difficult to do such a thing. There was no magic that could identify and move objects and people separately. That was the conclusion of this conversation. Rick felt more frustrated by Hussa's realistic words. But, several villages have disappeared without a trace. I think it's more likely that you missed something. Mr. Huss. But if what you said is true, maybe someone made an offering to an evil god or something. Offering. Offering. The moment he heard that word, Rick felt like his chest was cleared. It was the only clue thrown into the frustrating case. He looked at Huss's face with anticipation. I saw this in an old document. The priests who worshipped the evil god sacrificed people for their evil deeds. The priests of the evil god. Of course they all died in the last war. They moved directly from the holy land, so there wouldn't be any left. I see. Of course I think you did a sloppy investigation. The priests of the evil god. Sacrifice. Offering. The three keywords matched in Rick's head and drew a picture. If there were still priests who worshipped the evil god. And if they were plotting something by offering people as sacrifices. It wouldn't be impossible to understand why four villages disappeared at once. Rick came to a conclusion in his mind and decided to search around the village again. Mr. Huss. Did you decide to go back and investigate? I'll find the traces of the evil god and come back. What? Wait there. 
Bang. Rick closed the door and ran outside. The number of villages where people went missing was four. If he searched thoroughly within their radius, he might be able to find traces of the evil god. Clang. Rick grabbed his sword on his waist and moved toward his horse that he had tied up. And LT, 9, Awe and Fear, 5, and GT, you have reached level 4. And LT, Eye of the Observer, LV, 3, and GT, has grown. And LT, Eye of the Observer, LV, 4, and GT, has been achieved. You can observe the continent with a clearer vision than before. It had been several days since I handed over the magic book to Eutenia. In game time, it was about 10 days. During that time, I hunted diligently and as a result, I was able to reach level 4 at a fast pace. When I reached level 4, my magic power increased significantly once again. Also, when the eye of the observer leveled up, the speech bubble showed different content than before. Bread. Of course, even though it showed different content, it was only a level of displaying two letters of dialogue. It was not much different from when emoticons appeared. Eutenia, who woke up from her sleep and practiced magic, prayed and looked for bread. It clearly meant that she wanted me to give her some bread. I chuckled at Eutenia's request and looked at her. Hey, did I leave bread with you? I briefly wondered if I should get rid of it for good. I took out a baguette from my inventory and put it down in front of Eutenia. Thud. Eutenia thanked me after seeing the baguette that fell on the floor. Thank you. Thank you. The extremely short dialogue felt awkward. Eutenia finished her thanks and went into the cave to tear and eat the bread. I calmly watched her eat. It was true that she looked cute eating bread like that. Did I develop some affection for her while watching her? I didn't feel like doing anything to her anymore. Go ahead, eat. I should take care of your food since you learned magic. And if I kept watching her, I could also see Eutenia using barrier magic. The magic book I gave to Eutenia had an effect. Now that the character realized that she could use magic, I felt like giving her other magic books and testing them out. If I gave her various magic books, I could surely train her into a perfect mage character. If only I had enough money in my wallet. I can't play the game as I want without money. The cost of 10 draws had risen to 70, 0001, so it was not easy to press the draw button once. Fortunately, the and LT, paid currency shop and GT, did not increase its level when I reached level 4. The price of 10 draws was still at 70, 0001. It was not long before payday, so I decided to try it once when I got paid. I thought about that as I watched Eutenia. Grow well and eat well. Then you can smash everything with your hands. As I watched her, Eutenia came out again after finishing her meal. She had a magic book in her hand as she came out. She seemed to be practicing magic again. I was about to move the screen as I prepared for training. It was boring to just watch her practice magic, so I thought I would go hunting while Eutenia practiced. If it wasn't for one character coming towards me from afar. A man in armor ran towards me in the corner of my sight where I was about to go hunting. What is this? I've never seen this outfit before. I had taken care of several villages so far, but this was the first time I saw someone wearing this outfit. The man in blue uniform moved towards where Eutenia was. As soon as he saw Eutenia, he showed signs of caution and started approaching her. He had a sword in his hand that looked much better than the ones used by the thieves. A decent-looking sword. And a neat-looking uniform. He didn't look like a thief by his outfit. Eutenia raised a speech bubble over her head when she saw the man approaching her. Cloud Investigator Cloud Investigator these two letters were all that came out of Eutenia's mouth. It seemed like the man's name was Rick. Was it because Eutenia spoke to him? The man who approached Eutenia also stopped and raised a speech bubble over his head You are you you the two who faced each other began to talk did they know each other from before? I watched them talk smoothly it was also fun to watch the interaction between characters like this but there was no way to know exactly what Rick and Eutenia were talking about it felt like deciphering some kind of code village yes sometimes there were conversations that I could understand along the way the word that the man just said was one of them yes these two letters were something I could clearly understand oh, I can understand that. Of course, I couldn't understand anything else whoever came up with the idea, 
cutting the dialogue into two letters because the level was low was not a good idea I sighed and continued to watch their conversation Yatinia and Rick exchanged a few more words after that. The conversation that had been going on was ended by the man raising his sword towards Yatinia. I wondered what the point of talking was, when it all came down to fighting. Of course, fighting was the essence of a game. The moment of battle that I had been waiting for had arrived. The prey has walked into my trap. I was done watching the interaction. Now it was time to turn the character in front of me into karma. Tap. I lightly touched the man who was aiming his sword at me. It was a plan to deal one damage and observe his reaction. And at that moment. I witnessed an unexpected sight. No way. Clang. The man swung his sword and blocked my touch. A zero damage appeared above his head, who had defended against the attack. He had completely nullified the attack with his sword. I couldn't help but be surprised by the man who had blocked my touch attack without any damage. What? He blocked it. Talk. I moved my finger and tried another touch attack. Of course, the man's reaction was not much different from before. Clang. His sword swung again and a zero damage appeared above his head. It was a proof that his defense was not a coincidence. Wow, what is this? Is he a boss monster or an elite monster? There are some games that have monsters with unique patterns. Elite monsters. Or boss monsters. They show different patterns from normal monsters, and force different strategies to defeat them. And the male character in front of me seemed to belong to that category. So basic attacks don't work on him. I didn't expect him to block my basic attack. It was natural to be surprised by an unexpected pattern. But if he was a game monster, there had to be a way to break him down. I decided to use the NLT, Lightning and GT, skill that I had bought with expensive money. Squeeze. I overlapped the target area of the and LT, Lightning and GT, skill completely over the moving character. You used and LT, Lightning and GT. Zap. The screen flashed and lightning struck down on the man. The man, who faced the falling lightning, bent his body and took a defensive stance. It was impossible to block the lightning with a sword. The lightning that fell from the sky pierced through the man's defense. Arg. The man screamed as he was hit by and LT, lightning and GT. A nine damage appeared above his head. It was a low number compared to the usual fifteen damage that I dealt. It meant that I needed more mana than when hunting other characters. But considering that he was an elite monster, the fact that I could attack him at all was important. You're dead now. I started to spam the and LT, lightning and GT, skill. Zap. 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 The pleasant sound of lightning rang out from the speaker one after another. It had been two days since Rick, a third-class investigator of Cloud, left to find the traces of the evil god. During that time, Rick had wandered around several villages looking for clues, but he had only been disappointed every time. He couldn't find any signs of the evil god around the villages. That's why he ended up at a village that faced the entrance of a mountain range after a long time of thinking. But something happened when Rick tried to leave the village and enter the mountain range. The horse that he rode into the mountain path suddenly threw Rick off and tried to run away. Rick barely calmed down the horse and tied it up in the village, but he couldn't move with it anymore. He had no choice but to leave the horse behind and move alone. The atmosphere around here is not good. Rick felt goosebumps as he felt the eerie aura around him as he entered the mountain path. There was something in the mountain range. Something that could not be measured by human eyes. Rick walked forward without letting go of his guard. He felt cold sweat running down his back with every step he took. After about ten minutes of wandering around the mountain path, someone's figure came into Rick's sight as he was on alert. There's someone here. Rick's eyes scanned over the person standing in front of a cave. It was a nameless girl with ash-colored hair fluttering in the wind. Click. Rick's hand tightened around his sword. She looked too clean to be living in the mountains. She seemed suspicious no matter how he looked at her. Is she a priestess of the evil god? The book in her hand also looked unusual. There was no reason to carry such a thick book around while visiting the mountains. And the thickness and appearance of the book looked like a scripture or a magic book. A mage. Or a priestess. Either way, 
it was a profession that raised enough suspicion. I'll find out if I check it myself. Risking his life was the duty of an investigator. To confirm the identity of the other party, he had to face them at least once. Swoosh. Rick drew his sword and started to move towards the girl. And LT, 10, awe and fear, 6, and GT, Rick drew his sword and started moving towards the girl. He didn't want to surprise her, so he didn't bother to hide his footsteps. The sound of Rick's steps echoed through the bushes, and the girl, who was staring at the sky, turned her eyes to him. The distance that seemed to be hundreds of steps was quickly shortened. Rick arrived in front of the girl with swift steps and stopped a few paces away from her. A cloud investigator. The girl said as she scanned Rick once. She recognized his identity by looking at his uniform. Her eyes alternated between his neat uniform and the sword in his hand. He was wearing a cloud uniform and holding a sword. It wasn't hard to guess what Rick was thinking. Are you living here? That doesn't seem like something you would be interested in. The girl's eyes showed wariness at Rick's question. It was a suspicious reaction. She was wary of him, a cloud investigator. Rick intuitively realized that the girl in front of him was hiding something. If you didn't do anything to the nearby village, it would be better for you to cooperate with the investigation. What happened to the village? Yeah. Several villagers disappeared without a trace. She couldn't help but be surprised by the news that the whole village had disappeared. The girl showed a puzzled look at Rick's words. She looked innocent, as if she had nothing to do with it. But she was a person who lived alone in the dangerous mountains. She didn't seem to be starving, judging by the baguettes in the cave. She was too well fed for someone who lived in the mountains. Rick didn't relax his tension towards the girl. The whole village disappeared, that's amazing. You're quite calm about it. But miss, where did you get those breads behind you? Those breads? Oh, you mean the grace. Grace. It's the meal that the Great One gave me. The Great One. And grace. Both were words that could be misunderstood. Rick was sure that the girl in front of him was a priestess of someone. She wasn't from the Holy Land, judging by her clothes and word choice. And even if she was a high priestess of the Holy Land, receiving bread was something strange. It was more likely that she had a connection with an evil god. Who is this great one? How can a mere human call his name? Is there any possibility that he took away the villagers? The last question was half-joking. Of course, Rick didn't expect a meaningful answer either. But the girl in front of him was more peculiar than he thought. She answered Rick's question with an affectionate face. I don't know either. But if he did take them away, they would be going back to where they belong. Wouldn't they be happy then? She's completely crazy. You should be careful with your words. You might get punished by heaven. The girl in front of him was not normal. The moment he realized that fact, Rick pointed his sword at her. There was no point in questioning her further. She was clearly a person who served an evil god. If he didn't execute her here and now, there might be more damage in the future. So it seems that this great one of yours took away the people. What are you doing? The girl asked as she saw the sword aimed at her. She still pretended to be innocent. Rick felt nauseous at her sight. She was a girl who lived alone in the mountains where all kinds of beasts appeared frequently. She was obviously not an ordinary being. Even if she wore a human disguise, her essence as a priestess of an evil god did not change. What am I doing? You swallowed up so many people with your evil god and you have the nerve to ask me that. I see. I see. I think this world would be better off without people like you. She said with cold eyes. As soon as her words ended, Rick felt a huge pressure from the sky. He couldn't see it. But he could sense it. Something beyond his perception was targeting him and moving. It aimed for his head. Rick reflexively raised his sword to protect his head. Clang. A heavy vibration ran through his hand that blocked the attack. He had fended off a sudden attack, but he couldn't help being shocked. He couldn't see its shape or form. But he felt a crushing force on his body that had a definite presence. The girl in front of him had done something. He sensed that and rushed towards her. I won't let you do anything else. He closed the gap between them with light steps. Five steps. 
Four steps. And three steps. As Rick was about to swing his sword at the rapidly closing distance, he felt the pressure again and lifted his sword. Clang. With a heavy impact on his sword, Rick reflexively stepped back a few steps. I told you. You'll be punished by heaven if you're rude. The girl, who hugged the book, smiled and looked at him. She was watching him after doing something. Ugh. Rick clenched his teeth at the sight of the relaxed girl and fixed his posture. He would only lose the advantage if he let the enemy take the initiative. Rick readied himself and ran towards the girl again. If only it wasn't for the enormous amount of magic that started to gather above his head. An attack magic is coming. It looked like a simple magic of the lower realm. But the amount of magic gathered for the magic was extraordinary. It was too late to get out of the range of the magic. He had no choice but to defend himself. Rick pulled up his whole body's magic and prepared to withstand the attack. Boom! With a thunderous roar, a powerful lightning bolt pierced through Rick's body. Rick screamed in agony as if his guts were burning. It was this powerful even though he reduced the impact by pulling up his magic. If he took a few more hits, his life would be in danger. Rick suppressed the pain that came from his whole body and analyzed the situation. The enemy could pour out magic from a distance. If he kept his distance, he would have to endure the enemy's attacks one-sidedly. He had to close the gap between him and the girl somehow. Rick Swale. Pull yourself together. Rick encouraged himself and got ready again. He would be attacked if he stayed still. He had to break through the enemy's long-range attacks to get close to her. A simple charge would be easily blocked. Rick devised a strategy to deal with the priestess of an evil god and ran forward with his sword in his hand. Huff. Tap tap tap. His body moved forward with light movements. Even as Rick showed irregular movements, the magic that poured out at him did not stop. Boom. Boom. With successive thunderous noises, lightning bolts fell on the places where Rick had passed by. The threatening lightning bolts were meaningless if they didn't hit him. Rick wrapped his body with magic and charged at the girl. Die now. His sword swung at the girl who was close in an instant. The girl who held the magic book was not prepared for any response. Rick did not doubt that his strike would cut her down. Until he saw her lips move before him. Barrier. Crack. The sharp sword strike grazed the surface of the barrier and passed by. A large crack appeared on the surface of the barrier where the magic-filled sword had brushed by. He was momentarily confused by the sudden appearance of the barrier. But he quickly regained his posture and swung his sword again. He thought he could destroy the barrier in front of him with one more swing of his sword. If it wasn't for the lightning bolt that fell on his head from above. Coup. Coup. Boom. Rick's body twitched as it was hit by the lightning bolt from the sky. Rick tried to block the next attack by pulling up his magic after being hit by the lightning bolt. But the evil god who watched him did not allow it. Boom. Boom. Several more lightning bolts fell on Rick's head with his sword in hand. Rick's body convulsed as he was hit by consecutive lightning bolts. Kook. Coo. Thud. His sword fell from his hand and dug into the ground. Rick collapsed on the spot with his eyes rolled back. But the wrath of the evil god that was directed at him did not spare him even when he was down. Boom. Boom. Lightning bolts rained down from the dry sky without pause. Rick's consciousness faded as he felt his body being pounded by lightning bolts. As his consciousness scattered, Rick looked up at the girl in front of him. She was filled with awe in her eyes. Cloud. Centrius Branch. Hus Alamir, a second-class investigator, looked at the paper in front of him with a troubled expression. He had left for an investigation to find traces of an evil god, saying that he was a third-class investigator, Rick. It had been ten days since then. But Rick, who had left for an investigation, had not returned to the branch yet. If he had not found any traces near the village, he would have come back to ask for help from Huss, but what came back was not Rick but a single report. Rick Swale. Huss read the contents of the paper in front of him again. Rick Swale. Missing. His horse was found in a nearby village. A cloud investigator who missed the regular reporting deadline, and even left his horse behind and disappeared. 
something must have happened to him. He recalled his junior who had disappeared and clenched the report in his hand. Evil God, evil God. Without leaving any traces, the villagers of four villages had disappeared altogether. It was hard to believe when he first heard the report from Rick. What kind of thing could make people disappear without any traces? He thought Rick had not done a thorough investigation. But now, even Rick, the investigator who had reported it, was gone without a trace. There was something here. He sensed that and bit his lip. A being that could erase people without a trace. And a being that could wipe out a whole village without a sound. Such a being was staying nearby. I need to consult with the Holy Land. Hus took out a piece of paper and dipped his dry pen in ink. Swoosh. He spread the paper neatly and started writing a letter on it. The enemy was not an ordinary criminal, but a different kind of being. And to deal with an evil god, he needed an expert who matched him. And LT, 11, Apostle, Eutenia Hyrest, 1, and GT, you have reached level 5. And LT, I of the Observer, LV, 4, and GT, has grown. And LT, I of the Observer, LV, 5, and GT, has been achieved. You can observe the continent with a clearer vision than before. Several days have passed since I hunted the elite monster. About ten days in game time, I guess. During that time, I had been hunting steadily and finally reached level 5. Level 5. It was a low number for a game level, but it took longer than I expected to achieve it. Maybe it was because the karma requirement increased as the level went up, and also because the villagers who were converted to karma did not respawn in the village. Unlike other games, there was no clear space that could be called a hunting ground. I had to explore new areas in order to hunt. At this point, I wondered what part of this game was idle type. Thank you. However, level 5 showed more drastic changes than before. First of all, NLT, I of the Observer and GT, evolved and started to display rough dialogue contents. Now I could understand most of what Eutenia was saying. A whole five letters of dialogue were fully displayed. Compared to the crude speech bubbles with two letters that used to appear, it was a huge improvement. She's more polite than I thought. Considering how she used to say things like, bread. Thanks, all the time, her personality now seemed completely opposite to what I had seen before. Apparently, Eutenia was a courteous character. It made me feel bad for mistaking her as rude because of the low level and LT. I of the Observer and GT. It was not like I gave her a lot of bread, though. I left Eutenia alone as she thanked me for the bread, and scrolled down the message tab to check the next message. Warning, excessively biased karma in one direction may trigger and LT, causality adjustment and GT. And LT, karma's nickname and GT, has tilted. And LT, karma's nickname, offering and GT, has been activated. From now on, you can obtain karma or items through offerings directed at you. Next, there was a change in the skill and LT, karma's nickname and GT. The warning about and LT, causality adjustment and GT, was the same as before, but this time there was one more thing added. A skill called and LT, karma's nickname, offering and GT, appeared. Offering usually refers to a ritual of presenting offerings to transcendent beings like gods. It seemed that I could receive offerings from other characters since this skill was activated. Of course, the only being who could offer me anything right now was Eutenia. Offering, huh? The only thing I can think of is the magic book. The only item that came to my mind was the magic book, barrier, that I had given to Eutenia. Even that was something that I could only get back if I could communicate with her at least minimally. I decided to skip over the offering part for now. I moved the scroll to find the next message. As I scrolled down, a new skill with a name I had never seen before greeted me. You have acquired an LT, Apostle Selection, LV, 1, and GT, skill. You can select an Apostle by spending 200 Karma points. The Karma requirement for an LT, Apostle Selection and GT, will double every time you select an Apostle. The name of the new skill was an LT, Apostle Selection and GT. It looked like a skill for interacting with characters just by its name. According to the description of and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, I could designate one character as my Apostle. Apostle. It usually means someone who acts on behalf of God's will. 
then, if I made Yetinia my apostle, would I be able to convey my will to her completely? I wanted to test the skill on Yetinia right away. It's a bit annoying that it costs 200 karma points, though. Karma was needed to raise the player's level, but the accumulated karma did not decrease and remained as it was. It did not seem like my level would go down if I used up the accumulated karma points either. It was a resource that had no use anyway, and there was no point in saving it up either. After thinking for a while, I decided to try using NLT, Apostle Selection and GT, skill anyway. Click. I clicked on the skill icon of NLT, Apostle Selection and GT, and a target marker appeared that allowed me to select a target. I overlapped the target marker on Utenia's head and used the skill. Do you want to select, Utenia Hyrest, as your apostle? You need 200 karma points to select an apostle. Yes slash no when I used the skill, a message popped up asking me if I wanted to register Utenia as my apostle. My answer was obviously, yes. I clicked, yes, on the new window, and the screen flickered for a moment as Yatinia looked up at the sky. A large question mark was floating above her head as she looked at the sky. You have selected, Yatinia High Lost, as your apostle. You have spent 200 karma points to create a new divine tool for your apostle. Divine tool, Grimoire, has been bound to, Yatinia High Rest. First apostle, Yatinia High Lost, has become your apostle. Due to the effect of and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, you will share your mana with the selected apostles. Due to the effect of and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, you will be able to send separate messages to the selected apostles. Several messages appeared one after another as the skill was used. The contents of the messages were all unfamiliar to me. I used karma points. I created a new divine tool. Most of the messages were about that. As the parade of new messages passed by, the last one was an explanation of the additional effects of NLT, Apostle Selection and GT, skill. I would share my mana with the character who became my apostle, and I would be able to send messages to them. As if to prove that, a small chat icon appeared above Yatinia's head. Does this mean I can talk to her if I press this? The chat icon only appeared above Yatinia's head, who became my apostle. I could easily guess that I needed to use this button to talk to my apostle. It was amazing that I could communicate with an AI character who was only observable before. The more I thought about it, the more I felt curious. I clicked on the chat icon above her head to talk to Utenia. Beep. And a warning message popped up on my screen when I clicked on the chat icon. You need a divine tool as a medium. It said that I lacked a divine tool as a medium. If I scrolled up, I could see a message saying that I had created a new divine tool. And below that, there was another message saying that the divine tool was bound to her. I couldn't help but scratch my chin as I saw the message about needing a divine tool. Could it be in the inventory? There was one place that I could think of. If I had acquired a new item by using the skill, the item would probably be in the inventory. I opened the inventory with a slight hope and checked it out. Sure enough, there was an item that I had acquired in the inventory. The name of the item in the inventory was, Divine Tool, Grimoire. It was an item that gave the wearer a trait called NLT, Shadow Touch and GT. True to its name, it's really unfriendly. No matter how I thought about it, this game was very unfriendly. It was so unfriendly that it would probably rank in the top 10 of unfriendly games. I gave a bitter laugh and dragged, Divine Tool, Grimoire, in front of Utenia. Thud. The newly made item fell at Yatinia's feet. A dark cave with human warmth left behind. There, Yatinia sighed and tore off a piece of baguette. Her worried eyes looked at the magic book lying at the entrance of the cave. After Cloud's investigator fell, Yatinia had one thing to worry about. She had been surviving thanks to the kindness of the great being who cherished her. But she couldn't rely on the help of a transcendent being forever. Sigh. This magic won't be much help to you. She looked at the magic book in her hand as she sighed. A magic book containing barrier magic. It was something that the great being who watched over her had given her. She didn't know his name. She hadn't even seen his face. Yet she could easily guess that he wanted her to learn this magic. And his action did help her. The day Cloud's investigator came looking for her. 
he pointed his sword at her without any reason, and barrier magic protected her from his attack. If she hadn't learned barrier magic, she would have surely lost her life to his attack. What can I do to help you? Eutenia's eyes, lost in thought, looked at the sky outside the cave. She had lost her family and her neighbors. Now she had only one thing left. If she lost that last thing too, she wouldn't have the confidence to live on anymore. For Eutenia, who had lost everything, the existence of the great being who watched over her was special. Even if he was a devil, she had no way out of his shadow now. Of course, she didn't think that he was a devil who had been taking care of her so far. Eutenia Hyrest. Accept your fate. As if answering her wish, a voice reached Eutenia's ears as she looked at the sky. Her heart started beating wildly at the voice that came to her. She wanted to see his face. She wanted to hear his voice. She had thought such arrogant things hundreds of times before. Yet she couldn't hear his voice until now. This moment was very touching for Eutenia. Ah. You were watching over me after all. Eutenia's body was wrapped in light as she spoke with emotion. A warm white glow that enveloped her whole body. Eutenia felt like she was embraced by someone in the bright light. From within the dazzling light, another voice came to her ears. Become my apostle. Revere me. Worship me. Offer me. Sing a hymn of life. Apostle. The moment she heard that glorious name, Eutenia felt an overflowing manna in her body. A new connection with a great being was formed. And through that connection, infinite manna flowed into Eutenia's body. First Apostle, Eutenia Hyrest. That was the new name given to her. And LT, 12, Apostle, Eutenia Hyrest, 2, and GT, Eutenia Hyrest, the first Apostle. That was the new name given to her. So that's how it is. I, for you. Eutenia closed her eyes and smiled as she accepted her new destiny. A tremendous amount of magic flowed into Eutenia from the transcendent being. It was incomparable to the tiny amount of magic that an individual could possess. An overwhelming power that surpassed cognition. Eutenia felt awe as she faced it. She felt an immense sense of omnipotence just by receiving this power. Then how great was the being who bestowed this power to her. If I have this power, I can surely be of help to you. Nevertheless, she hoped to be useful for the plan of her lord. That was the only guidepost left for her now. Thud. A book fell in front of Eutenia, who was cherishing her faith in her chest. She looked down at her feet at the sound that came from right in front of her. A book. Eutenia picked up the book with a black cover that was placed in front of her. The book in Eutenia's hand was tied with a thin chain along with a fancy decoration. The book was surprisingly light despite its thick appearance. Clank. Eutenia unlocked the chain and turned the cover. The first page revealed unfamiliar letters that she had never seen before. She couldn't read them, but she could understand them. The book that Eutenia had contained contradictory contents. Grimoire. Is this the name of this book? Mystery, Grimoire. It was a book that contained the will of the great being she served. Eutenia realized the true name of this book and at the same time, she sensed that this was an item made for her. The size. The touch. The texture when it touched her hand. All of them were for Eutenia. Even the ability inside it. Shadow touch. You have such an ability. If one was the true owner, they would recognize its value by touching it. Eutenia, who held the grimoire, was no exception. Eutenia stroked the grimoire and drew out the power that was sleeping inside it. Shadow touch. The ability of the grimoire to convert the poured magic into physical force was activated. Numerous hands stretched out from her shadow and began to tear apart everything around them. Crack. One of the trees nearby snapped in half in an instant. Bang. The place where the shadow's touch passed was torn apart. Every time Eutenia lowered her hand toward the air, the hands that stretched out from her shadow exerted physical force. The terrain changed according to Eutenia's command. The enormous power that she merely borrowed made this possible for her. Eutenia's eyes sparkled with intoxication from the overwhelming power. Ah, uh, really? It was truly a beautiful grace. She thought so as a voice rang in her ears again. A majestic voice that echoed heavily in her ears. 
It was the same voice that had called her to be an apostle just before. Apostle. Offer a sacrifice. A sacrifice. Eutenia looked up at the sky again at the voice calling her. A sacrifice. The only thing she had now was her flesh that barely survived on baguettes. There was nothing valuable enough to offer as a sacrifice for Eutenia, who was stuck in the mountains. As she looked at the sky with curiosity, another message flowed into her ears this time. I will take back the magic I gave you before. Oh. You want me to return the magic book? Offer a sacrifice. Give me a proof of your oath. Nodding she nodded and put down the grimoire on the ground. Then she reached out for the magic book nearby. The magic book with barrier magic written on it. It was something she had received from the great being not long ago. I owe you a lot for this. Eutenia's hand brushed over the cover of the magic book. It was just something she had borrowed from her lord. She had to return it to him someday. As she tried to return the magic book, Eutenia's gaze turned to the grimoire. She faced another problem as she tried to return it. How do I offer this as a sacrifice? She knew what offering meant. But she didn't know how to perform a sacrificial ritual for her lord. The one who helped her with this curiosity was the grimoire given to her. A hand rose from Eutenia's shadow and grabbed the grimoire, then turned a page and opened it. What was spread out in front of her was the content of the sacrificial ritual. The necessary preparations and the suitable place. And the spell needed for the ritual. Eutenia's eyes scanned the content of the grimoire in front of her. This is really a helpful item. It gave her great power when she needed it. It gave her knowledge when she needed it. It was truly an item worthy of an apostle who followed the great being. Eutenia skimmed through the content of the grimoire and got up from her seat. Then she moved the hands of her shadow to draw a picture on the ground. Life. Build a staircase. The ground was torn apart and various geometric patterns were drawn on the ground. Circle. Triangle. Circle. Square. Around the shapes drawn in sequence, there were letters that could not be read by mouth. They were words of endless praise for the great Lord. They were the only connection for those who longed for the unreachable sky. One path leads to glory. Eutenia placed the magic book in the middle of the shapes drawn on the ground. The magic book that was placed as a sacrifice absorbed light. Eutenia continued to mutter spells as she placed the magic book. The altar and the sacrifice. And the spell. Only when they became one, the sacrificial ritual was completed. One path leads to death. Thump. Thump. Eutenia stepped back after placing the sacrifice. The grimoire that was floating around her also retreated. A powerful magic swept over the huge altar where Eutenia and the grimoire were. Revere. Adore. Sacrifice. Sing the hymn of life. When Eutenia's spell ended. The light that rose from the center of the altar subsided. The magic book that she had placed in the middle of the altar also disappeared completely. Eutenia scanned the altar where the magic book had disappeared. The magic book that had occupied the place was really offered to the god, as if it had vanished without a trace. Is this what sacrifice means? She gave something to the great being with her own hands. Even though it wasn't originally hers, it was a strange feeling. Her cheeks flushed as she looked at the altar where the sacrifice was over. She felt a little excited after the sacrifice was over. Eutenia smiled and hugged the grimoire to her chest. I feel good. Holy land, Crossbridge. This place, which was overflowing with all kinds of pilgrims every day, was full of priests who served six temples. The priests of Crossbridge recognized the existence of other gods, but they did not acknowledge their worship. Serving any god other than the six gods was heresy to them. Other than the great six gods, there were only evil gods and false gods. That was the only way and truth allowed for the priests of Crossbridge. And moving to investigate those who denied that simple truth were the elite forces of the Holy Land, called heresy inquisitors. A letter from Hus. Evan Alamir. He was a heresy inquisitor who muttered as he looked at the letter sent to him. The sender of the letter was Hus Alamir of the Empire. Evan's brother and at the same time a second-class investigator of Cloud. Evan tore open the seal and began to check the contents of the letter he received from his brother. 
Hmm. The content he received from his brother was not a simple greeting or something like that. The disappearance of an investigator who was chasing an evil god's existence. The villagers who suddenly hid their faces. Evan's face hardened as his eyes went down to the letter. When his gaze reached the last line of the letter. Evan had no choice but to sigh as he put down the letter. An evil god. You're thinking dangerously. Evil god. Among other gods than the six gods, it was a term that referred to those who deceived people and caused chaos. The acts of evil gods were mostly harmful to humans. Indiscriminate destruction. Human sacrifice. Sorcery that made people into sacrifices. None of them fit with order and justice. Yet they couldn't be easily stopped because they were inherently beyond human beings. There's no hero yet. Where there is darkness, there is light. The existence of evil gods that threatened the peace of the continent inevitably brought forth the emergence of heroes. But no temple had received a divine providence for the appearance of a hero yet. Either the existence of evil gods itself was false, or it wasn't at a level that threatened the continent. Any decent heresy inquisitor would have sneered and passed by this content. Evan would have ignored the content of the letter if it wasn't for Huss who sent it. But I guess I should go and see for myself. There's a possibility that it's heresy. But he couldn't ignore a letter from his brother so easily. The fact that Huss asked him for help meant that something needed help had happened. Evan opened a drawer and took out a sheet of paper. He then began to write down his documents for going out diligently. It was preparation to go to his brother in the Empire. And LT, 13, Apostle, Eutenia Hyrist, 3, and GT, the skill that made Eutenia an Apostle, and LT, Apostle Selection and GT. The effect of this skill was more profound than I thought. First of all, it allowed me to create a divine artifact that belonged to the Apostle by consuming karma. I didn't know if the name or shape of the divine artifact was always the same, but it was certain that its effect was extraordinary. The name of the divine artifact that I gave to Eutenia was, Divine Artifact, Grimoire. Divine Artifact, Grimoire, granted its owner a trait called Endelti, Shadow Touch and GT. Eutenia, who used Endelti, Shadow Touch and GT, could exert physical force within a certain radius by consuming mana. It was a trait that seemed much more effective than any ordinary skill. I didn't know why I didn't get such a high-end trait, though. It doesn't consume much mana either. I don't need to set any limits. The second trait that the Apostle had was direct mana sharing with the player. It meant that I could substitute the mana that Eutenia used with my own mana. I could also set a limit on how much mana I shared with the Apostle. But for now, I didn't think I would have to limit Eutenia's mana usage. The biggest reason was that my mana had increased greatly through leveling up so far. I could now use the Andelt, Lightning and GT, skill recklessly. Thanks to the increased mana, I didn't lack mana much. And the amount of mana that Eutenia used for Andelt, Shadow Touch and GT, was not too burdensome either. Unless I added another Apostle, there was no reason to set a limit on Eutenia's mana sharing for now. And the last one is, of course, this game's crazy communication feature. The last feature added by NLT, Apostle Selection and GT. It was a chat button that enabled conversation with the Apostle. A chat button. Simply put, it was an item that looked like a feature that allowed communication. But this item was also much more profound than it appeared. The message I sent was not delivered as it was. Give me back the barrier. The message I sent to Eutenia just before was only six letters long. Give me back the barrier. It was a simple request to return the barrier spellbook that I had given her. I'm sure I send it like that. But just like the speech bubble that distorted Eutenia's words, this game didn't deliver my message kindly. No, rather, it exaggerated my words to a level close to translation. Apostle. Offer your sacrifice. Sacrifice. It doesn't match my message by even one letter. Wherein this is my message. But the message didn't care about my complaint and started a conversation with Eutenia on its own. I want to take back the magic I gave you before. Oh, do you want the spell book? Offer your sacrifice. Give me the proof of your oath. The meaning itself was consistent with what I sent. But the tone and atmosphere itself looked like a solemn imitation of a god. Maybe the tone is adjusted to be similar to that of the creator. 
If not, maybe I should at least have some mood. As a result, my intention was accurately conveyed though. Here's the spellbook. Ding. I received the spellbook back from Eutenia and opened my inventory and used it right away. It was a spellbook that I used after a long time since I got it through drawing an item. You have learned an LT, Barrier, LV, Max, and GT. You can now use Barrier Magic by consuming mana. I learned an LT, Barrier and GT, skill by using the Return Spellbook. Of course, since it was a skill that didn't help with hunting, I wouldn't use it much in front of me. At best, it would be something I would use reluctantly when Eutenia was in danger. Well, even then, I wouldn't use it often because Eutenia learned magic too. It was really a long care. I fed and clothed Eutenia while using items for her for several days. She was finally able to communicate with me now. In some sense, it was also time to harvest the reward for taking care of her all this time. Why was this game an idle game? It was an idle game because it was a game where growth was possible with minimal effort. I grew my character so much with my effort, so now it's time to reap the harvest. Now you have to pay for your food. Squeak. I opened the chat button on Eutenia's head and activated the chat window. And I started to write a message to Eutenia. Cap. 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 The message I wrote was simple. Move a little now. Go out and do some activities in the surrounding area. That way, I can drop lightning bolts randomly. She understood what I meant perfectly and smiled happily. Is that so? I can finally be of help to you. If that's the will of the Great One, I'll follow you anytime. Was it because the graphics evolved from before? When I looked at Eutenia quietly, her smiling face felt quite cute. I seemed to have grown fond of the character after raising her for a long time. I grew fond of a character. I felt like my wallet would be in danger for a while. A village in the outskirts of the central region. There, Peter looked up at the sky with a pitchfork in his hand. He was a young man who was born and raised in this village, and followed his parents' path as a farmer. He had dreamed of being a soldier when he was young, but he had given up on that dream by now. Being a soldier was enough for him to play the role of a self-defense force member in the village. The most precious thing to him was this village. He woke up in the morning, worked hard on farming, cooled his sweat with the blowing wind, and smiled at the ears of grain fluttering in the wind. That was the greatest happiness for Peter the farmer. He was a person who naturally suited farming. It's dark today. Maybe it will rain tonight. He finished his work and looked up at the sky, murmuring to himself. Dark clouds were slowly covering the blue sky. It would take some time for it to rain, but he felt like it would rain tonight or tomorrow. Since it might rain, he thought he should prepare as much as possible before it rained. Ha! Huh. As he was about to clean up, he saw someone walking towards him from afar. Thud! Thud! He saw one person approaching the village with small steps. She was wearing a white tunic, holding a large book in her arms. Her ash-gray hair fluttering in the wind was quite alien to Peter. She was not a villager, but a stranger for sure. The girl who held the book in her arms was more beautiful than Emily, who was called the most beautiful girl in the village. No, rather than being beautiful, she looked dignified. Could she be a noble lady who came to visit the village? The girl who was coming to him now had an appearance that made him think so. Hey, what, she's really coming here. As the girl approached him, Peter lightly brushed his bangs. He also dusted off the dirt on his clothes from farming. He couldn't show a dirty appearance in front of a guest anyway. After Peter hurriedly fixed his appearance, the girl who had been walking from afar finally stopped in front of him. Her eyes, which looked like they were out of this world, scanned Peter from top to bottom. The book she held in her arms looked very expensive. She looked at Peter once and opened her mouth. Hello. Ha. Huh. Oh, oh. Yes. Peter answered her with a clumsy tone at her soft voice. He couldn't answer properly because he was flustered. Ugh. He sighed at his pathetic appearance. But she didn't care about that, and stroked the book in her arms and asked him. Are there many people living in this village? People. Oh, there are about forty people living in our village. Forty people. That's a bit disappointing. She nodded her head at Peter's answer and said. 
40 people is disappointing, what does that mean? Peter didn't understand what she meant. But he didn't bother to ask her about it. It bothered him that she came alone, but she was most likely a noble lady who lost her way, right? The book she had alone would be hard to get even if he sold the whole village. There's another question I want to ask you. Is there a place where many people live nearby? A place where many people live? West. There's a city to the west. A city. A city must have a lot of people. Yes, yes. That's right. She seemed satisfied when she heard that there was a city. Peter didn't know why she was satisfied, but he thought it was good that the noble lady liked it. It wouldn't be good to be disliked by a noble anyway. It was a rational choice that Peter made according to his own judgment. Tap. Tap. She gently tapped the book with her slender fingertips and opened her mouth again to Peter. You're very kind. Can you tell me your name? My name is Peter. Then Peter, can you call the villagers for me? Ha! Huh. Peter tilted his head at her request to gather the villagers. It was fine to answer her questions, but why did she ask him to gather the villagers? His question was only for a moment. He turned his head at the strange sound coming from behind his shoulder. Snap! The pitchfork in Peter's hand was broken in half. And the rest of the broken pitchfork was held by a hand that stretched out from the girl's shadow. Peter's eyes widened in horror and looked at the girl. The Great One wants me to make a decision. She still smiled and looked at Peter. Her hand stroked the cover of the book again. Seeing that, Peter realized that something was terribly wrong. What he saw in front of him was not a lost noble girl. And LT, 14, Apostle, Euthenia Hyrosti, 4, and GT, it had been two hours since the girl of unknown origin entered the village. And Peter, who had been watching her, had his eyes filled with horror. Two hours. It was not enough time for a single person to destroy a whole village. Yet the girl who came to the village alone made it possible. The reason was simple. She was a monster who had transcended the category of human. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Blood. The thick smell of blood tickled Peter's nose. He covered his mouth with his hand as the smell of blood pierced his nose. He felt a headache from the screams that reached his ears. The village that Peter saw was the opposite of what it had been before, full of peace. Thud. Splash. Thin raindrops began to wet the ground filled with screams. But there was no sign of the human screams fading away. Too many lives had been lost in this place. It looks like it's almost over. You don't have to worry too much. The girl said with a casual look as she looked at Peter. The thick book that she was holding was wide open, caught by the shadows. The people who ran away to survive were also dragged back to the center of the village by the shadow's hands. The village that Peter saw was hell. Hell on earth. A place where no one was allowed to survive, a place that should not exist. Why, why are you doing this? Peter, who had been looking around, asked with a trembling voice. The line between life and death was decided in an instant. It was just a difference in answer. Peter agreed with the girl's words without knowing anything, and the rest refused without accepting them. And hell unfolded. It was all incomprehensible to Peter. The girl coming to the village, and the village becoming like this, everything. The girl answered with a smile that looked purer than anyone else in the world when she heard Peter's question. Because the Great One wishes for it. What? To take back what one has created with one's own hands. What's wrong with that process? To take back what one has created with one's own hands. It was a crazy idea that would make anyone lose their mind. She treated people's lives lightly for such a reason alone. Peter could not understand that. The God he thought of was not such a being. He did not even want to believe that such a being was the God who created him. Peter pointed at the girl in front of him with his finger and shouted. CR, crazy. You're crazy. Do you think so? But if it's for him alone, maybe it's not so bad to be crazy. Clack. Clack. The girl's footsteps headed toward the center of the village. There were all kinds of words and pictures made by the shadow's hands decorating there. He could not read them. He could not even understand them. Yet it seemed certain that the girl in front of him was trying to do something. 
something insane that no sane human would ever attempt. The girl stood in front of the altar made of pictures and raised her hand. Crash. The pages of the thick book turned, and red letters rose above the open page. The girl gently touched the bookshelf with her fingertips and took a breath. Who? A soft breath and a sweet voice. What came out of the girl's mouth was a ritual spell for a transcendent being. Life. Build a staircase. A beautiful voice echoed like reciting a poem. But its content was the opposite of that. It disregarded the value of life that looked up at the sky, and forced a meaningless death for the sake of a great being. Yet it only praised the God who judged them endlessly. One way leads to glory. One way leads to death. The girl's footsteps circled around the altar of death where no glory could be seen. Every time she took a step forward, the piled up lives were wrapped in holy light. The girl in front of him was a being beyond human. And what she prayed for was a being who was even more distant than that, sitting in a faraway place. Peter felt coldness in his body as he looked at the altar made by the girl. Revere. Adore. Sacrifice. He shivered. His flesh felt cold from watching the ritual. But he could not take his eyes off from the altar full of malice. A short but meaningful prayer was about to end. The girl returned to her original place to finish it. And the last prayer flowed out of her mouth. Sing the hymn of life. The moment the ritual ended with the girl's prayer. Peter saw a huge eye in the sky covered with dark clouds. The eye of something incomprehensible and unfathomable. The giant eye looked at Peter, and the girl in front of him, and finally at the altar where the offerings were placed. And then a strong light flashed. When the light that had taken over Peter's sight faded away, there was nothing left in the middle of the altar. Not even a trace that a person had existed there. The sacrifice was over. Ah! An exclamation came out of Peter's mouth involuntarily. The other was a being of a different level from a mere human. There was no point in resisting, and his fate was decided by just facing him. It did not matter much whether he had seen the spectacle or not. Anyone would feel awe at the sight of such a being. Peter stared blankly at the altar where the villagers had disappeared, and the girl who had finished the ritual came to him with the book in her arms. How do you feel about seeing the eye of the Great One? She still had a smile that looked innocent. Peter clenched his fist as he faced the girl. He realized that he was not sane anymore after watching the ritual. He was soaked in fear. He was trembling from facing a being that he was not even allowed to see, let alone glimpse its trace. What? What? You, you, what are you? Peter, who was sweating coldly, asked for her identity. The girl's eyes were filled with interest when she heard Peter's question. Talk. Talk. She tapped the cover of the book she was holding and opened her mouth. Hmm, are you asking about this? Yes. A question about her identity. The girl's answer was simple. Apostle, Euthenia Hyrosti. A hand of shadow stretched out from the darkness and stopped in front of Peter. Thud. The dark fingers pressed down on Peter's forehead. But the shadow's touch did not completely crush Peter. The hand that had played a cruel prank returned to Euthenia's shadow. I am the first servant who serves the Great One. What? Why are there so many coming in? The smartphone screen that showed Euthenia's appearance. I had been watching her conversation from the moment she entered the village until now. Even when Euthenia started hunting characters, I thought she was just doing automatic hunting for me instead of me. But I couldn't help but be surprised when I saw the message that popped up right after the sacrifice ended. I received a huge amount of karma from the sacrifice that Euthenia performed. Apostle, Euthenia Hyrosti, has performed a sacrifice for you. The offerings dedicated to you, 43 the effect of indelti, karma's blessing, sacrifice and gt, is activated. Karma increased by 86 according to the number of sacrificed offerings. The number of characters that Euthenia sacrificed for me was 43. I heard the number of villagers from Peter, and it was also written in the system message, so there was no doubt. But the amount of karma I gained was a whopping 86. Even if I compared it to the karma I got when I hunted by myself, it was twice as much. Hunting the same number of characters gave me twice as much karma. It was an absurd rate that anyone could see. 
Does hunting by character give twice as much? Wow. I got twice as much experience as I moved when Euthenia sacrificed an offering. It was either because of the effect attached to and LT, Karma's blessing and GT, or because Euthenia was my apostle. I don't know yet. But one thing for sure was that it was definitely more efficient than me hunting by myself. If I keep collecting karma and increasing the number of apostles, the speed of leveling up will increase accordingly. Maybe depending on the case, even characters who are not apostles can be sacrificed. I was drawing a hopeful training plan in my head, and Euthenia looked at the sky and said after finishing the ritual. I tried my best in my own way, but I don't know if you liked it. Did you like the experience? That was a foolish question. Who wouldn't be happy to get twice as much experience? Euthenia was a precious partner for me right now. I took out a baguette from my inventory and threw it to Euthenia. Good job. Euthenia. You're the character I chose. It was only natural to reward her for sacrificing an offering. The baguette I gave to Euthenia was an expression of gratitude. Euthenia bowed her head and bit into the bread. She still seemed to like bread well enough. But I couldn't end it with such a reward for a character who gave me 86 karma points. I thought of stroking Euthenia's head and brought my finger close to the screen. Swoosh! As my finger brushed over her head, a scream came out of the speech bubble from Euthenia. Eek! Thud! Euthenia fell to the ground after receiving my stroke. Apparently, my touch hurt more than I thought. I felt embarrassed watching her, so I quickly turned off my smartphone screen. I felt like hiding somewhere for a while. And LT, 15, Black Magician, 1, and GT, Cloud. The Branch of Centurion. Hus Alamir, a second-class investigator of Cloud, looked at the man in front of him with a complicated expression. The name of the man opposite him was Evan Alamir. He was a heretic interrogator from the only holy land on the continent, Crossbridge, and he was also Hus's brother. Evan, who faced Hus, observed his younger brother while savoring the tea in front of him. Hus opened his mouth first, feeling uncomfortable with Evan's gaze that kept looking at him. Brother, you didn't have to come here in person. Hus had sent a letter asking for help, but it was only a request for advice. He thought that even if he got more help, at best one of Evan's subordinates would come down. But Hus's expectation was shattered and Evan himself came here from the Holy Land. He even used his vacation to meet him. It was a very burdensome thing for Hus, who faced Evan. Evan looked at Hus like that and said with an expression as if nothing had happened. I thought it would be nice to make time to meet my brother after a long time. I see. It would be very reassuring if you helped me personally. Of course, it was only burdensome for Hus, but the heretic interrogator of Crossbridge was a very reliable existence. Heretic interrogator. They were close to elites even in the Holy Land. They moved in small numbers to collect information on heretics, and sometimes they executed them on the spot. As they performed their missions with a small number of people, the power of the heretic interrogators was all strong. Hus, who had learned magic in his own way, had no confidence in holding out against Evan for long. By the way, nothing has changed. Are you still staying as a second-class investigator in this backwater? Brother, that's... Hus. I believe you wouldn't say that you like this rural area. Nevertheless, Hus was awkward with Evan because he had often encountered Evan's personality. The Centurion region was located on the outskirts of the Empire. It was a place that suited the word rural. Staying in the Centurion branch like this was also a very dissatisfying thing for Hus himself. But Hus himself was stuck here even after the friction with the branch chief. Due to various complicated problems, promotion did not seem easy for the time being. It was not pleasant to show his appearance to his brother Evan as it was. I think I'll go up when the time comes. Hus. Yes, brother. You are a member of the proud Alamir family. Don't forget that it is our duty to raise the name of the family. Hus felt his lost eye twitching as he heard Evan's words. Alamir family. He had lived not to tarnish the name of the family until now. He worked hard to catch up with Evan's back that always went ahead. But no matter how hard he ran forward, he couldn't see any signs of catching up with Evan's back. And now he had to listen to his brother's shameful scolding. Who? A sigh flowed out of Hus's mouth as he faced Evan. It's all my fault. Is that so? 
Please stop telling me embarrassing stories and let's talk about work now. The scent of tea leaves spread softly from the teapot on the middle of the table. Evan moistened his lips with the teacup he held and savored the scent spreading in his mouth and nodded his head. Tuck. The teacup held by Evan returned to the table. He then smiled and began to get to the point. The reason why Evan came all the way to this remote place. It was about the traces of evil gods found somewhere here. Then let me hear about work. What exactly happened? The residents of four villages nearby disappeared in an instant. That too without any trace. People disappeared. Evan frowned as he heard that. There were many reasons to doubt what Huss thought too. They ran away as a group because they didn't want to pay taxes. Or thieves came and kidnapped them. Rick, a third-class investigator who disappeared before, believed that too until then. It doesn't seem like you're trying to say that they simply ran away or were attacked by bandits. There was no blood or corpse left in the village. It's strange if there was a fight. There were no traces of escape either, so you suspect it's the work of an evil god. Maybe it was because they had already exchanged the contents by letter once. Evan quickly grasped what Huss wanted to say. The residents hid their appearance without a trace. This was not unprecedented in the history of the Empire. At the time when the evil gods appeared and the heroes were active, those who were sacrificed to the evil gods by the wicked magicians did so. Those who were dedicated to God disappeared without leaving any trace. The blood and sweat they shed, even their clothes, disappeared without a trace. As you said, brother, I suspect the existence of the evil god cult now. Is this all you have to say, or? Rick Swale. One of my subordinates also disappeared after going out to find traces of the evil god. Did he disappear without a trace like the others? Yes. Only the horse he rode was left behind. People who disappear without a trace. And an investigator who disappeared while chasing that trace. If these circumstances were gathered, there was enough room for doubt. Huss looked at Evan in front of him and asked to fit the last piece. Do you think there is a possibility, brother? It's definitely suspicious. Then. I'll see for myself and report it to the Holy Land. Let's start by searching around where you suspect first. There is a possibility that the evil god cult is active. As Evan's words of affirmation fell, Huss swallowed his saliva with a heavy feeling. He was the one who drove out his subordinate who talked about the possibility. It was practically no different from Huss himself pushing him to death. And now his death became an opportunity for the heretic interrogator from the Holy Land to move to find traces Rick Swale. Huss sent a short word of regret to his subordinate who had disappeared now. A crossroad in the Centurion region. Eutania sat in the back seat of the carriage that rattled along, holding a book and slowly looking around. Unlike the mountain village where she used to live, there was a road here that was maintained for carriages. It was because there was only one carriage in the village. Considering the story that there was a large city nearby, it seemed to be a crossroad leading to the city. Eutania, who was enjoying the scenery with her head resting on the book, turned her head to the driver's seat and opened her mouth. You're surprisingly good at driving a carriage. I learned a little over my shoulder. The one who sat in the driver's seat and held the reins was Peter. He drove the carriage forward with a dark face, holding the reins tightly. Peter, who survived by Eutania's mercy, had no choice but to drive the carriage to the city. It was because the distance from the village to the city was quite far. In addition to Eutania, there were a lot of foodstuffs piled up in the back seat of the carriage he was driving. Eutania had brought the foodstuffs that had been stockpiled in the village. Every time he saw Eutania and the foodstuffs in the back seat, a heavy burden piled up in Peter's heart. If he wanted to, he wanted to throw everything away and run away right now. Do you resent me? I also had a time when I resented someone. Swoosh. Eutania touched her ash-colored hair while saying that. Her hair, which she touched with her hand, was much damaged unlike before. It had been a long time since she lost her home and ran away from the world. The young lady of the Count who used to act spoiled to her parents had long disappeared beyond the world. Even if she wanted to go back to those days, there was no one left who knew how to go back. The only thing left in this place now was herself, who claimed to be an apostle of God. Why did you, do that? I resented the whole world. Because all the people I loved disappeared. Is that why you want to pay them back? 
Revenge on the hateful world. Peter asked if that was Eutania's thought, but Eutania shook her head firmly. She just stroked the book and told her motive. I don't mean that. It's just that there was someone who reached out to me back then, so I decided to live for him. He 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 he. The conversation was interrupted by Peter pulling on the reins. Peter stopped the carriage and looked at the crossroad where the carriage had been passing by. A cut tree was placed in the middle of the crossroad, blocking the advance of the carriage. And behind the tree that blocked the carriage. There were men of various colors armed there. Damn, are they bandits. They were bandits who blocked the road. The man who drew his sword at the front met Peter's eyes. The bandit leader who met Peter smiled slyly. He licked his sword with his tongue and opened his mouth. I was hungry, but it worked out well. And LT, 16, Black Magician, 2, and GT, I was hungry, so this is perfect. What do you want? Peter shouted at the leader, then glanced at Eutenia. She was Eutenia, who had wiped out a whole village by herself. Peter was curious how Eutenia would deal with the thieves. She just smiled slightly at Peter's look. He had no choice but to face the leader of the thieves again. I want everything. What? Give me everything you have. I'll sell you as slaves, and use the food in the carriage for myself. The leader's attitude was more hardline than they expected. He didn't even offer to let them go if they dropped their belongings. He claimed that the food was theirs, and that they would capture the people and sell them as slaves. Peter sighed at the hopeless exchange. He turned his head completely and looked at Eutenia, who was smiling. Eutenia was still holding a book in her arms with a calm expression. It doesn't look like they're going to let us go. What should we do? Peter asked Eutenia in a troubled voice. There were more than ten thieves blocking the road. Peter couldn't drive them away by himself. It was natural for him to ask for Eutenia's help. Swish. Eutenia stroked the cover of the book with her slender fingers and spoke to Peter. Don't you think it would be nice to talk a little more? They are thieves. Have you ever thought that they might be reformed? If they were like that, they wouldn't be talking about slaves. It was a common sense answer. Eutenia nodded reluctantly as Peter continued to look troubled. She got up from the back of the carriage with the book in her arms. The hem of her tunic fluttered slightly in the mountain breeze. It looks like you're in trouble. I'll help you a little. Eutenia's gaze turned to the thieves who were blocking the road. They were still looking at the carriage with contempt. They had the advantage in numbers. They didn't feel threatened by a naive-looking young man and a girl holding a book. It wasn't a bad judgment in a normal situation. The only problem was that Eutenia, who was in front of them, was far from ordinary. Hello, everyone. Ha ha ha. This time, a pretty lady came out instead of a coward. My name is Eutenia Hyrest. I'm an apostle who serves the Great One. Apostle? What the hell is that? The leader asked with a sour face when he heard the title of Apostle. Apostle of God. It was not a concept that was used in the six temples of Crossbridge. They officially recognized only the Saintess and the Saint King, and did not acknowledge any other apostles below them. The leader of the thieves, who lived on the outskirts, had no idea what an apostle was, since it didn't exist in the six temples that were most popular. Eutenia kindly answered his question. An apostle is someone who serves the great one closest to him. What? You're talking complicatedly, but you're just a cleric. Are you not interested in serving the great one? Eutenia tried to persuade them to join her faith when she faced the thieves. But the thieves just snorted and even made obscene gestures at her. One of the thieves behind the leader shouted at Eutenia with an angry voice. Humph, I've hated those who sell God since I was young. If there was a God, I wouldn't be like this. Is that so? Thud. Thud thud thud. As soon as Eutenia finished speaking, a strange sound echoed from behind the leader. It sounded like something that was locked together was twisted apart. The leader slowly turned his head toward where the sound came from. When his head turned completely, he saw something and screamed. Ah! Boss! What's wrong? Jack is dead. What he saw was his colleague's body twisted in a grotesque direction. He opened his mouth wide and looked at Eutenia at the sight of the horrible tragedy that happened in an instant. 
There was only one person who could be suspected as the culprit in this place. Eutenia was still smiling with a book in her arms, without caring about what happened in front of her eyes. The leader shouted at Eutenia with her calm expression. Did you do this? It's unfortunate. If you had served him, you wouldn't have ended up like this. She's a magician. Kill her now. The leader was the first to act in the ominous situation. He raised his sword and aimed at Eutenia, ordering her to be killed. The most threatening thing in a battle was a magician. So he wanted to eliminate Eutenia first. But even though the leader ordered it, the thieves who were waiting didn't move. He turned his head again and checked behind him. What are you doing? Ah! Bo, boss, help me. Aya! Ah. Hand stretched out from the shadows on the ground and poured out toward the thieves. Someone who was caught by the shadows screamed, and someone who faced the shadows ran away. The result of those who were caught by the shadows was mostly the same. Thud. Thud thud thud. They died with their bodies twisted by the shadow's grip, accompanied by a chilling sound. The leader bit his lip at the flood of shadows that burst out. Damn, crazy. He was not an exception to the attack of the shadows, just because he was the leader of the thieves. The hands that came out of the ground aimed at him and poured out. He swung his sword desperately. Clang. Clang. The jaws that were aiming at him bounced off with a heavy sound. But that wasn't all of the shadows that were after him. He couldn't stop the wave of shadows that kept pouring out. Ugh. Repent of your sins and return to his side. Eutenia's gentle voice rang out. The leader tried to resist by fending off the shadows, but there was a limit to the number of hands he could handle. The hands that started to reach out from beyond the shadows. The leader's hand that was fending off the shadows lost its strength and he dropped the sword he was holding at some point. Thud. The leader's sword rolled on the ground as it lost its power. The shadow's hands that reached out in an instant restrained the leader's arms and legs. Wah, wait. Just wait a minute. The hands from all directions reached out to the leader who was restrained. He shouted at Eutenia in a desperate voice as he saw the hand that was aiming for his head. It was his last attempt to ask her to stop the attack for a moment. Eutenia looked at him with a cold gaze, as he suddenly made a ridiculous claim. What is it? We have a black magician among our comrades who didn't come here. Black magician. If you kill me, he won't leave you alone. The words that came out of his mouth were a threat to Eutenia. It was something that most people wouldn't care about. But Eutenia stopped the shadow's hands that were moving toward him. She wasn't afraid of his threat. She was just interested in one word that came out of his mouth. A magician. That sounds interesting. Black magician. Eutenia recalled all the shadow's hands when she heard that word. The shadow's hands that had filled the air disappeared in an instant. The thieves who were restrained by the shadows became free. Only three of them survived out of more than ten thieves. It was a miserable sight for those who had been so arrogant to Eutenia. Hook, who? The leader breathed roughly as he checked the number of surviving thieves, including himself. Cold sweat ran down his forehead as he felt relieved. The other thieves also felt relieved. They picked up their weapons that had fallen and looked at Eutenia, who was counting the dead thieves. They wondered why Eutenia suddenly let them go. It was just a threat from some thieves who did nothing but steal. The black magician he mentioned was probably not a great magician either. Peter couldn't understand why Eutenia spared them. Why did you do that? I wanted to see the magician. Excuse me. Peter looked at her with a blank expression as he heard her answer. She didn't stop the shadows because she was afraid of the thieves' threat. She stopped the attack because she simply wanted to see the magician. Ever since she received a magic book from her master, Eutenia had been interested in magic. The magic books and theories that the black magician would have and the power of magic that other magicians used. She thought this was a great opportunity to see various kinds of magic. Tap. Tap. Eutenia's footsteps approached the leader who was sitting in the middle of the mountain road. His body flinched every time she got closer to him. When she reached him, Eutenia looked down at him and asked. You said there was a magician, right? Ye, yeah. One of our comrades is a terrible black magician. He even sacrifices people. 
the leader still tried to exaggerate the black magician's power. But those things didn't matter much to Eutenia. She smiled kindly at him with a book in her arms and matched his eye level. Then she asked him in a soft voice. Then will you guide me to him? And LT, 17, Black Mage, 3, and GT, Roan Hebrus. He was a black mage who had reached his mid-forties this year. He realized early on that he had no talent for magic and switched to black magic, but that did not mean he had outstanding achievements in black magic. To succeed in black magic, one needed effort above all. The effort to capture innocent people and use them as sacrifices for magic. That was the nature of black magic. And Roan was not the kind of person who could execute such effort aggressively. He ended up being trapped in mediocre skills, and kept spinning in the same place. He occasionally joined a band of thieves to get prisoners for his sacrifices, but that was the only thing that changed. Roan's own skills were always stuck in the past glory. It would be nice if I could offer all these guys as sacrifices. Roan muttered as he put the prepared ingredients into the boiling cauldron. Roan's eyes were filled with boredom as he looked at the cauldron. He was getting tired of making potions. He knew that without even the minimum research, he would regress, but he wanted to give up what he was doing now. But the thieves who were with him would not let him go. The potions that Roan produced were one of the main sources of income for the band of thieves, along with the slaves. Living a life of being praised was not bad, but sometimes he wanted to escape. That was human nature. TSK TSK. Roan clicked his tongue and dropped a clump of hair cut from the slaves into the cauldron. If I had continued to learn magic, I might have been teaching magic in some rural village. Although his achievements would be less than black magic, being a mage was still a respectable profession. Especially if it was a rural area that seemed to have nothing to do with magic. He might have missed the opportunity to be regarded as a quirky mage in some rural village, and be called a sage. As Roan thought so, he heard a voice ringing outside his tent. It was a familiar voice to Roan's ears. It was none other than the voice of the thief who was guarding his tent. Master. What is it? I told you not to bother me when I'm making potions. Roan said with an annoyed expression as he heard the thief's voice. If any impurities got in, the effect of the potion would go wrong. That's why Roan had told him several times not to bother him when he was making potions. But the thief ignored his voice and flapped the entrance of the tent and rushed in. The thief breathed heavily and looked at Roan. At the same time, a leaf carried by the wind gently landed on top of the cauldron. An impurity got mixed into the potion he was making. Roan frowned as he watched it all. Master. You're here. Didn't I tell you not to come in? You've contaminated the potion. Roan yelled at the thief who came in abruptly. There was an order to everything, no matter how urgent it was. The thief shook his head with a desperate expression, ignoring Roan's scream. Huff. He took a breath and said in a trembling voice to him. It's a big trouble. What kind of trouble is it that you did this? Did the band of thieves get wiped out or something? The boss has been taken hostage. Wah, what? Roan opened his mouth wide at the thief's words. It was definitely a big trouble indeed. The leader of the band of thieves had been taken hostage. Where in the world was such an absurd story? Moreover, if someone could take hostage of the thieves, it meant that some kind of expedition force had come. If he was caught by an expedition force, Roan, who was a black mage, would surely be executed. He felt nervous about the situation that was going wrong and asked the thief. How many people came for the expedition? Expedition force, you say? Yes. Expedition force. I didn't see any expedition force, only two people came. Roan looked at the thief with an incomprehensible expression. But the thief's face looked more serious than ever. Two people. Only two people had defeated and captured the band of thieves and taken their leader hostage. That was even more serious than an expedition force coming in. Who are they? Did they look like knights or something? A man wearing shabby clothes and a woman holding a book. A book. It seems like a mage has come. Please defeat the enemy mage with your powerful black magic, master. The more Roan heard from the thief, the more perplexed he became. A mage who had wiped out a band of thieves in an instant. And there were only two of them. Could Roan win against such beings? 
Roan thought not. He had devoted decades to magic, but he was not much stronger than others. The best option was to run away if possible. A mage. We don't have time. Master. Master, use your strong black magic to punish the enemy. No, I. Master. Hurry. But he had no courage to run away, leaving behind the thief who looked at him with a fervent expression. A mage's assets were his magic books and research materials. Even if he was a black mage, his essence did not change. If he left everything here and ran away, everything that Roan had built up for decades would be gone. Who? Roan sighed and passed by the thief. As he walked out of the tent, he saw the leader who was being held hostage as he had been told. Oh, Roan. Save me. The leader called out Roan's name and asked for his salvation as soon as he faced him. Roan looked at the leader who was captured, and the unwelcome guest standing behind him. A young man with a naive impression. And behind him, a girl holding a thick book. A deep magic was swirling from the book that the girl was holding. It was a priceless treasure that he could guess its value just by looking at it. Are you the mage who lives here? Roan and the girl's eyes met in the air. The girl asked Roan about his identity with an innocent expression. But Roan was not swayed by the girl's innocent expression. The person in front of him was a mage. And not just any mage, but a mage with a tremendous power that he could not even guess. He could not take her lightly. Yes. I am Roan Hebrus, the black mage. And who are you? My identity, you say? Isn't it fair to answer one question if you asked one? I guess so. Then tell me who you are. Gulp. Roan swallowed his saliva and watched the opponent's movements with a wary eye. At Roan's request, Eutenia walked forward with light steps. Eutenia stopped right next to the leader who was tied up. She stopped at a slight distance from Roan and opened her mouth in a gentle voice. I am Eutenia Hyrist, an apostle of the Great One. An apostle who serves him. Apostle. Was it a strange story for you? No. I feel like I understand a little bit now. An apostle of God. He did not know exactly what kind of God he was, but he knew that facing an apostle of God was not a good thing. A person who walks the path of black magic must understand all kinds of rituals. Offering to an evil god was no exception. He offered sacrifices and received power worthy of them. That was the basic content of black magic. Seeing Eutenia, who called herself an apostle, Roan realized that he had to make a quick decision. I see. I'm glad it helped. This is all I have to do. You're going to use magic, aren't you? Crackle. Sparks flew from Roan's hand as he pulled up his magic. He made an arrow of lightning and shot it at the target. The arrow flew like a ray of light and collided with the target in an instant. Lightning arrow. Crack. The arrow that Roan threw pierced through the leader of the band of thieves who was next to Eutenia. The leader's body flashed and he started to foam at the mouth and convulse. Roan attacked not Eutenia but the leader of the band of thieves. The leader who was hit by the unexpected attack screamed and fainted. Eutenia watched him and stroked the cover of her book. She said to Roan, that's interesting. I knew it from the moment I saw you. Is that so? Please take me as your disciple. Plop. Roan knelt down and buried his head on the ground. This was the only conclusion he could make. The enormous aura that moved from behind Eutenia in the shadows. Roan knew from the moment he faced it that he could not beat her. He had no outstanding talent for magic, but he had a natural eye for judging the level of others. She was an apostle of an evil god. She was connected to the being she served by some kind of bond, and used a near-infinite amount of magic. She was literally an ideal being that mages dreamed of. How dare he fight against such a being? It was no different from a foolish moth jumping into a fire. Eutenia tilted her head at Roan's request. That's too bad. I can't take you as a disciple. Yes. I recruit believers, but I don't accept disciples. Then please take me as a believer. I will serve the Great One. Eutenia smiled at Roan's repeated bowing. A hand stretched out from the shadows and stroked Roan's head, who was lying down. Shall we? I'm sure he will be pleased. And LT, 18, 
Black Mage, 4, and GT, Revere. Worship. Offer. In the hideout of the fallen thieves. There, Eutenia performed the ritual of offering. She drew complex patterns on the floor to make an altar, and gathered the ones who would be sacrificed in the center of it. Around the altar, she wrote praises for the god in abundance. Roan, who saw a proper ritual for the first time in his life, watched it with interest from beginning to end. It was not an easy opportunity to witness a complete ritual of offering to the god. Even from Roan's perspective, who had lived as a black mage for decades, this ritual was something he encountered for the first time. Sing the hymn of life. As Eutenia's last prayer declared the end of the ritual, the sacrifices on the altar disappeared with a white light. Roan, who was watching the ritual, clapped his hands without realizing it. The great being revealed his grace and accepted the offerings that were dedicated to him. It was an amazing sight that Roan faced for the first time in his life. What miracle in the world could be more surprising than this? It was only natural for Roan to utter admiration from his mouth. That was amazing, Apostle. I'm a little embarrassed to receive applause. Not at all. Just by witnessing this ritual, I feel full of thoughts that the Great One is watching over me. Is that so? Of course. Peter, who also watched Eutenia's ritual for the second time, had a trembling expression as well. He glimpsed something that humans could not reach. It was not something that he could get used to even after seeing it several times. However, he looked uncomfortable towards Roan, who praised Eutenia's ritual. A black mage and an ordinary village youth. There was an insurmountable difference in perception between them. No matter how much time passed, Peter would never understand a black mage. Now that the ritual is over, I want to take a look at your laboratory. Eutenia hugged her book and looked around with a smile after finishing the ritual. The number of people reflected in Eutenia's eyes was only six left. Four of the surviving thieves followed Roan and converted. They seemed to have surrendered to survive at first, but their eyes changed after the ritual. If they received more education from Roan, they might become devout believers. Of course, Roan, who would teach them, was showing more enthusiasm than anyone else in this place. Then shall we go and take a look? Is that okay? Of course. If it's you, Apostle, you can do anything. Roan, who used to be angry when thieves came in, was now more actively guiding Eutenia than anyone else. If he had a tail, he might have wagged it vigorously. Thump. Thump. Eutenia followed Roan's footsteps towards the tent with a relaxed pace. Peter also followed Eutenia to the tent. When they entered the tent on one side of the hideout, there was Roan's laboratory filled with all kinds of magical tools. Is this your laboratory? It's not much but these are what I've collected over my lifetime. There are interesting-looking cauldrons and glowing stones. Oh, that thing is a luminescent stone. If a mage charges it once, it can be used for about ten hours. Eutenia's eyes filled with curiosity scanned the inside of the tent slowly. There were all kinds of magical items in Roan's tent. A large cauldron placed in a corner. Various animals preserved by magic. Roan's research records written in neat handwriting. And a few magic books on one corner of the bookshelf. It looked shabby but it was full of valuable items for an inexperienced mage. Magical items were expensive things even if you tried to get them in the city. There are magic books here too. A hand stretched out from Eutenia's shadow picked up a book on the corner of the bookshelf. Roan flinched at the hand that met his shadow. Eutenia ignored Roan's reaction and turned the pages of the magic book she took out of the bookshelf. Flip. Her calm eyes began to scan the contents of the magic book. The name of the magic described in the magic book was, Lightning Arrow. It was a magic that shaped lightning into arrows and shot them at enemies. It was also the magic that Roan used against the boss when he first met Eutenia. The image of lightning that he had encountered once flashed through Eutenia's mind as she opened the magic book. As Eutenia began to read the magic book, Roan opened his mouth. Oh, that magic is. Is it a magic called Lightning Arrow? Yes. That's right. It's interesting. He might like it too. The Lightning Arrow in Eutenia's hand was a low-level magic. Nevertheless, Eutenia felt a lot of possibilities from the magic book in her hand. 
The magic that her master used was different from the ordinary magic in terms of scale. It was much harder to make complex magic bigger. The precision of the formula required by the caster changed depending on the scale of the magic. That's why high-level magic that applied effects to a wide range of areas required more complex and diverse changes. But Eutenia realized that she didn't need such things. Complex formulas were nothing but struggles to increase the range and reduce the consumption of mana. Eutenia Hyrest. She was an anomalous being who received mana from the god like the sea. Mana efficiency was something that Eutenia didn't need to value. Eutenia's eyes sparkled as she read the magic book. Does he, have an interest in magic too? I learned magic because it was his will. I see. Can you give me some space for a moment? I feel like reading when I see the book. A hand moved from Eutenia's shadow brought a chair to her. Eutenia sat on the chair that the shadow brought and began to turn the pages calmly. Roan, who declared that he would occupy the tent, looked at Peter with a questioning look. But Peter just nodded his head at his gaze. The two of them eventually left the tent with awkward expressions. Inside the tent, Eutenia's time alone began. There are moments in life when you have to deal with sudden and urgent problems. For me, yesterday was one of those moments. I had no time to even play the game because of the sudden rush of schedule. Considering that I had logged into the game almost every day since I started it, it was quite an unusual thing. Ugh. I grabbed my dull head and lifted my upper body, and the sunlight coming through the window met me. Ten in the morning. Or maybe eleven. The sun was already close to the zenith. I picked up the water cup that I had left on the bedside table and moistened my throat. Gulp. Gulp. The lukewarm water that had cooled down went down my esophagus. My dry throat felt relieved. Ha! I feel alive now. I still felt a bit sluggish, but I felt like I had regained some consciousness. I reached out and picked up the smartphone that was on my bedside. It was to check if there were any messages last night. As I operated the smartphone and checked the message window, the icon of the game that was on the main screen caught my eye. Come to think of it, I couldn't play the game yesterday. I didn't know what happened in the game while I was offline. It wasn't a passive game since Eutenia started moving. I clicked on the game icon and launched the game for the first time in a while as a mobile game. I wondered if anything happened last night. Lately, I left Eutenia alone and hunted on the opposite side of her route. I was curious what Eutenia had done in the meantime. I scrolled down and looked at the logs that came up during the day. Was there a lot of things that Eutenia did last night? Today's message log was longer than I expected. The first thing that came up was the message of offering sacrifices. It seemed that Eutenia had offered more sacrifices. Was it because she had the NLT, fanatic and GT, trait? She was very active in offering sacrifices. Looking at this, I thought I had picked a good character. Huh. What's this? And below that, there was an unexpected message. I received a new magic book from Eutenia as an offering. The name of the item I checked by opening the inventory was Endelti, Magic Book, Lightning Arrow and GT. Judging from the fact that I didn't remember getting a magic book from a draw, it was sure that it was an item offered by Eutenia. You can also get a new magic book from an offering by an apostle. It was an unexpected thing for me. You can get magic without drawing. You can get a magic book without a 10 draw. My evaluation of this game changed a bit when I learned that fact. It might not be such a pay to win game after all. Of course, considering that I only got a magic book now, the probability itself didn't seem very high. Squeeze. I clicked on the inventory and clicked on the magic book. It was to learn a new magic by using the magic book. You acquired an LT, Lightning Arrow, LV, Max, and GT. You can now use Lightning Arrow magic by consuming mana. The name of the new magic was Endelti, Lightning Arrow and GT. Similar to Endelti, Lightning and GT, magic that I used before, it was a magic that shot lightning at targets. It was natural to test it when you got a new magic. I threw magic at a nearby village to test it out. Kwa on. A heavy streak of lightning struck down on the village, causing damage to a wide range of areas. It looked more like a javelin than an arrow. Wow. Crackle. Crackle. Tiny sparks flew around where the magic hit directly. 
the damage that NLT, Lightning Arrow and GT, inflicted on enemies was 30. It was twice as much as NLT, Lightning and GT. NLT, 19, Black Mage, 5, and GT, you used NLT, Lightning Arrow and GT. Along with the message announcing the skill's use, the characters within the skill's range were stunned. It was a skill that dealt 30 damage and had a stun effect. While it took three uses of NLT, Lightning and GT, to knock down a character, NLT, Lightning Arrow and GT, was enough with just two. Moreover, NLT, Lightning Arrow and GT, was a skill that inflicted damage on a wide area. It could clear out the characters faster than the NLT, Lightning and GT, skill. I couldn't help but marvel at the power of the magic book I received from Utania. Why is this AoE skill so strong? The damage and the range were completely superior to NLT, Lightning and GT. Of course, it consumed more mana than the skill I used before, but even considering that, it was an incredible performance. It was a skill that wouldn't be strange to get from a 10 pull. And I got this amazing skill for free. It was a moment of gratitude for Utania, who brought me an unexpected harvest. Ah, this is why I enjoy raising my character. Baguette. Sponge cake. Hard rye bread. I fed Utania various kinds of breads that I got from the store and raised her. It was not long ago that she did that. And she didn't forget the favor she received from me and brought me a magic book. They say it's a doggy at dog world. Even Utania, who demanded things like she left behind a 70001 bread, didn't forget the kindness she received from her master. I felt like giving her a gift as I watched her admirable appearance. First, I have to deal with these guys and then think about it. Of course, I had to finish off the characters left in the village first. I kept using NLT, Lightning Arrow and GT, repeatedly. Bang! Kwang! Kwang! The vibrations that burst out of my smartphone one after another conveyed the atmosphere of the fierce battlefield. Every time I threw a spear of lightning, the characters piled up in the village fell down. It was an optimal skill for hunting the crowded characters. You used NLT, Lightning Arrow and GT. You used NLT, Lightning Arrow and GT. Your karma increased by 7 you used NLT, Lightning Arrow and GT. Your karma increased by 5. Many messages popped up and countless characters were converted into karma. Crackle. Fizzle. The electric shocks left on the ground also inflicted continuous damage on the nearby characters. It wasn't enough to completely finish off the opponents, but it was still a merit to be able to deal dot damage. How many more times did I throw and ulti, lightning arrow and GT? I realized that there were no more characters left in the village and finally lifted my finger from the skill button. Phew. It's hot and nice. It was much more efficient than hitting one by one with and LT, lightning and GT. The mana consumption increased by several times, but it was enough to handle one village. I felt like I could enjoy the game comfortably for a while. After finishing a satisfying hunt, I turned the screen and looked for Utania. I wanted to give her something in return for giving me such a wonderful gift. I received a gift. It would be nice to give her something back. I received an unexpected gift from Utania. It was a gift that made me feel good enough to forget about last night's fatigue. It was worth enough money if compared to cash. It would be nice to treat her well since she was a character I liked. I moved the screen and found Utania stuck somewhere in the mountains. She was sitting in a tent, reading a book. This magic is, amazing. The Ashared character calmly turned each page. Looking at the strange looking tools around her, she seemed to be studying magic. I opened my inventory and checked the items to find something that suited her. Nothing suitable in my inventory. Maybe I should try pulling some gotcha. The only items left in my inventory were a few iron swords. But I couldn't just give an iron sword to Utania who was learning magic. The only option left was gotcha. Just recently, my salary came into my bank account. It wouldn't be bad to try some gotcha for a change, so I touched the shop button on the top right corner of the screen. The NLT, paid currency shop and GT, is currently under maintenance. Maybe you're used to being petted by now. And then I quickly turned my finger around and touched Utania's head. If I couldn't pull any gotcha, the only thing I could give her was a pet. Swoosh. 
my swift touch brushed past Eutania's head. She lifted her head and looked up at the sky. Thud. Eutania fell to the ground after being petted. Unfortunately, she still hadn't adapted to being petted. I looked at the fallen Eutania for a moment, and then threw my smartphone on the bed after turning off the screen. I wasn't feeling fresh in the morning. Maybe I should go to the bathroom and take a shower. There are definitely, a lot of suspicious points. Evan Alamir. The heretic inquisitor of the Holy Land, Crossbridge, opened his mouth as he scanned the empty village. The village that came into Evan's sight was very quiet. There were traces of dishes or laundry that people had used, but there was no sign of people anywhere in the village. If they had been attacked, there would have been bloodstains, but all Evan saw were footprints and bizarre paintings. Bizarre paintings. Only a part of the half-erased painting was the only clue that caught Evan's eye in this place. Huss, who was examining the pattern on the floor next to Evan, looked at his brother and asked. Do you know what this painting is, brother? It's a pattern that hasn't been drawn for long. There's probably only one possibility left. There's a pattern that looks like an altar, and ancient letters around it. I think this painting is. An altar for a ritual. Even though Evan trailed off at the end, Huss didn't fail to understand what he meant. There weren't many places that used ancient letters until now. Only the six temples of Crossbridge or the magicians who explored the ancient ruins could handle them. An altar that was shaped geometrically with ancient letters mixed in. It was an altar made by the cultists who worshipped the evil gods for their trade with the evil gods. The Holy Land had a history of fighting and inflicting great damage on the cult of the evil god in the past. It was possible because of the sacrifice of the heroes and the activities of the paladins. Whenever an evil god appeared to disturb the world, a chosen hero would inevitably follow. Since the next hero hadn't appeared yet, it was a common opinion of the Holy Land that there was still time before the evil god's forces moved. But what existed in front of Evan's eyes now was a genuine altar of an evil god. The evil god was already exerting a secret influence on this world. It meant something simple. A hero will appear soon. An evil god, you say? Yes. I'm sure. All our guesses so far were true. I guess so. I found the signs of an evil god sooner than I thought. Hussa's face darkened as he heard Evan's words. It was one thing to vaguely guess the content, and another to accept it as a fact. The appearance of an evil god that threatened the continent. It was a very heavy story for Huss, who sacrificed one of his subordinates to collect evidence. The appearance of an evil god means. A hero will appear soon. The holy land will be busy for a while. When the shadow of an evil god loomed over this world, a hero would inevitably appear. This was an unchanging law that never changed. The gods of the six temples did not tolerate their rules being broken. Even if the order was reversed a little, what had to happen would happen anyway. Especially if the opponent was an evil god who transcended this world. Now that he had found evidence of an evil god, it was time for Evan to report to the Holy Land. Clank. Evan adjusted his sword on his waist and grabbed the reins of his horse that he had tied nearby. Will you come back with me to headquarters? I'm going to bring my subordinates for extermination after reporting to the regional chief. No. Let's hold off for now. Yes. We might provoke them and they might hide somewhere we can't find them. Do you not trust Cloud's power, brother? Cloud was an executive agency responsible for the security of the Empire. Huss sent a dissatisfied look at Evan when he heard an opinion of distrust against Cloud in the territory of the Empire. But Evan shook his head and denied Huss's words. That's not it. I'm saying this could be an opportunity. An opportunity? What do you mean? The enemy hasn't fully grown yet. If we prepare thoroughly, we might be able to exterminate them without much damage. They had succeeded in finding traces of a cult before divine guidance came down. In some sense, it meant that the enemy's forces hadn't taken root properly yet. An evil god's cult that hadn't fully grown yet. If they were lucky, they might be able to cut them off at once. Maybe they could succeed in exterminating the cult as soon as a hero appeared. And for that, they needed thorough preparation. Preparation so thorough that they didn't even consider a second chance. Extermination will involve moving with the Empire's power. You'll also participate in combat when the time comes. Then. 
I'll listen to your advice, brother. That's right. For now, just focus on watching the enemy's movements. This is a request that I can only tell you, my brother. If that's what you want, brother. Evan finished the conversation and got on his horse and grabbed the reins. He 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 he. Evan's horse snorted loudly as it greeted its master. There was a lot to do in the Holy Land now that he had found traces of an evil god. He thought it would be hard to take a vacation for a while, and Evan signaled his horse. And LT, Chapter 20, The Order, 1, and GT, The Bandit's Hideout, located in a remote mountain road. In that place, where not many people were left, Roan looked at the girl who was sitting across from him. On the opposite side of Roan, there was a girl with ash-gray hair who was holding a thick book with a faint smile. The girl's name was Eutenia Hyrest. She was the Apostle of God who made Roan into a servant of the evil God, and also the person who called for this meeting today. At Eutenia's request, the only ones who remained here were her and Roan, just two people. Roan looked at Eutenia, who had woken up from her coma after a few days, with a wary gaze. What do you want to talk to me about? I received a divine grace from the Great One yesterday. A divine grace came down. That's amazing. Eutenia's body trembled slightly as she mentioned the trust. For some reason, her forehead was swollen red in the middle. Maybe she had fallen on the floor last night. That thought crossed Roan's mind for a moment. But Roan quickly shook off the useless thought and waited for Eutenia's next words. The Great One wants to entrust you with an important task. An important task. Yes. There is one important task that will be given to you from today. What kind of task is it? Roan felt his heart pounding as he heard Eutenia's words about an important mission. The girl in front of him was an apostle of God. Her words were practically representing the will of the God she served. The great being who was watching over them wanted to entrust him with something. Gulp. Roan listened carefully to the task that would be given to him. Soon, along with Eutenia's gentle voice, the content of the task that Roan had to perform flowed out. Roan Hebrus. You are an archbishop who serves the Great One from today. An, archbishop? Yes. You are in charge of conducting important rituals while serving the Great One closely. How can I take such a position? Archbishop. It was a position given to the highest clergyman who governed each region. It was practically giving Roan full authority over this area. Of course, this story did not come to Roan without any reason. As far as Roan could see, there was no significant power in the order yet. Eutenia added another word to Roan, who looked burdened. It's not a position given without any conditions. I understand that. Instead, you have to faithfully expand the order's power in this area. As expected, it was as Roan had expected. She gave him a seat in a shocking position, but she wanted him to grow it into a power worthy of it. She gave him a shell of an archbishop of an order that had nothing. If it had been an ordinary situation, Roan would have refused this offer sharply. But now, there was a miracle of God clearly in front of Roan's eyes. It was a miracle named Apostle. As long as the Apostle with immense magic power was sitting right in front of him, there was no choice for Roan to refuse. You want me to expand the order's power? That's right. You're a smart person, Roan. You flatter me. And the next promised support is. The next support is. Smile. Eutenia smiled and lifted up the book. She got up from her seat with the heavy-looking artifact in her arms. Eutenia got up from her seat, and Roan also got up from his seat following her. Eutenia looked at Roan who got up from his seat and said, You'll find out what the next support is when you try the ritual yourself. Huh? What do you mean by that? It's exactly what I said. If you practice the ritual that you learned from me, you'll surely get a response from the Great One. Eutenia's words ended there. Click. Click. Eutenia, who finished talking, walked out of the hideout leisurely. Roan stared at the door of the building where Eutenia had left with blank eyes. The last thing she said was something that Roan couldn't understand either. A ritual. He needed a sacrifice to perform a ritual. It seemed that he would need to prepare a sacrifice for the ritual after receiving Eutenia's teachings on it. In other words, if he didn't have enough sacrifices, he would have to move himself. Roan spread all his fingers and started to fold them one by one. One. 
2. 3. Roan sighed as he recalled the number of slaves he had locked up in the prison. I guess I'll have to go out myself to fill the number. A few days had passed since I received the gift from Eutenia. Maybe it was because the busy time was over. I was able to spend some leisure time on the long-awaited holiday. Of course, even though I had more time than usual, it was only enough to spend a little more time on games. The best friend of modern people is the smartphone, no matter what anyone says. It has become a life partner. It would be hard for anyone to dream of a life without a smartphone. I was no exception to that fact. Did she send me another magic book today? As soon as I logged into the game, I clicked on the inventory with my fingers full of anticipation. It was to check for any possible offerings. Needless to say, the list of items in the inventory was not much different from before. Nothing happened while I was away, like Eutenia sending me a magic book or something. Click. Click. I kept opening and closing the empty inventory, wondering if it was lagging. But there was no such thing as an item appearing in the inventory. Well, that makes sense. There's no way a magic book would come in every day. I wished Eutenia would send me a magic book every day, but unfortunately that seemed impossible. Even I thought it was unreasonable. A game where a magic book appears in the inventory every time you log in. Who would pay for such a game? At least it wouldn't be a positive thing for the game's payment model. I looked at the shop button in the upper right corner of the screen with a sigh of regret. I hope it's not still under maintenance. I glanced back and forth between the empty inventory and the shop button. Last time, the NLT, paid currency shop and GT, was under maintenance, but it seemed unlikely that it would still be under maintenance. My salary had just been deposited into my account. If I spun the 10 pull, I could fill my empty inventory with decent items. Should I pull or wait? After thinking for a while, I decided to touch the shop button. Press. The screen switched to the shop page, and a new message popped up at the bottom of the screen. And LT, paid currency shop, LV, max plus one, and GT, skill has been expanded. You have acquired and LT, paid currency shop, LV, max plus two, and GT, skill. You can now purchase items from the shop using paid currency. The messages that came up one after another were unexpected. The level of NLT, paid currency shop and GT, skill had increased. And it was called LV, max plus two, an absurd level that I couldn't understand at all. I couldn't help but exclaim at the sight of the evolved gotcha shop. What? Why did this go up? I haven't even leveled up yet. The shop level grew on its own without even leveling up. And what was more shocking was that the price of the 10 pull, which had been 69, 901, had gone up again. 10 pulls for 79, 901. It was almost 80, 0001. It was a much more burdensome amount than before. Ha! Huh. A bitter laugh escaped my mouth as I looked at the price that had risen before I knew it. Really? It's a legendary game in many ways. The shop evolves on its own without the player's consent. And even before evolution, the previous shop was not even selectable. What game could offer such a beautiful payment structure? Before I knew it, my eyes were drawn to an item that was emitting a brilliant light among the items that came out of the gotcha shop. Devil Sword, Ed knows. It was an item that emitted a purple halo from its background. And LT, 21, The Order, 2, and GT, it was an effect I had never seen before. None of the items that had appeared so far had such an effect. Even the magic books did not have any effect. A special effect that did not show up when I acquired the magic books was flowing out of the new, devil sword, Ednos, that I obtained. It must be a proof that this item is more important than ordinary magic books. A devil sword? Such an item exists. I admired the effect that wrapped around the devil sword and examined the item closely. Devil Sword, Ednos, had a shape closer to a dagger than a normal sword, despite its name. There was a jewel-decorated handle below the beautifully sculpted blade. Squeak. I clicked on the item in the inventory and looked at it, and detailed information about, Devil Sword, Ednos, was displayed. Maybe it was because of its name. Devil Sword, Ednos, had a characteristic that could not be found in ordinary items. The name of the characteristic is, and LT, Magic Accumulation and GT. 
and LT, Magic Accumulation and GT. That was the name of the characteristic given to, Devil Sword, Ednos. The effect of and LT, Magic Accumulation and GT, characteristic was to absorb up to 10 spells. The absorbed spells were stored inside, Devil Sword, Ednos, and it was possible to empty the space again by releasing the stored spells. A characteristic that stores the opponent's spells. It would be difficult for me to use it myself, but I think it would be a great advantage in a battle between characters. You can release powerful spells that were already stored. You can also erase the opponent's spells suddenly and return them to the target. It was a characteristic. That could create various benefits for the character depending on the situation. It feels like I get better things because it's an 80, 0, 0, 0, 1 draw. It seemed that the level of items from the draw had increased overall. Compared to before, Sponge Cake came out more often than Baguette. Steel Sword was replaced by Sharp Steel Sword, which showed that it was worth 80, 0, 0, 0, 1 for sure. The value of 80, 0, 0, 0, 1. I rubbed my chin and thought for a while, but I was convinced again after seeing the Devil Sword I drew this time. This is enough to make up for it. Then now, who should I give this Devil Sword to? After the draw was over, it was time to think about how to distribute the items. Unlike magic books, Devil Swords were not items that I could use. Normally, I would have given this to Eutenia as well, but it was an item that did not suit her very well. Eutenia was a magician who could use divine arts. Giving her a Devil Sword that absorbs magic would not be efficient in any way. If not Eutenia, then who should I give this sword to? A man who hovered around Eutenia caught my eye as I thought about it. Roan Hebris, Acquired and Elton, Fanatic and GT, Characteristic. Karma increased by one point. The name of the character who hovered around Eutenia was Roan Hebris. He was a character who acquired and Elton, Fanatic and GT, Characteristic after being influenced by Eutenia since their meeting. At first, I didn't notice him because I was focused on the magic books, but I found out later when I checked. After talking to Eutenia, I learned that Roan wanted to become my character. Of course, there was a limit to karma, so I couldn't make anyone my apostle. But there was no reason to leave a character with and LT, fanatic and GT, characteristic alone. I fixed my screen focus on Roan, who was busy moving around. I forgot you were there. The other day, in my conversation with Eutenia, I promised Roan that I would give him a decent position. The position translated by the speech bubble translator was Archbishop. And LT, divine calling of karma, Offering and GT, worked for characters who were not apostles as well, so it was part of our conversation later that Eutenia would teach him offering. The offerings that Roan offered me could also be converted into karma. I plan to increase the number of characters with and LT, fanatic and GT, characteristic centered on Roan, and ultimately use the power to facilitate karma supply. I can't give him nothing when he's an archbishop. An archbishop is an archbishop even if it's just a name. When Eutenia left for a trip to collect magic books, Roan had to work hard in her place. It would be a troublesome situation if he got stabbed by another character while working alone. I couldn't just leave a person who was supposed to be an archbishop alone. After thinking for a while, I decided to give, Devil Sword, Ednos, to Roan as a gift. I calculated that it would be helpful for Roan to use the characteristic of, Devil Sword, Ednos, that stores magic. A characteristic that stores magic. Then it must be. The characteristic of the devil sword that stores magic. My eyes naturally turned to the skill button in the corner of the screen. And LT, lightning arrow and GT. A powerful spell that inflicted area damage and dot damage. What if I stored and LT, lightning arrow and GT, to the limit in, devil sword, Ednos. An item that allows the character to use and LT, lightning arrow and GT, up to 10 times. In a way, it would be a state that could be said to be stronger than me when I was low level. Yeah. Magic is always better with area skills. The image of Roan using and LT, lightning arrow and GT, with the devil sword. It felt like my chest was swelling just by thinking about it. After deciding what to do with, devil sword, Ednos, I put down my smartphone on the desk and got up from my seat. It was time to get hungry. I thought about making some ramen. I moved to the kitchen to boil some water, thinking about what kind of ramen to eat today. I'll give him the item later. 
a huge empty space in a corner of the hideout. Roan's hand was busy there. There were glowing stones around the darkened empty space, and there was a geometric pattern drawn with white paint on the ground. Many words of praise written in ancient letters around the complex patterns. It was the altar that Roan, who became the archbishop of the sect, learned from Eutenia and created. The altar where offerings were placed was located higher than usual. Ugh. Roan put down the bowl after using up all the remaining paint to write the last letter carefully. Is this the end? Cold sweat ran down Roan's forehead, who had completed the altar. It was an altar dedicated to the god. It was a task that required more care than performing magical things. Roan emptied his hands and stepped back a few steps to look at the altar. A satisfied smile hung on Roan's lips as he checked the altar he had made. Despite being the first altar he had drawn, it did not look lacking in any way. It was a well-made altar in Roan's own opinion. You worked hard, Roan. Not at all. It's all thanks to you, Apostle. Next to Roan, who was eating sponge cake while watching him, Eutenia was sitting. With a hand stretched out from the shadow holding the cake plate, Eutenia reached for the cake and ate it. It was no different from a trick, Roan stared blankly at her for a moment. He had thought so since she used the shadow to take out a book, but to Roan's eyes, it was a truly extraordinary sight. By the way, are all the offerings ready? Archbishop Roan. It's nothing. I have prepared enough offerings. Roan shook his head to shake off his thoughts and looked at the altar in front of him again. What was important to him now was the offering ritual. How the apostle ate cake was none of his business. Then let's proceed with the ritual. As soon as all the preparations for the ritual were over, Roan moved to the right place where he had to be. Who? A sigh flowed out of Roan's mouth facing the altar. It was a ritual to offer offerings to God and receive a response. It would be a lie if he said he wasn't nervous. Roan calmed his tense body and began to recite the prayer with his hands wide open. Life. Build a staircase. The atmosphere changed to a devout one as Roan's calm voice echoed. All the believers around him knelt down toward the altar as the ritual began. Eutenia was no exception, who was watching the ritual. Everyone stared at the altar and watched the ritual, and Rome continued his silent prayer. One path leads to glory. The majestic prayer that shouted out to God. One word became awe that shook people, and the next word became a roar that shook heaven and earth. A fierce pulse. And an exclamation of reverence. The gate of heaven revealed itself to those who looked up at God with humility. A huge gaze showed its presence and looked at those who prayed to him. Revere. Worship. Offer. The flesh of those who were offered as offerings was wrapped in bright light. There were no offerings left on the altar. The offering ritual was successful. Roan's lips curled into a smile of emotion as he realized that fact. He shouted out to his master with a loud voice in ecstasy. O oh great one! And at the same time, something strange happened on the empty altar. Thud! A sword that fell from the sky stuck in the center of the altar. The sword stuck on the altar was wrapped in thick darkness. And Elte, Chapter 22, The Order, 3, and GT, a beautiful sword wrapped in darkness. It was clearly a blessing from the divine. Gulp! Roan swallowed his saliva unconsciously as he faced the sword. He was about to approach the sword placed on the altar when suddenly. Boom! A bolt of lightning struck down from the sky. Ah! What, what is that? Lightning? The believers who were watching the scene screamed in terror at the sudden lightning. Crackle. Sparkle. The lightning that hit the altar sparked for a moment, then was absorbed into the sword. Everyone who surrounded the altar became solemn at the sight of the phenomenon that occurred. But the anomaly that happened to the altar was not over yet. As soon as the thunder that shook Roan's ear subsided, spears of lightning fell from the sky one after another. Bang! Boom! The sound of thunder was so loud that it seemed to burst their eardrums. The believers covered their ears at the sound of thunder that shook their heartbeats. Oh, oh Lord! Oh mighty one! Powerful lightning strikes continued to hit the ground. Every time a bright light flashed in front of their eyes, they heard thunder roaring in their ears. It was a scene that only a transcendent being could create. 
many people shouted the name of their god at the awe-inspiring scene that followed the ritual. Boom! Every time the spear of lightning collided with the sword on the altar, dark energy spewed out and swallowed up the remaining current. Once. Twice. The lightning that fell like divine punishment struck several times. After a final blow that resembled a firework to mark the end of the ritual, the barrage of lightning that fell toward the sword ended. How, how can this be? Roan let out a sound of astonishment as he watched it all. At the last moment of the sacrifice. Their god gave them a clear answer. Crackle. A faint current flowed from the sword that absorbed the power of lightning. It was a sight that no mere human could imitate. Roan looked at the sword on the altar and remembered the conversation he had with Eutenia in the past. If you practice the ritual of offering that you learn from me, surely he will answer you. Eutenia said this to Roan. She said that there would surely be an answer from him to Roan. Then that meant that the sword on the altar was meant for Roan. Thud. Thud. Roan approached the altar and looked at the sword. The sword that had been spewing out darkness tempted Roan with its beautiful appearance. The blade had a refined shape and a splendid handle. There was nothing he didn't like about it. Oh mighty one! If this is your will for me, I humbly accept it. Roan grabbed the sword with his trembling hand. Clack! As he held the sword given by God in an awkward posture, he felt a tremendous force coming from his palm. What Roan was holding was not a simple object. It was a magic sword that swallowed magic and returned it back. That was the identity of Ednos, which Roan was holding. Roan muttered to himself as he realized what he was holding. Ednos. I see. That's what this thing is called. He felt a sense of omnipotence as if he could wield great power with just holding it. It was an object given by God who watched over them. It was a treasure worthy of being called a miracle. This Ednos would be a symbol of Roan's authority from now on. Perhaps understanding what it meant to receive Ednos, Eutenia congratulated Roan who held it in his hand. You got a good thing. Congratulations, Roan. It's all thanks to you, Master. You're still humble. A hand stretched out from the shadow and lightly tapped Roan's shoulder. Tap. Tap. It was a gesture of encouragement for Roan. Eutenia smiled and asked him as she tapped his shoulder. Don't you have something else to do for His Holiness? Yes. I have something to do. I hope you succeed. Yes. As soon as she withdrew her hand from his shoulder, Roan walked back to the front of the altar again. He then turned around and looked at the believers who knelt down behind him. They all looked at Roan with different expressions. Fear. Awe. Admiration. He faced each emotion one by one and lifted Ednos in his hand. I declare in the name of Archbishop Roan Hebrus at this place. Flash. Ednos in Roan's hand began to emit light. The light was so bright that it blinded their eyes, and the believers naturally bowed their heads. We will build a temple here. A temple to serve the Mighty One. A temple to serve their Master. That was the most important plan in Roan's mind, who became an Archbishop. He would build a temple for God. And he would gather the followers of God. That was the only way he could repay a little bit of the authority he had received. Everyone, cheer. For the Mighty One. Roan's sword tip flashed and turned into a spear of lightning that shot out. Boom! The magic that Ednos fired flew straight to the mountain next to it and collided. A huge explosion and thick smoke rose up. The believers who witnessed all these miracles spontaneously applauded. Cheers and applause. The sound of clapping was so loud that it echoed throughout the mountain. Roan smiled with satisfaction as he watched the scene. Archbishop, Roan Hebrus. It was the moment of the birth of the order led by him. The Holy Land, Crossbridge. In the Temple of Abundance, which had the most influence among the six temples, there was a saintess who was respected by everyone in the Holy Land. The girl who folded her hands and prayed devoutly to the sky was Serena Edirunt. She was the saintess who led the Temple of Abundance, and also the closest being to God in the Holy Land. Her prayer echoed softly in the silence as she closed her eyes. A faint light flowed from her body as she prayed. O oh Goddess of Abundance who watches over all! Next to Serena, there was a knight with a sword. 
It was customary for a person who matched her status as the most important person in the Holy Land to have a guard. Knight, Lien Crost. He was a chosen knight with a white holy sword, and also the vice captain of the Knight Order. Lien watched Serena praying with a devout expression and guarded his surroundings. How much time had passed since Serena started praying? The light that wrapped around her body disappeared, and Lien, who had been guarding her with his holy sword, moved. Phew. The prayer is finally over. Serena got up from her seat and looked at Lien as she finished praying. Maybe because she had been holding her posture for a long time, her legs lost strength and she wobbled for a moment. Lien didn't miss that small gap and went to her side to support her. Thud. Serena, who was caught by Lien's hand, looked at him for a moment and then straightened her posture and smiled at him. I guess I'm not as fit as I thought. Be careful. Everyone in the Holy Land will worry if you get hurt. Thank you, Lien. It's nothing. But did the Goddess of Abundance say anything to you? It was a regular prayer time, but sometimes Serena received a revelation from God. Revelation. Also known as Divine Grace, it was something that only she could hear as a saintess. Lien's question to Serena was also about the Divine Grace that the Goddess of Abundance gave. Nod. Serena nodded her head at Lien's question and said. Yes. I received a Divine Grace. Divine Grace. I see. Aren't you curious what it is? Of course I'm curious. What kind of Divine Grace did you receive? The content of the Divine Grace was not disclosed to anyone except for the core members of the Holy Land. But Lien was a knight who guarded the saintess, and also a person who held the position of vice-captain of the Knight Order. He also moved around with Serena most closely on normal days. He was someone who had enough qualifications to be told the content of the Divine Grace by Serena. So he didn't hesitate to ask her about it. She said that a new hero will appear in the temple soon. A new hero? Could it be, that the evil god has started to interfere in this world? Lien's eyebrows twitched when he heard the word hero from Serena's mouth. Hero. It was a name that referred to the owners of the six divine artifacts that appeared with the divine grace. There was only one condition for a hero to appear. The evil god who disturbed the world had appeared. The gods who watched over the six temples in the holy land did not exert their influence on the ground except for certain exceptions. And the appearance of the evil god was an exception that made them move actively. Lien was surprised to hear the name of the hero and agreed with Serena's answer. The evil god has started to move. No, actually, it seems like he started moving much earlier than we expected. The evil god's movement. That alone was enough to cause an emergency in the whole holy land. But he said that he had been moving much earlier than Lien expected. Lien asked again at the successive bad news. What do you mean by that? For some reason, causality has been reset. That's why Divine Grace came down later than usual. Karma is fair to everyone, so if it doesn't tilt enough, Divine Artifacts won't be released either. Lien's face darkened as he recalled the appearance of Divine Artifacts recorded in history books. Without using their power, most heroes were nothing more than talented humans. Even if they were chosen as heroes, they would have a hard time blocking Lien's sword without Divine Artifacts. Divine Artifacts were objects that had a lot of meaning for heroes. And what Serena said implied that the hero's divine artifacts would not be able to exert enough power for a while. That's a difficult story. The elders will have a headache for a while. That's right. It's hard enough to bring the heroes here safely. What are you going to do, Saintus? I guess I'll enjoy my freedom for a while. Freedom. Anyway, the Inquisition or the Knights will take care of finding the heroes, so I'll be relaxed for a while, right? When the temple became busy preparing for the arrival of the heroes, paradoxically, Serena's schedule as a saint is decreased. It was because most of the official events were suspended due to the mobilization of most of the manpower outside. Chuckle. Lien let out a faint laugh at Serena's words. He rarely smiled, but Serena smiled back at him as she saw his smile. You won't be quiet if you're lazy. Oh, lazy. Rest is also a preparation for facing the evil god. Of course I didn't expect you to have no excuses. I can't beat you, Lien. They smiled at each other and looked beyond each other at the shadow of the evil god that loomed over the continent. 
and LT, 23, the corrupted sword, 1, and GT, Roan Hebrus, has performed a sacrifice for you. Sacrifice is dedicated to you, 21 the effect of NLT, karma's blessing, sacrifice and GT, is activated. Your karma increases by 42, proportional to the number of sacrificed offerings. Right after the sacrificial ceremony led by Archbishop Roan Hebrus and his followers ended. I was able to confirm the message that I had acquired a considerable amount of karma. The amount of karma I gained from this ceremony was much more than I expected. It was not only because the karma increased by the sacrifice was high, but also because a special event had occurred. At the same time as Roan announced the establishment of the temple, new event messages appeared. Roan Hebrus has acquired the Andelti, religious leader and GT, trait. Your karma increases by 5. Roan Hebrus has declared the birth of a order. Your karma increases by 50. Was it because I personally appointed Roan as the archbishop? Or was it thanks to Roan declaring the birth of the order? At the bottom of the screen, there was a message that Roan had acquired the Andelti, religious leader and GT, trait. It seemed to be an upgraded version of the Andelti, fanatic and GT, trait that Roan had before. The sum of the karma I received from the birth of the sect and Roan's trait acquisition was 55. If I added the karma I gained from the sacrifice and the karma I had saved from hunting, it was enough to raise my level. You have reached level 6. And LT, observers I, LV, 5, and GT, grows. And LT, observers I, LV, 6, and GT, becomes. You can observe the continent with a clearer vision than before. With the huge amount of karma I got, I reached level 6. Of course, as my level increased, and LT, observers I and GT, also became a higher level. There was no significant graphic upgrade or speech bubble output change. However, I felt that the speed of moving the screen was faster than before. The range of screen movement that was allowed also seemed to increase by a large margin. In short, it seemed like the map had expanded as my level increased. There is no change in graphics. And what has changed in Karma's blessing? The next thing that changed after NLT, Observer's I and GT, was NLT, Karma's blessing and GT, which had been warning me every time my level increased. Unlike before, there was no new skill activated like NLT, Karma's blessing, sacrifice and GT. The change that occurred this time was about the content that the system had been warning me about. Karma's blessing had always warned me about NLT, causality adjustment and GT. And its result appeared today. The appearance of heroes. I didn't know exactly what changes would happen, but it was undeniable that it would be a penalty for me. I couldn't help but lose my appetite as I saw the new message. Does hunting too hard increase the difficulty? It's not fun if the game is too easy. So some degree of difficulty adjustment was understandable. But it bothered me that this change appeared after the sect was born. Even if heroes were special bosses with unique characteristics, they had little influence on me. It seemed more likely that they would try to interfere with my characters while they were hunting. If I didn't want to see my well-raised characters disappear, I would need to check on their whereabouts from time to time. It looks like I have to keep an eye on my characters from now on. And the next message is. What is this? After checking on Karma's blessing, I scrolled down again. It was usually where there would be a message about NLT, Paid Currency Shop and GT. But since NLT, Paid Currency Shop and GT, had already leveled up once, there was no skill level increase this time. Instead, there was a message that I had acquired a new skill. The skill I acquired this time was called NLT, Descent and GT. You have learned NLT, Descent, 0 5, and GT. For each of the following conditions you meet, NLT, Descent and GT, S progress will increase by one stage. Usable Karma, 221 slash 999, 999, incomplete. 0 slash 1, incomplete. 0 slash 1, incomplete. 0 slash 1, incomplete. Incomplete, descent. It was a word that meant a divine being descending to the ground. I didn't know how the gods descended in the game world, but the Andelti, Descent and GT, skill I had required me to complete five quests to use it. Even then, the first quest was to collect a million karma, which was hidden by unreadable characters. It seemed that I had not reached the level where I could unlock the quests. 
It was not surprising that they would be unlocked sequentially, since the first quest was already headache-inducing. A million karma? That's a ridiculous number. And the first quest was to collect a million usable karma. Judging by the fact that the karma I spent on making apostles was not counted, it meant that I had to collect an additional million after excluding the consumed karma. The karma I had collected so far by playing the game was barely around 300. But I had to collect a whopping million. It was a daunting number just to think about. But difficult games are fun. Still, I had no intention of giving up this game. This game was already one of the few escapes that healed my mind exhausted by work. And the pleasure of clearing a difficult game was indescribable. It was definitely not because of the simple reason that I had already spent more than 200, 0001 on this game. Probably. Probably. The night sky darkened as the sun set. Peter, who was looking at the bright stars, had Eutenia sitting next to him reading a book. Maybe it was because the letters were not visible under the dark night sky. Eutenia was holding a glowing stone that cast a shadow. Flip. Eutenia turned the page with her finger and asked Peter, who was looking at the night sky. Do you like stars? I used to like them when I was young. Peter's eyes looked at the shining Polaris. He devoted himself to farming as he grew older, but Peter liked the night sky when he was young. He looked at the distant night sky and connected the constellations one by one with his fingers. That was his favorite solo game when he was a little boy. Of course, by now, the night sky had changed a lot from then. So you used to like them when you were young? Yes. That was a good hobby. Eutenia, who was still looking at the book, said with a faint smile on her face. The place where he stood now was not the village where he used to look at the stars. It was nothing more than a shabby hideout of thieves located in a rugged mountain. The village where he used to look at the stars had already disappeared. And it was done by Eutenia, who was sitting next to him. Even if he looked up at the sky with admiration now, he could not face the same sky as before. Do you like looking at the sky? Nevertheless, Polaris remained in its place, shining brightly. Peter, who had caught the light of Polaris in his eyes, asked Eutenia. Flip. Eutenia looked at the sky again after turning another page. I might have liked it when I was young. What about now? I don't think I like it as much as I did then. A short and clear answer. Peter opened his mouth after hearing it. That's an unexpected answer. Was it unexpected? Since heaven is close to God, I thought you would like the sky. Eutenia smiled faintly at Peter's words. God. And heaven. Both were undoubtedly wrapped in countless veils. Eutenia stopped turning pages at Peter's question that linked them together. Instead, she looked at Peter and said to him. It seems that you think so. Aren't you curious? About where the Great One is? Do you think God is somewhere in that sky? Or beyond the countless stars? Peter's hand reached out to the sky. He tried to grasp the vast sky with all his might, but there was nothing in his hand. That's what heaven was like. It was visible but unreachable. A place that was never allowed to humans. A realm of mystery that humans could not access. It seems that you think the Great One is in heaven. If you can't hold what you see, you might not see what you hold. That's a very interesting thought. Is my word wrong? Thud. Eutenia closed the book she had opened. She got up from where she was reading and hugged the divine instrument that was lying next to her. A thick magic flowed from Eutenia's body as she hugged the divine instrument. It was the most certain and clear evidence that she was loved by a transcendent being. I'm not such a great person, so I don't know everything. But I think it means that he is always with me and stays inside me. Eutenia said as she stroked the book she hugged. The words of an apostle chosen by God. Peter could not argue with her words at all. I see. It's just my personal opinion though. If you, an apostle of God, say so, I think it's not a wrong story. That was all Peter could do, agree with her words. Peter was not a chosen being by God. He only faced an evil God who took away sacrifices. That was all he knew about God. It was a pleasant conversation. I remembered the book I was looking for, so I guess I have to go back now. Okay. The conversation with Eutenia ended there. 
Eutenia turned away from Peter after finishing the conversation. She started walking towards the empty tent. Peter watched her back as she walked quietly towards the tent. Peter's eyes were full of confusion as he looked at Eutenia. It seems that the six gods do not look down below. Even though an apostle of an evil god walked around freely, there was no divine punishment coming down on them. God exists. Yet justice is not seen. Only the empty sky he grasped represented Peter's heart. Peter lowered his arm that was reaching for Polaris. And at that moment, a burning pain began to be felt from Peter's right arm, which had returned to its place. Ugh! Peter bit his teeth and lifted his clothes to look at his right arm. A black mark appeared on Peter's arm, which had nothing on it. A mark of a wing pierced by a splendid sword. A sign that represented a hero chosen by the God of Honor. Peter showed a bewildered look at the appearance of the mark that appeared without any warning. A mark. Peter's finger stroked the mark on his arm. The mark was as if it had always existed on Peter's skin, and he did not feel any bumps. The pain in Peter's arm disappeared as the mark of the hero became clear. A mark that suddenly appeared on his skin. Peter scratched his arm hard with his nails to erase the mark. But there was no sign of the mark on Peter's arm disappearing. The mark had already taken its place on Peter's arm completely. I see. Peter muttered to himself as he looked at his arm and reached a conclusion about the mark. The six gods he had been looking for had already given him an answer. Yet Peter had no knowledge to recognize the mark. He was in such a position as a young man from a rural village in the outskirts. He had never faced the scriptures of the temple, let alone met a priest in his life. He finished his own judgment on the mark arbitrarily and sighed deeply as he touched his forehead. It seems that I've been with the fallen ones for too long, and now I've even got a mark of an evil god. And LT, 24, the corrupted sword, 2, and GT, Evan Alamir. He was a heretic inquisitor of Crossbridge and the eldest son of the Alamir family. Evan had just finished his short vacation and was on his way back to Crossbridge. The information he had learned during his vacation was shocking enough to shake the holy land. The movement of the evil god cult. And the imminent appearance of the hero. Both were troublesome matters that would only get worse as time passed. That's why Evan chose to return to the holy land as quickly as possible, even if it meant taking some risks. He started moving along a shortcut that he had heard from his brother, Hus. This road is quite rough. Clack, clack. As he urged his horse on, Evan looked around and opened his mouth. The shortcut that Hus had told him about was more rugged than the usual road he took. It was not a problem if he ran carefully, but he could understand why people did not often pass by this way. Evan would not have chosen this adventure if he had some time to spare. He had been running for hours, kicking up dust along the way. He decided to change his horse when he reached the border. He spotted some people on the road when the summer sun was at its zenith. Are those people? He saw a few figures on top of a shabby-looking carriage. He was still too far away to see them clearly, but he could barely make out their shapes. But if he kept running at this pace, he would surely crash into them. He grabbed the reins and slowed down as he saw the carriage in the distance. Hee-haw! As Evan slowed down his horse, the people on the carriage looked at him. Two men. And one woman. That was all he could see of their party. There's someone coming from the other side. One of the men who was looking at Evan coming from afar opened his mouth. The young man who caught Evan's eye had a naive face. He was sitting on the driver's seat, holding the reins, so he must have been a young coachman or an errand boy. Clack. Clack. He slowed down his horse until it was visible to the eye and approached the carriage. He stopped his horse. Hee-haw. His horse snorted loudly as it came to a complete halt. His brother Hus lived here, but Evan was still an outsider from the Holy Land. He got off his horse and walked slowly towards the carriage, hoping to ask them for directions. I'd like to ask you for directions, if you don't mind. As he brushed off the dust on his body and walked towards the carriage, Evan spoke. His clothes were covered with dust from riding his horse for a long time. As he approached them while dusting off his clothes, one of the men showed a sign of caution. The man who wore a robe with a hood looked older than the young coachman. As Evan's gaze met his, the man opened his mouth to him. Where are you going? 
I'm heading to the Holy Land. The Holy Land. Are you a holy knight? There was nothing on Evan's clothes that indicated that he belonged to the temple. Yet the man asked him if he was a holy knight and showed a wary look. There was no reason for an ordinary person to be suspicious of a traveler heading to the Holy Land. It was clearly a suspicious sight. Crackle. Evan felt an unpleasant sensation in his aura as he raised his holy power. It was an energy that repelled holy power. The dark magic of another dimension. The power of abomination that black magicians had accumulated by offering sacrifices. What are you going to do if I'm a holy knight? A black magician who was wary of holy knights and his companions. It was an obvious suspicious combination. Evan's role as a heretic inquisitor of the Holy Land was to deal with those who served heresy and corrupted magicians. He sensed something ominous and moved his hand to his sword hilt naturally. He had planned to just ask for directions and move on. But he had learned too much to just pass by them now. Nothing. I was just curious. Is that so? You seem very curious. I'm always like that. In the tense atmosphere, the black magician's throat moved as he faced Evan. Gulp. He swallowed his saliva and twitched his hand. Evan did not think that the black magician in front of him had achieved much. He was only at a level that could be handled by third-class investigators of the Empire. It would not take long for him to finish him off if he acted himself. Evan made up his mind and took another step towards the black magician. You black magicians are indeed very curious. What did you say? You wouldn't dabble in forbidden magic with just a little curiosity, would you? Clang. Evan's sword was drawn out of his scabbard with a friction sound. He drew his sword with a natural motion and swung it at the black magician in front of him. It was a swift sword strike that most magicians could not even react to. Clang. The only thing that blocked Evan's sword was a hand wrapped in darkness. The hand came out of the shadow behind the black magician, who was the target of Evan's sword. That was close, Roan. The shadow that blocked Evan's sword came from the feet of the girl who was behind the black magician. Beyond the shadow that blocked his sword. A girl with ash-gray hair was sitting on the carriage, looking down at the two men. She was holding a large book in her arms, smiling innocently. Seeing the girl who had moved the shadow to block his sword, the black magician behind her sighed in relief and replied. Phew. Thank you. I would have been dead for sure if it weren't for you, Apostle. Be careful. He seems like a dangerous person. He does. I didn't expect him to swing his sword at me out of nowhere. Apostle. And black magician. Evan overheard their conversation and backed away a few steps, on guard. The magic he had just encountered was very unfamiliar to him. It was the first time he had faced such a high-level magic. The being in front of him was different from the black magician in essence. While the girl was moving her shadow, Evan could sense a tremendous amount of magic around her. A tidal wave of magic that seemed endless. She was clearly a high-ranking magician who could not be opposed by any ordinary means. Who are you? Are you curious about my identity? Yes. Reveal yourself. Shouldn't you introduce yourself first if you want to hear someone else's identity? That's the polite thing to do. Tap. Tap. The girl tapped her book with her finger and spoke. Every time her slender finger touched the book, a powerful wave of magic emanated from it. It was an awe-inspiring level of magic, unlike her innocent-looking face. Despite her seemingly willing to reveal herself if he played along, Evan quickly weighed his options in his head. The apostle in front of him was a threat to the Holy Land. If he could reveal his identity to learn more about her, it was a relatively cheap deal. Evan made up his mind and told her his name. My name is Evan Alamir. I'm a holy knight who serves the God of Honor. The God of Honor? Your actions just now were not very honorable, I think. There is no honor to show to the wicked. Evan tried to ignore her sarcastic words. It was not a lie that he had blurted out for convenience. Life and death were always at stake during a battle. He could only fight honorably with those who deserved respect. This was also written in the doctrine of the temple. The girl nodded as if she understood his answer, which could seem half-hearted. I see. Well, since I heard your introduction, I guess I should introduce myself too. 
the girl who was sitting on the carriage got up from her seat. She hugged her book and stepped down lightly, facing Evan who was glaring at her from below. She did not seem to worry about falling from such a height, as a hand of shadow reached out to support her. Thud. She landed safely on the ground and looked at Evan with a faint smile. Then she spoke in a clear voice that echoed in the narrow road. My name is Eutenia Hyrest. I'm the first apostle who serves the Great One. Apostle. Do you mean the apostle of the evil god? It's very rude of you to call the Great One an evil god. Ignoring her displeased look, Evan was plunged into serious thoughts after hearing her identity. The apostle of the evil god. That meant only one thing. The evil god had gained enough influence in this world to send down an apostle. Evan looked at Eutenia with a tense face and raised his sword. He had to eliminate the apostle in front of him if he could. He had no choice but to fight from the beginning. I only spoke the truth. Did you? You're quite an impolite person. A god who devours people does not deserve respect. We have decided to call those who turn their eyes away from this obvious truth evil gods. He wielded his sword to punish evil. That was the path that Evan Alamir had chosen. He looked at Eutenia with a fierce gaze, imbued with holy power. Don't you regret doing something foolish? I'm not afraid of death or running away. Otherwise, I wouldn't have chosen to be a holy knight. Hearing Evan's words, Eutenia sighed briefly. She immersed herself in thought, her ash-gray eyes reflecting her book. A thick book whose origin was unknown. And Evan standing beyond it. She looked back and forth between them and released a strong wave of magic from her body. Fine. I didn't intend to let you go anyway. She opened the book she was holding and declared to Evan. At the same time, countless hands stretched out from beyond her shadow. An unfathomable realm of darkness. The overflowing hands became a wave that aimed at Evan. The first apostle, Eutenia Hyrest. The apostle who had received the divine power of the evil god unleashed her full strength at Evan. Evan faced Eutenia's attack and ran towards her with his sword, filled with holy power. And LT, 25, the corrupted sword, 3, and GT, Evan stared intently at the shadows that rushed towards him. To a warrior, the most important organ was the eye. The eye that saw the attack. And the eye that predicted the future. Intuition was nothing more than a prediction based on the eye and experience, with a little adjustment. Woo woo woo. Evan's sword emitted a pure white light, and a warm holy power wrapped around his body. O oh goddess! Grant me the power to punish your enemies. Evan recited the prayer of the paladin and swung his sword at the approaching shadows. Clang! Clang! The busy sword repelled the shadows that poured down on him. Every time Evan's sword infused with holy power swung, the shadows that touched it retreated a little bit. But it was only enough to create a brief gap. It was impossible to completely suppress the endless onslaught of shadows. Evan's steps began to be pushed back by the wave of shadows. Do you think you can keep running away? Left. And right. Shadows that popped out from both sides moved towards Evan. Evan's eyes, which moved busily, assessed the danger of the attack. Clang. He blocked one of them and twisted his body. Shook. The shadow that aimed at him stretched out and grazed Evan's shoulder. The cloth that wrapped around Evan's shoulder was torn off. Evan swung his sword at the shadow that passed by and looked at the remaining enemies in front of him. I can't get close because of the shadows. There were too many shadows that Eutenia unleashed. The moment his body was caught by Eutenia's shadows, it would be hard to move properly. Even if he tried to approach, the shadow's interference was severe. But he had to get close to inflict effective damage. Thud. Evan took a step forward and began to calculate the path to reach his enemy. Even if I make a gap, I'll only have one chance at best. The Inquisitor was a position given only to those who were pure and strong among the paladins. Even so, Evan had no confidence in fighting against an apostle for a long time. The apostle he faced was an unreasonable being to that extent. It was a moment when he needed a proper choice. Evan raised his holy power after judging the value of his movement. The sword in Evan's hand emitted a stronger light than before. O oh goddess! Guide me! He took a deep breath and ran towards the front with his sword in his hand. 
His eyes, which had been honing his skills continuously, showed him the way to go. Between the countless shadows that stretched out. There was a short gap created by the changing trajectories of the shadows. Evan found the small gap and dove into it, aiming for it. Clang! Clang! The blades of light that flashed several times pushed away the shadows and moved forward. Every time Evan's sword swung, the shadow's hand that twisted its orbit hit the ground. The distance between them narrowed in an instant with his quick steps. Evan gasped and looked at Eutenia. It was close enough to touch her with his sword. But Eutenia still didn't show any sign of reacting. It seemed like there was no other chance to inflict effective damage than now. Hu Hu with a short breath, his right arm muscles contracted. It was the moment when Evan's sword filled with brilliant light slashed towards her front. Barrier. Kwong. With a loud crash, Evan's sword stopped. There was no sensation of piercing through something in Evan's hand that held the sword. He frowned at the sight of his sword hanging still in midair. Right in front of Eutenia, who had opened her book. There was a barrier that created a huge ripple. Did I fail? Are you very disappointed? He breathed heavily as his sword was blocked by the barrier. It was a barrier made with immense magic power. It was not something he could break through with a few more swings of his sword. Rather, it would be problematic if he wasted time. If he couldn't cut down the apostle in front of him, he had to at least deal with the black mage next to her and retreat. He quickly changed his target and turned his head to look at the black mage. He intended to take care of the black mage instead of Eutenia. Be free. And then he faced the lightning spear that flew towards him fast. Magic came out of the dagger that the black mage pointed at him. He was already swinging his sword at the barrier, so it was hard to respond properly. He clenched his teeth as he saw the lightning strike that aimed at him. Kwaan. With a blinding shock, Evan's body flew backwards. He was pierced by the lightning spear and flew back more than ten meters from where he was hit. Kohuk. Thud. Evan, who flew far away, hit a tree behind him and stopped. Dust rose from where Evan collided. He staggered up from his place and looked ahead. He had reduced the damage as much as possible by raising his holy power, but he still suffered this much damage. If he took a few more direct hits, his body wouldn't be able to endure it. He spat out blood and glared at the black mage. You had, one more trick up your sleeve. This is the divine grace of the Great One. He bit his tongue at the shout of the black mage who raised his dagger wrapped in darkness. It seemed like he used the power of a tool. But the power of a tool was only temporary. If I used all the power I had, the only thing left afterwards would be ruin. That was what I thought. Divine grace, you say. Such a tool, in the end. It seems like your time is up. What did you say? Eutenia, who had been watching our conversation, closed her book with a dull sound. The shadows that flowed from under her feet also faded away. Her ash-colored eyes stared at me. Her dry gaze, devoid of any humor, scanned me. Didn't I warn you? What are you talking about? There is always a price for the words you spit out. Before Eutenia finished her words, I felt a strong flow of magic from the sky. Crackle. Crackle. In the empty sky, a huge lightning power was shaping itself. It was a miracle. A miracle that transcended cognition, used by a transcendent being, close to the name of divine punishment. This is. It was not magic used by the black mage in front of me. A god from another dimension looking down at me. A god from beyond the dimension who interfered with the world by creating a miracle. I held my breath as I looked up at the sky. Before I knew it, there were countless spears of lightning in the sky. It was not hard to understand who that miracle was meant to judge. I couldn't guarantee my life if I took it properly. I had to avoid it to survive. The price of blasphemy is always one. Crackle. A thin streak of lightning passed by my side as I looked up at the sky. A black scorch mark was created on the trajectory of the lightning. A faint smoke rose from the ground and gently touched my cheek. Thump. 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 My heart started beating wildly as I faced the favor of a transcendent being. My breathing was also disrupted by the sudden tension that engulfed my whole body. Who? 
I raised my holy power and moved my sword with a sense of alertness at its peak. A being that transcended humanity was watching me. From beyond the dimension that a mere human could not see, an eye with malice stared at me. The apostle in front of me was nothing compared to him. He was a giant whose end could not be measured. The only thing allowed to a worthless human was a kick that was like a joke. Oh goddess! I moved my lips that were bleeding and shouted the name of the goddess with all my strength. The goddess of honor was the object of reverence that I always prayed to. There was no meaningful response to my voice that shouted towards the sky. But I didn't stop shouting at the sky. With a mere human body, I couldn't help myself. The only thing left for me to find at this moment was faith, which could save me. Guide me. Kwong. Lightning struck from the cloudy sky. At the same time, darkness fell on my face. As I lifted my head, there was lightning in its place. Countless spears of God aiming to pierce me through. How much holy power would I have to raise to block that many? It seemed to be beyond the realm allowed to a paladin. O oh goddess! Clank! The sword in my hand was wrapped in light. It was proof that my faith in the goddess was still firm. It was once a light so bright that it hurt my eyes, but now it was dimmer than the thunderclouds in the sky. How many could I block? That was a question that even I, who held the sword and scattered holy power, couldn't be sure of. O oh goddess! Crackle! The spears of lightning that had gathered in the sky finally began to pour down on me. As I saw them pouring down on me, I swung my sword with all my strength. Kwong! Lightning collided with the ground and exploded in front of me. Oh, God! My ears went deaf as I lifted my sword again. Kwong! Kwaang! The falling thunder shook the ground. Every time the lightning bombardment fell, a white flash swallowed up my sight. One of the spears of lightning that fell pierced me and tore me apart inside. I flew back and rolled on the ground after being hit by magic. I staggered up from my place again after being hit directly by magic. The hilt of my sword trembled roughly in my hand. There was no more voice calling for the goddess. Instead of my voice, only irregular thunder sounded. Evan Alamir. He chose to run away for the first time since he became a paladin. And LT, 26, the corrupted sword, 4, and GT, I realized that a new elite monster had appeared after some time had passed since the battle began. After finishing the ramen I had cooked, I casually looked at my smartphone and saw someone fighting with Utenia. There was a male character who was fighting with Utenia with a sword that glowed with light. He blocked the shadows with his skilled swordsmanship and struck Utenia's barrier with a blow. Of course, he was blocked by Utenia's barrier and failed to inflict any damage, so he retreated. Is it an elite monster? I recalled the elite monster that had attacked Utenia last time. The one that appeared before also swung his sword to bring down Utenia. It felt no different from the situation now when I compared them. Seeing these scenes, I wondered if targeting the characters I raised was a common trait of the elite monsters. He definitely looked stronger than the last one. His sword movements were different. He swung his sword swiftly and blocked Utenia's shadows several times. Bright light flowed from the sword he held. It seemed like a trait that boosted the user's attack or defense power. He looked clearly stronger than the elite monster I had defeated before. Of course, Utenia would win easily if they fought to the end. Liberate. Was it aiming for the gap of the opponent who was fighting with Utenia? Roan used the devil sword, Ednos, that he had gifted before and blew away the opponent. Kwaan. With a heavy impact sound, the elite monster flew far back. He used an LT, lightning arrow and GT, which caused up to 30 damage and induced electric shock. I felt proud of the performance of, Devil Sword, Ednos, that Roan showed me. It was worth the price of 80, 0001. Wow. This is why I keep doing gotcha. The opponent who was hit by an LT, lightning arrow and GT, took 8 damage and crashed into a tree. He hit the tree and staggered for a moment, then soon got up again with his sword in his hand. He showed signs of movement even after being hit by Andelti, Lightning Arrow and GT, which had powerful damage and an additional status effect. It was different from the previous opponent who was knocked out by simply being hit by Andelti, Lightning and GT, Magic. 
he seemed to be more durable and resilient than the usual enemies in terms of defense and endurance. It was definitely an opponent who made me feel that the game's difficulty had increased. But it still seems easy so far. If 1 and LT, Lightning Arrow and GT, was not enough, I could just use and LT, Lightning Arrow and GT, until he died. Squeak. I pressed the skill button and activated the target area for and LT, Lightning Arrow and GT. I learned this fact while playing the game for a long time, but if I kept touching while setting the target area, I could fire continuously. When I activated the continuous fire function, the skill was fired without pressing the skill button again. Of course, there was a drawback that it took a little more time than using the skill normally. Oh goddess. As I aimed at the character in front of me with the activated target area, he raised his sword and looked for the goddess. Suddenly looking for the goddess. His glowing sword and combat style suggested that he was a character with a paladin setting. Crackle. Crackle. The sound of electricity flowing indicated that and LT, lightning arrow and GT, was ready. I started to fire and LT, lightning arrow and GT, at the opponent. Guide me. The character who uttered a passionate line swung his sword at the incoming magic. Kwong. The and LT, lightning arrow and GT, bounced off his light-filled sword and fell in another direction. He used his sword to deflect the magic in another direction. I couldn't help but admire his skill as I watched him twist the direction of my magic. His ability was more impressive than I expected. Wow, he can deflect magic. Of course, even if he was an elite monster, he couldn't block all magic. Bang! Kwong! Kwaan! The character couldn't handle the consecutive and LT, lightning arrows and GT, and got hit by them. The elite monster who was hit by and LT, lightning arrow and GT, took 9 damage and wobbled. His defense seemed to have decreased due to the continuous attacks. The character who entered electric shock state groaned and raised his sword again. Ugh. The more I saw him, the more impressed I was by his performance. He had a strong defense that greatly reduced magic damage. He also had swordsmanship that could block magic. My eyes naturally moved to the skill icon in the corner of the screen the corner of the screen where the skill icons were gathered. There was the and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, skill that was activated by meeting the activation conditions. Can I make an elite monster into an Apostle? In the case of the previous opponent, I just knocked him down with and LT, Lightning and GT, Magic. But there was still a chance to choose for the elite monster in front of me. There are countless games that allow taming monsters. Then, what would happen if I designated an elite monster as an apostle? I felt a greed rising in my heart as I looked at the and LT, apostle selection and GT, skill. The opponent was an elite monster who could deflect magic. If it was possible to make him my apostle and enhance him, he had a high possibility of showing a superior performance than other characters. Ha! Huh. What should I do? There was no clear difference between an elite monster and a normal character. Maybe it was possible to influence an elite monster as well as a character. If successful, it could be an opportunity to get a powerful character. But I also wondered if the game developers had made the game so sloppy. Is it possible? Or is it impossible? As I was having a time of doubt, I clicked on the skill icon and activated the target area. Do you think I'll lose anything? It's a break-even deal. I used the skill with that thought. Squeak. I placed the target area activated by the and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, skill on top of the enemy character. The outline of the character in the target area turned blue. I touched the target area again to designate the character as the target of the skill. Do you want to select, Evan Alamir, as an Apostle? You need 400 karma to select an Apostle. Yes slash no as soon as I used the skill, a selection message for the and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, skill appeared. The name of the character I was fighting was Evan Alamir. And the amount of karma required to make Evan a new apostle was 400. After acquiring and LT, Lightning Arrow and GT, I barely managed to reach the limit by hunting diligently. Seeing the selection message pop up, it seemed possible to make Evan an apostle. If I use 400 karma, I can create an elite monster as my apostle. If I don't care about the amount of karma I have to pay, there was no reason for me to hesitate from my point of view. 
This really works. I pressed the accept button without hesitation. Squeak. As the selection message on the screen disappeared, Evan's body was wrapped in a bright white light. Maybe it was because his body was wrapped in light. Evan looked up at the sky right away. Evan's face, looking at the sky, looked very exhausted. As Evan looked at the sky, messages appeared one after another at the bottom of the screen. You have selected, Evan Alamir, as an apostle. You have consumed 400 karma to create a new artifact for your apostle. Artifact, a strape, has been bound to, Evan Alamir. Evan Alamir, has rejected the path of an apostle. As soon as I activated and LT, apostle selection and GT, a new item was created in my inventory. Until then, it was similar to when I made Eutenia an apostle. But after that, something happened that I didn't even expect. Evan rejected becoming an apostle, and a message popped up saying that and LT, apostle selection and GT, was temporarily postponed. The character himself refused to become my apostle. I felt like I had been hit in the back of my head by an unexpected situation. Where did my karma go after eating 400 and running away? The opponent is an elite monster with outstanding abilities among many characters. To that extent, I had some expectations for the impossible situation of and LT, Apostle Selection and GT. But the problem was with the karma that was consumed. Maybe it was because a message popped up saying that I had created an item by consuming karma. The usable karma had already been reduced to the bottom, and the next consumption amount of and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, skill went up to 800. Moreover, there was already, artifact, a strape, bound to Evan in my inventory. So that's how it was. I looked at Evan on the screen with a bewildered expression. Evan, who had postponed and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, muttered to himself and soon ran somewhere. There was Evan's horse standing still in the direction where Evan ran. An icon of a person running away appeared several times over Evan's head as he ran away. Seeing Evan run away so quickly, a possibility flashed through my mind. One possibility that I had forgotten while thinking only about using and LT, Apostle Selection and GT. Escape, does he die and my karma flies away? I stopped moving my finger that was moving to aim at Evan. The karma is consumed only in the process of creating an artifact. And, artifact, a strape, is bound to Evan who was proceeding with and LT, Apostle Selection and GT. Then what will happen to, artifact, a strape, if Evan dies? It was likely that it would be stuck in my inventory and unusable. I thought of a possible possibility and had no choice but to think hard about a perfect solution. It seems like it will fly away as it is. It seems like there is a possibility that it can be done again when you look at the postponement status. The postponement of and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, was only because Evan refused to become an Apostle. If Evan accepts becoming an Apostle again, and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, could proceed normally. It was just a possibility, but still. But the postponement of and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, itself was not the first time. There was enough room to hope for the possibility of completing and LT, Apostle Selection and GT. I had to persuade Evan somehow. I moved my finger to activate the conversation with Eutenia. Eutenia. You have to go and get the newcomer. There is no way for me to persuade the character in the game in a normal way. The only way I can use is to send someone who can communicate with the character directly to Evan. And the only one who could do that for me was Eutenia. Squeak. I activated the chat window and sent a message to Eutenia asking her to bring Evan somehow. Of course, the message I sent was translated into a plausible language by the speech bubble translator and sent. Welcome a new apostle. The one who lost his light will find a new path. And LT, 27, the corrupted sword, 5, and GT, ha, ha. Evan looked around, breathing heavily. He had felt a sense of dread after facing the minion of the evil god and ran away for hours. The sky had darkened and the sunset was casting its glow. The horse he had been riding was swept away by the evil god's magic long ago. Evan couldn't help but feel a great loss for losing his horse. He had grown fond of the horse while traveling through the Empire's territory. And what was more inconvenient was the fact that he had to walk on his own legs across the vast land of the Empire. Phew, maybe I've finally gotten away. Evan gently rubbed his chest, which was starting to ache. 
maybe it was because he had run too hard to survive. His lungs were in pain from breathing roughly. The evil god's magic that had been chasing him also seemed to have disappeared at some point. Maybe he could take a rest now. He calmed his breath and looked for a suitable place to rest. That was when he heard a stern voice in his ear. Accept your fate. It was the mysterious voice that had been echoing repeatedly since he met the apostle of the evil god. The unidentified voice kept throwing meaningful words at Evan. But even though the voice echoed, there was no magic falling from the sky toward Evan. There was no response when he tried to talk to it. It just repeated the same words to Evan periodically. Evan realized that it was nothing but a trick of the evil god after hearing it over and over again. Shut up. He snapped at the unknown voice and walked forward, looking ahead. He felt a bitter taste in his mouth after walking on the mountain road for a long time. Gulp. He swallowed his saliva and moved his creaking legs. His eyes caught something far away as he walked silently. A little ahead of the rugged mountain road. There was a small village there. A village? Evan's face brightened when he saw the village. He was feeling a severe thirst after running for so long. If there was a village, he could get some water to drink. If he was lucky, he might be able to solve his lodging problem as well. He hoped that the villagers would be friendly to outsiders and move toward the village. He had served the god and sacrificed himself for the people all his life, so he thought it wouldn't hurt to ask for some luck. Thud. Thud. His footsteps echoed on the dense mountain road. How many more steps did he force himself to take? He kept moving forward and soon reached the entrance of the village. The village in the valley was much smaller than he had expected. There were wooden houses built crudely, and not many of them either. As he approached the village, a villager who was standing at the entrance asked him, Who are you? I've never seen you before. Evan Alamir. I'm a pilgrim who left the Holy Land and wandered around the empire. Can I get some water if it's not too much trouble? The villager tilted his head after hearing Evan's story. Was there something wrong with his identity that he made up? Evan looked at him nervously with his eyes. The villager hesitated for a moment and then nodded at Evan. Water? I can spare you some water. I'm sorry to ask for your help. You seem to be a follower of the god, so I understand. I have no reason not to give you such a simple help. It seemed that he could get some water from the villager fortunately. The villager left his spot and soon came back with a bowl in his hand. There was water filled in the bowl that he brought to Evan. It was the first cool water he had seen in hours. The water was a bit dirty, but it was drinkable enough. He was about to drink the water by bringing the bowl to his mouth when he felt something. Accept your fate. He instinctively threw away the bowl that he was holding as he felt something. It was an action that stemmed from his intuition. The water barely touched his lips before he dropped it. Swoosh. He quickly drew his sword and looked behind him. There was a sharp spear of lightning that appeared in the sky out of nowhere. Well, what are you doing? Oh God. Evan ignored the villager's panicked scream and infused his sword with holy power. His sword glowed with faith and vibrated once. The evil god who had been chasing him had somehow found him again. This meant that hiding in the village was no longer possible. Crackle. Crackle. The spear of lightning from the sky aimed at Evan and shot at him. He took a deep breath and swung his sword to deflect the evil god's attack. Thunder. Boom. The lightning spear that bounced off Evan's sword hit the ground and exploded. The explosion was so loud that it made the ears of the villagers who were watching numb. They flinched at the sight. Evan, who had deflected the attack that was flying towards him, took a deep breath and looked at the villager. He wanted to check if he was safe from the god's attack. Are you okay? Be careful not to get hurt. Ah! More, more are coming. What? As Evan turned his head, a rain of lightning began to pour down from the sky. Kwong! Bang! Kwong! The lightning spears that rained from the sky swept away everything in the village. Evan felt his head go blank as he saw the lightning storm in front of him. It was an absurd number of magic spells. It was a scene that could be called a natural disaster. Evan couldn't stop it alone. It was beyond his range of ability. So save me. 
The villager who was in front of Evan clung to his feet and begged him. Evan, who saw that, felt his hand holding the sword tremble. He was weak. He couldn't even save the person who was suffering in front of him. He became a paladin to save people. But he couldn't even properly save the people who were dying in front of him. It's because I came here. The god was only after Evan. The reason why the god attacked this place was because Evan had come to this village. He couldn't save the people who were dying because he was weak. It was all because of Evan. It was because Evan was weak. If only he had a little more power. If he had the power to save people from the god's attack, this tragedy wouldn't have happened. Pilgrim. He needed power. But even so, the goddess of honor didn't look at him. She didn't answer his prayers that called out to her. The only one who looked at Evan was the god from beyond the dimension. Crack. Evan, who clenched his teeth at his pitiful situation, pushed away the villager who clung to his feet. And then he warned him with a cold voice. I'll draw his attention. If you don't want to die, run away somewhere. Ha. Huh. If you understand, move quickly. Yes, yes. The villager who understood Evan's words started to run away hesitantly. Kong. Kank. Evan deflected a few more lightning bolts that fell from the sky, and then ran in the opposite direction of where the villager was moving. His goal was the deep mountain range where no one lived. If Evan didn't go to the village himself, there would be no chance for other villagers to be swept away by the god's attack. Accept your fate. He ignored the voice that echoed in his head, and kept running towards the mountain. He had to get away. From the village where people lived. And from the god who looked at him. That was the only way for Evan Alamir to keep his faith. Two days had passed in game time since I used NLT, Apostle Selection and GT, on Evan Alamir. During that time, I had been busy following Evan around and tormenting him. I didn't do anything too serious to bother Evan though. I just turned on the game whenever I was bored and threw NLT, Lightning Arrow and GT, around him. Of course, I was careful not to hit Evan directly if possible. It would be troublesome for me if Evan died and, Divine Skill, a strafe, got locked up again. Sometimes I also spammed and LT, Lightning and GT, Skill next to Evan when he was sleeping. I couldn't stand seeing him sleep peacefully after he swallowed my 400 karma. Oh Goddess! Every time I did something radical to annoy Evan, he clasped his hands and prayed to his Goddess. He seemed to be a devout paladin. He showed that he didn't lose his faith in his goddess even in difficult situations. How pure must a character be to pray even when he was suffering from extreme pain? If it were me, I would have cursed at the goddess who didn't help me long ago. I admired him as I watched him from my perspective. You're amazing. You're the best. I gave him a sound of applause instead of and LT, lightning and GT, skill. Quaring. Bang. Quarong. Every time a cheerful thunder sound echoed, Evan got up with his sword and started spinning around. He seemed to be dancing along with my applause. When Evan started moving like that, I matched him with a catchy beat made of and LT, lightning and GT. Quaring. Quaring. Bang. 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 As he heard the beat made of and LT, lightning and GT, Evan spun around faster. Of course, he kept looking around cautiously, but he never stopped praying to his goddess. O oh, goddess of honor! I wondered how great the goddess was that I wanted to see her face at this point. Evan Alamir. He was a very faithful character. Unless I broke his will properly, there would be no chance for Evan to accept and LT, Apostle Selection and GT. And a simple whip was not enough to do that. That was the conclusion I came to after a few days. Eventually, Eutenia's intervention was inevitable. It's about time for Eutenia to step in. I had to use another character to persuade Evan directly. And if I knew Eutenia well, she would be able to convince Evan. No, she had to. There was 400 karma at stake for Evan. That's when I was about to send a message to Eutenia. O oh, goddess of honor, goddess of abundance, goddess of knowledge, goddess of hunting, goddess of order. Please help me, anyone. Evan, who had been wandering around for a while, finally stuck his sword into the ground and started praying. But the target of his prayer was different from before. 
he started spitting out the names of other goddesses along with the goddess of honor. He had been calling out to his goddess all day long. But it seemed like he served more than one god. And LT, 28, the corrupted sword, 6, and GT, a small cave in the mountains. Evan, who was sleeping in the darkness, opened his eyes. Blink. Blink. He prepared his eyes to adapt to the darkness without light. After finishing the dark adaptation, Evan got up from his seat and felt a dull sensation in his ears. He felt a cold feeling in his body that was leaning against the cave wall and sleeping. There must have been some noise. What woke Evan from his sleep was an unidentified sound. Evan moved with his sword to find the source of the sound. Thud. Thud. The sound of footsteps echoed in the cave as he stepped. In the cave where no one was, only Evan's presence was felt. Evan came out of the cave and started looking for the source of the sound. There doesn't seem to be anything suspicious. But there was no trace outside the cave. He didn't even feel any signs of animals passing by. Under the bright night sky, only the quiet scenery of the forest entered Evan's eyes. Evan couldn't understand what had woken him from his sleep. It was at the moment when Evan moved to get some fresh air in the peaceful-looking forest. Accept your fate. As Evan tried to move away from the cave a little more. A lightning spear appeared in the sky. Crackle. The lightning spear that appeared scattering sparks slowly changed direction. It started to aim at Evan with the lightning spear and Evan hurriedly jumped into the cave. Bang. Boom. As soon as Evan entered the cave, a thunderstorm began to pour down. He lifted his sword with both hands at the thunderous sound that echoed violently outside the cave. O oh goddess! A bright light burst out of his hand holding the sword. It was divine power, a unique possession of paladins who had firm faith. The bright divine power that burst out became a lantern that lit up the dark cave. Evan hid in the cave and waited for the lightning storm to pass while praying. The only thing Evan could rely on now was his sword that emitted light. Guide me, please. Was it a struggle for survival? Or was it a desire for salvation? He couldn't decide which one his prayer was, and he kept looking at his sword filled with light. The moment of salvation had not yet come. There was no promise left when it would come. But Evan kept holding his sword and praying. That was the qualification to be called a paladin. It had been three days since Evan was trapped in the cave. During that time, he sat in his seat, prayed and slept repeatedly. Of course, there were moments when he wanted to go outside from time to time. They were moments when hunger and thirst came up impulsively. Accept your fate. Every time he tried to go outside, he saw the falling lightning spears and hit again. The thunderstorm hit violently every time Evan went outside. His body, which had not eaten or drunk anything for several days, had become quite weak. He couldn't even be sure that he could block the attack of the evil god as before. In the end, there was only one way for Evan to choose. O oh goddess! I swear I will be a paladin who follows your will. He was hungry. And thirsty. His hand holding the sword firmly didn't have enough strength. But Evan kept reciting the oath of a paladin with his dry and cracked lips. The current pain was only temporary. To forget the pain in front of him, it was better to focus entirely on prayer. For that, he chose the oath of a paladin that he had uttered when he first became a paladin. I swear I will protect your honor. His lips cracked every time he uttered a word. His throat losing moisture cried out for pain as if it would tear periodically. The sound coming out of his mouth gradually decreased. But Evan continued to pray on. I swear I will fight for my honor. There are many trials in a person's life. The current trial was just one of many trials. To overcome trials, only those who can do so can move on to a more valuable direction. Evan was a person who had such a thought. And he chose faith and prayer as a way to overcome it. I swear I will annihilate evil ones and save weak ones. He followed the light all his life. He believed that saving others and punishing evil would someday become the light that would save him. He never doubted that the brightest light shining far away was the answer. So now he had to go towards that light. Only the sun shining in front of his eyes could be the signpost for the future. So, O oh goddess, please guide me to the right path. So, O oh goddess. 
If you hear this voice, if you see the frail lamb with your eyes, please guide me to the right path. It had been five days since Evan was trapped in a cave. He could somehow suppress his hunger, but his thirst was unbearable. So Evan used the water that was pooled on the floor of the cave to keep his throat moist. But there was a limit to using only the water that was pooled in the cave. People die without water. Evan, who reached his limit, eventually drew his sword. Oh goddess! Guide me! He couldn't survive by being trapped in the cave forever. He would either starve to death. Or fight and die. There were only two choices left for Evan. If there were no sane options left, then there was only one path he could take. He would not wait for a false salvation. He had to carve his own way with his own hands. He would rather die fighting than die miserably. Evan made up his mind and raised his holy power with a prayer. Please guide me to the right path. Clang. The sword he lifted was imbued with a sacred light. The intense light that rose up was more majestic than ever before. It was the holy fire that burned everything he had. Evan stepped out with his sword in hand, feeling that this was his last moment. He would fight the evil god when he came. He would cut down the apostles of the evil god with his sword. That was the path given to Evan, the holy knight. Accept your fate. As Evan stepped out, he heard the voice of the evil god in his ears. But Evan ignored him and moved forward. He had to go out to live like a human being. Evan followed his faith and drew his sword and kept advancing. As Evan's footsteps moved away from the cave, lightning spears appeared one by one in the distant sky. The fierce arrows of malice aimed at Evan and demanded him to run away. I will decide my own fate. It was his destiny to face his end as a holy knight. Evan took a stance and pointed his sword at the falling thunderbolts. He could block them if he swung his sword. He could move forward if he blocked them. A fierce scream came out of Evan's mouth as he gripped his sword. Come at me. You wicked evil god. One more step forward than now. Evan swung his shining sword. Clang. Clang. Every time he swung his sword with a glow, one of the evil god's blows was cut off. Evan was stronger now than ever before. His eyes filled with determination faced the evil god who looked down on him. I am Evan Alamir, the Inquisitor of the Holy Land. There was only one thing he wanted to protect. His proud self at this moment. Evan had to be a holy knight of the Holy Land. He also had to be an Inquisitor who protected the Holy Land. That was the fate that Evan chose for himself. Evil God. Receive your judgment. Evan shouted in a confident voice toward the evil God. A strong resolve rose in Evan's heart as he confronted the evil God. Only to take one more step forward. He put everything he had into swinging his sword. And he failed. A dark and silent cave engulfed in darkness. There, Evan, who was covered in blood, stabbed his sword into the ground. A dark light rose from the sword that Evan stabbed in. It was only now that he had achieved a level of growth as a holy knight. Even though it meant nothing against the evil god. Sigh. Crack. He heard a sound of cracking from his clenched teeth. Evan felt a metallic taste in his mouth and then looked at the sword he stabbed into the ground. A clear light flowed from Evan's sword. It was proof of a glorious holy knight. Even in the holy land, there were few knights who had such a light on their swords. So I, survived again. Evan muttered to himself as he looked at his sword. A white aura flickered in front of Evan's eyes. It was a warm and gentle light. Anyone who faced this light would believe in the existence of the goddess and offer their prayers. But Evan did not have any faith left to pray now. Why? He could not die. Even as he broke down and became ragged, death was always a fear that approached him. In the end, Evan gave up resisting and returned. He could not move forward with his own strength. He needed someone else's help to get out of here. And there was only one being left who could help Evan. Why won't you help me? Evan's angry voice echoed in the cave. Even though the evil god came after him and sought him out, the goddess of honor did not help him at all. The trial that faced Evan still had no end in sight. He was hungry. And thirsty. But he could not eat even a piece of bread, nor drink even a sip of water. He, a holy knight, lived worse than a street rat. 
why are you just watching me from above? When that wicked evil God is constantly watching me. If the goddess had helped him a little bit. Or at least gave him some water to quench his thirst. He would have kept shouting the name of the goddess in this dark cave. Believing that one day, the day of salvation would come. But the goddess never looked at Evan even once. The closest thing to Evan was the evil god. The monster of the sky that swallowed innocent people with lightning. I keep calling you. There was no answer to his screaming voice. But Evan kept shouting the name of the goddess. His eyes that held his sword were red. At this moment, Evan felt like he was abandoned by everything in the world. The only thing left was Evan himself. He felt an endless loneliness rising in his chest. I, I, what have I been doing until now? Evan's head went cold at the voice of the evil god calling him. What had he just said with his own mouth? He had denied God. He had insulted God, blamed God, and rejected his own foundation. He who did not serve God was no longer a holy knight. Evan Alamir. He was a human who wanted to die as a holy knight. He realized his situation and let go of his sword. O oh goddess! I dared to doubt you. Thud! 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 He slammed his forehead hard on the cave floor. The light that flowed from his stabbed sword became fainter. He did not give in to the fading light, and he kept hitting his head on the ground. Blood flowed from his forehead and ran down his cheeks. I dared to, doubt you. Despite his reddening vision, he continued to offer prayers of apology. There was no salvation for those who doubted God. All he could do now was to ask for forgiveness from the goddess who looked at him. His voice calling God echoed in the cave. Even though he knew that there was no response to his act, he never stopped his voice. At some point, Evan stopped counting time. He just looked at the sword in his hand. His light had weakened since he doubted the goddess. He could not light up the cave with a strong glow as before. The only thing left for Evan now was a sword that he held heavily in his hand. There was no sound of prayer from his mouth either. Evan quietly looked at his sword. The sword that had been through countless battles with him was now badly damaged. Evan's sword had always been with him. Even if the goddess of honor completely abandoned him, the sword he held would stay with him until the end. He looked at his chipped sword and got up from his seat. Sigh. A heavy sigh came out of Evan's mouth. The silent time he spent trapped in the cave. During that time, he had thought about his future countless times. What he should do. What was the right way left for him. And now he had reached a conclusion. What a pathetic life. Swoosh. He brought the sword he held to his neck. This was the result of a long time of thinking. He could not escape from the evil god's sight alive. If he decided to die in a proper way, this was the only way left for him. He smiled bitterly and put strength into his hand holding the sword. What a pitiful sight. A sweet girl's voice echoed in the cave. It was a very familiar voice to Evan. The first apostle, Eutenia Hyrest. The apostle of the evil god appeared in front of Evan. Evan lowered his sword from his neck. The sacred light rose from the sword he held. Did you come to mock me? His sword emitted a feeble glow. It was a weak sight compared to before. No one would remember him as an inquisitor by looking at him now. Click. Click. Eutenia approached Evan with a relaxed step. I don't know. Maybe. Evan raised his light to cut down Eutenia who came closer to him. His hand holding the sword felt heavier than before. But until Eutenia came right in front of him, Evan's sword did not swing. Eutenia's hand moved toward Evan who stood still. Holy Knight, have you broken down? Eutenia stroked Evan's cheek with her hand. As her cold touch brushed past his cheek, Evan felt no strength in his sword. He was not bound by any magic. It was just that his body felt fear on its own and stopped. What was he afraid of now? Evan tried to shake off his weakness by recalling the spark that remained in him. He liked people's smiling faces. He liked the people of the temple who welcomed him. That's why he decided to become a holy knight. He wanted to protect people's smiling faces with his own hands, and spread God's will across the continent. He saved countless people while working as a holy knight. Even if no one praised him for that obvious deed, 
it was an act that came from believing that the goddess would watch over his good deeds. I. His voice did not come out well because of his dry throat. He had something to say, but he could not spit it out properly. He was an inquisitor belonging to the Temple of Honor. He always had to be more pure than others, and more devout than anyone in the temple. The moment his faith was shaken, his value as an inquisitor was gone. But he could not say anything about himself. He had doubted his faith many times. He had seen God turn away from him in the darkness. Who would believe him if he claimed to be pure? I. His eyes looked at Eutenia in silence. She was an apostle of the evil god. Maybe he could kill her with his sword now. But his hand holding the sword did not move. The light from his sword flickered and mocked his precarious state. What could he do with this weak sword? What he held now was nothing but an illusion. The illusion of his past as a holy knight of the temple. Accept your fate. Accept your fate. He heard the familiar voice of the evil god. The fate that was set for him. What was the fate given to him? The strength slowly left his hand holding the sword. He had lived glorious days. But there was no glory at the end of this road. In the end, at the end of this long ordeal, he was no longer a holy knight. He was not a holy knight now. He was not an inquisitor either. And now he was, I am, a weak human. Thud. The light of faith went out. And LT, 29, Apostle of Thunder, 1, and GT, 2nd Apostle, Evan Alamir, has become your apostle. Due to the effect of and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, you will share your magic power with the selected apostles. Due to the effect of and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, you will be able to send separate messages to the selected apostles. It had been a few days since I started spending time to convert Evan, whom I had chosen as an apostle. Maybe my bold investment over the past few days paid off. As soon as Eutenia entered the cave to persuade him, Evan accepted and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, as if he had been waiting for it. Even though Eutenia didn't say much, Evan quickly gave up and put down his sword. The divine artifact, a strafe, that was sealed by accepting and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, was also completely liberated. I finally became an apostle. I made Evan, who used to be a paladin, my apostle. He was incomparable to ordinary characters. If he used the divine artifact, a strafe, that I created by consuming karma, he would surely become a much more powerful being than most characters. I immediately opened my inventory and checked the effect of divine artifact, a strafe. The divine artifacts that I created using and LT, Apostle Selection and GT, had different characteristics attached to them. Blue Flash. It sounds like a very good characteristic just by reading the description. The divine artifact, a strafe, that was bound to Evan had a characteristic called and LT, Blue Flash and GT. And LT, Blue Flash and GT. The effect of this characteristic was twofold. 1. It continuously consumes magic power and transforms the user's body into lightning for a certain period of time. 2. It shares all the skills that inflict lightning damage with me. In other words, it was a characteristic specialized in inflicting elemental damage. So you're going to be a magic swordsman instead of a paladin. A sword imbued with light and a sword imbued with lightning. I didn't know which one was stronger. But considering Eutenia's precedent, it was certain that Evan would become incredibly strong after receiving the divine artifact. I dragged an item from my inventory and placed it in front of Evan. Divine artifact, a strafe, was a piece of equipment shaped like a light gauntlet. Thud. As the divine artifact fell in front of Evan, Eutenia picked it up and handed it to Evan's hand. Evan looked at Eutenia with a puzzled expression as he received the divine artifact. This is. It's a proof that the Great One has chosen you. Proof. You are now an apostle who serves the Great One. Evan, who was looking at the dark gauntlet, nodded his head and put it on his hand. As soon as, divine artifact, a strafe, was worn on Evan's hand, blue lightning burst out and a speech bubble appeared above Evan's head. By wearing the divine artifact, I was able to send messages directly to Evan. The current flowing through Evan's body showed why the characteristic was called and LT, blue flash and GT. Evan's eyes sparkled as he wore a strafe. An apostle of God. Did you like his gift? 
To be honest, I don't think I deserve to receive such a thing. Crackle. Crackle. Evan, who was sparking lightning around him, picked up the sword that had fallen on the ground. As soon as Evan gripped the sword with the gauntlet on, blue lightning burst out from the sword he was holding. The light of lightning overflowing enough to blind the eyes. He looked at it and lifted his sword. Evan Alamir. He spoke with a devout expression as he looked at his sword. Still, I will ask you. O oh God who looks down on the earth. What fate should I accept? Maybe it was because he used to be a character who was a paladin. Evan showed me a polite attitude even when facing me. Every word that came out of his mouth was holy. Maybe he would show me the same blind loyalty that he had for the goddess. As I wondered what to answer to Evan's question, I noticed his face soaked in fatigue. Come to think of it, I've been pretty rough on him. I had been disturbing his sleep and blocking his movement for days. It was quite a long time in game time. If he had been starving and trapped in a cave for a long time, his fatigue would not be ordinary. He used to be my enemy until recently, but now he was a character who moved for me. It was right to treat him well, since he became my character. That way, he would bring me more things that would benefit me. Just like Eutenia, whom I had spent time and raised before. First, eat something. I dragged the bread from my inventory and placed it in front of Evan. Thud. Evan caught the baguette that fell on the opposite side of his hand. Evan's eyes looked up at the sky as he held the baguette. I looked up at the sky and gave him a plausible impression using the message function. It's a meal that I personally give you. It was a baguette that cost 7, 0, 0, 0, 1. No, it was 8, 0, 0, 0, 1 now. It was not something I gave lightly. Maybe my answer was a bit lacking in dignity. The speech bubble translator repackaged my message and delivered it to Evan. I will fill your hunger and quench your long thirst. Then witness the truth. It was just a word to eat something first. It felt like a godlike speech that I couldn't help but admire. Seeing my message, Evan asked me again. Truth. What exactly is the truth? That's right. What is that truth? That was a word that the speech bubble translator spit out on its own. I was curious about what the truth was, too, because of the exaggerated answer. Of course, the speech bubble translator also prepared an answer for that, and fluently replied to Evan. Harvest the wicked ones. Then I will use them as food and return to my rightful place. Destroy the idols of false faith and erect your faith in their place. Evan tore the bread in silence at the translator's unique answer. He seemed to have nothing more to say at the textbook-like answer. It was amazing how the AI's performance felt more and more amazing as I watched it. I, Hus Alamir, a second-class investigator of the Imperial Execution Agency, Cloud, looked at the documents with a tired gaze. It had been a month since I requested help from the Holy City to unravel the mysterious disappearance cases. And the one who came to help me was my brother, Evan Alamir, a heretic inquisitor. I had to spend a few days in exhaustion, watching out for Evan who came in person. But even after Evan left, who was investigating the surroundings, my mind was never at ease. The cult of the evil god was moving. I heard it directly from Evan, the heretic inquisitor. Since then, I had to tremble every day with anxiety that the cult might move. It was something that even the heretic inquisitor admitted. It was almost a fact that the cult was showing signs of movement near here. Another disappearance case. My gaze, which was looking at the disappearance cases with him, also changed. It was a case that happened several times a month, but still, I couldn't help but suspect the cult's movements. There was a cult that offered people to the evil god. If there was a suspicious group nearby, it was natural to suspect them first. But just because I suspected them, I couldn't go around searching recklessly. I had already lost one investigator. If I forced an investigation with insufficient power without forming a subjugation team, I couldn't rule out the risk of being attacked by the cult's fanatics. If I lost more troops, I wouldn't be able to avoid responsibility. Even if I couldn't stand it in the branch office of the frontier, it was obvious how my brothers and family would look at me. Sigh. It's frustrating when I'm not sure. But if I kept still, I would be scolded from above. It was a dilemma. Hus sighed and reached out for a piece of paper nearby. 
he intended to ask Evan about the progress of his work in the Holy City. Evan had gone to report that the cult had appeared himself, so by now, the Holy City must have reached a conclusion. He felt like he could focus more on his work if he heard that a subjugation team had been formed in the Holy City. I wonder if they have reached a decision in Crossbridge. Hussa's hand stopped as he picked up his pen to write a letter to Evan. He felt a sudden pain in his right arm as he tried to write a letter. He put down his pen and rolled up his sleeve on his right arm. A black mark appeared on his skin as he rolled up his sleeve. He opened his mouth wide as he saw the familiar mark on his arm. This is. A black feather pen tilted slightly. As far as Huss knew, who was from a prestigious family, the picture on his right arm was the mark of the Temple of Knowledge. There was only one case where the mark of the temple suddenly appeared on someone's arm. Hero Emergence. The mark given to heroes who resisted the advent of the evil god. Does this mean I've been chosen as a hero? Hussa's finger stroked the feather pen engraved on his arm. The fact that he had the mark of knowledge meant that Hus Alamir had been chosen as one of the most important people of this era, a hero. It was not any other temple, but the Temple of Knowledge. The place that revered wisdom and magic would make him a great mage. He recalled the image of the temple located in Crossbridge and smiled faintly at his lips. A hero. This is not a bad story. He put back the paper he had taken out. There was no need to write a letter to Evan anymore. He could go to the holy city himself now. Besides, he didn't need to work as a second-class investigator of Cloud anymore either. Huss was a hero chosen by the goddess of knowledge herself. Who would dare stop him from going to the holy city as a hero chosen by the goddess? It was also his last day to see the annoying face of his branch manager today. Most of all, I'm looking forward to seeing my brother's expression. What he was most looking forward to was his brother's reaction when he faced him. Evan was a heretic inquisitor of the holy city. And Huss was one of the most important people in the holy city, a hero. How would Evan look at his brother who became a hero? He certainly wouldn't be able to keep his stern face as before. Huss looked forward to meeting his brother with a satisfied face and pushed away the documents in the corner. He felt like he would be happy all day today. And LT, 30, Apostle of Thunder, 2, and GT, inside the crude and shabby cult. There, under Roan's guidance, a feast was held for the new apostle. The large table was filled with appetizing breads and vegetables. Of course, these dishes were prepared by the cult's followers who followed Roan's instructions. Roan, who had spent his life training only dark magic, could not make any food other than drugs. Congratulations on becoming a new apostle. Roan raised his voice and congratulated Evan, who was sitting at the table. Evan looked at him with a subtle expression. He was the one who tried to kill him with his own sword. But now he was receiving congratulations for becoming an apostle of the evil god, which made him feel awkward. Roan acted as if nothing had happened, and Evan pretended to be fine and replied. Thanks. I appreciate your congratulations. I heard that you got an amazing ability this time. An amazing ability. Didn't you get the ability to control lightning? I know how powerful his lightning is, because I also used it for a while. Evan looked at the estrape that he was wearing on his hand. He had not yet tested the performance of this device properly. But he knew well that this device had an enormous power. As it had various abilities, he would be able to gain overwhelming strength compared to before if his proficiency increased. Moreover, Evan was now receiving a huge amount of magic instead of divine power. He nodded his head and agreed with the feeling of his power being more abundant than before. He gave me a powerful power. It's too much for me. It was a power that he had obtained by selling his faithful faith. It was natural that he felt some resistance to using it. Nevertheless, Evan did not intend to abandon his given task. It was the direction he chose with his own will. Even if it was a broken faith, Evan had to bear the consequences. If he was going to fall into hell, he had to fall to the bottom of hell. That was the only way left for Evan, who had chosen the wrong path. With you as an apostle, there will be nothing to fear in our cult for a while. Roan tilted his wine glass with a light laugh. Evan also lifted his glass and drank along with him. When he was in the Holy Land, he did not drink as a principal, but when he returned to his family, he sometimes enjoyed wine. He smiled bitterly at the taste of wine that he had not drunk for a long time. 
He did not know where he got it from, but it was not a bad wine for Evan. It seemed like something that would cost quite a lot. Evan tore off some bread and drank wine, then suddenly turned his eyes to the corner of the table. Hey, who is that guy? In the corner where Evan's eyes met, Peter was eating bread with an awkward expression. Even from Evan's perspective, who joined them for the first time today, Peter's appearance stood out especially. He did not look like a follower of the cult, nor did he look like a worker. He did not do much work either. Peter tore off some bread with his fingers and opened his mouth in surprise when he saw Evan pointing at him. Uh, are you talking about me? Yeah. You don't look like an ordinary follower. I am. Peter stuttered in response to Evan's question. With bread in his hand, Peter's eyes kept wandering in the air. Thud. Thud. Evan's fingers tapped on the table slowly with his gauntlet on. It was clearly a gesture to urge him to answer quickly. Seeing Peter unable to give a clear answer, Roan stepped in to save him. Oh, Peter.